Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, March 28, 2023, Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting. We will begin. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I've just started, too. <laughs> Take it where you can get it, Supervisor Holmes. <laughs> We will begin with a flag salute led by Supervisor Landon. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation and under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on our agenda is a consent agenda. Are there any items that the, oh, let, let me read this first. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the county executive department. All the items will be approved in a single roll call vote. Anyone may ask to address consent items prior to the board taking action and the item may be pulled, moved for discussion. Uh, are there any items that need to be pulled for discussion? Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull item 20C. 20C? Please. And, and I'd like to pull 19C, please. 19C? Yes. 19C. C. And are anyone in the audience have any items that they like uh, from consent to be pulled for discussion? I see none. Is there anyone online? None. All righty. Okay, then we will now move to uh, item should I do the rest of them first? Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll entertain a motion to approve the remaining items on the consent. So moved. And I will second. It's been moved by Gore, second by Gustafson. Other way around. The other way. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> 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 will the clerk please call the roll? Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. Then we'll now move to item 20C. Supervisor Jones. Um, I pulled item 20C because I would like to give it equal recognition as we are giving to item one on our on our agenda today. So Twyla, if you would tell us a little bit about item 20C. Thank you. Um, Board of Supervisors, Chair Holmes and uh, Suzanne, uh, Supervisor Jones, thank you so much for pulling this item. It's nice to see everyone here today. Um, we were referring to the Child Abuse Prevention Month item, and the Placer County Department of Health and Human Services, as you know, and our many community partners participate actively in pursuing the goal of reducing and treating child abuse and neglect for Placer County by strengthening children and families. These include Lighthouse Counseling Services, Tahoe Truckee Child Abuse Prevention Council, in coordination with the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, and Kids First Counseling and Family Resource Centers. These partners and HHF have led local efforts to raise awareness about child abuse, educate the community, and help thousands of families resolve difficult life situations that threaten the safety and well-being of children. So, April is Child, National Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month, and HHS desires to support all of our allied community partners in raising awareness and providing education to the community regarding the most effective and useful methods to treat and prevent child abuse. So I wanted to tell you about a few activities. So in, in addition to celebrating our prevention efforts, we encourage Placer County employees, your board, and other Placer partner, uh, partners to wear blue ribbons in the first full week of April and to wear all blue on Friday, April 7th. You can wear whatever blue you would like. <laughs> Other activities include a resource fair on April 27th, which will include the planting of the children's memorial flag, which of course is to honor all of our child abuse and neglect victims. There's enhanced community prevention trainings, including a Spanish internet safety training to be held at a school in Lincoln on April 19th. We have planned two blue pinwheel events, one this Thursday, March 30th, at the Auburn Courthouse with planting of the blue pinwheels starting at eight o'clock and a photo at nine o'clock and obviously to kick off our April month. And we have a second planting at the Placer Sunset location on April 11th. And that pinwheel planting will start at 11 with a photo at 1130. And all are welcome. So 
Finally, the, the word action that we're uh, requesting is to approve a proclamation declaring 2023, April 2023, as Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month in Placer County. So thank you for your consideration. So Twyla, I have something, because I know, as you just mentioned, something that is representative of child abuse prevention, and um, I have a couple of pinwheels that I had gotten a couple of years ago from uh, Kids First. Oh, so wonderful, you thank you. You have these and you can plant those with the others. There you go. Are there any comments uh, from board members regarding uh, this item? Is there anyone in the public who would like to address us on the, this item? Seeing none, uh, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to, to approve. Okay. I'll move. second. It's been moved by Supervisor Jones and seconded by Supervisor Gore. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, thank you. The item has moved. Thank you, and I will plant these in all of your honor. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. All right, thank you. Now we'll move to item 19C, Supervisor Gore. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, this is in regards to out of state travel for um, our board and staff. And I'm bringing this item up really not so much about uh, the, the cap to cap event that's coming up in April but really about future events and how, how we, um, as a board, utilize our travel. And um, as I saw that we've got sort of a large group of people considering going to DC for the Placer Business Alliance, I, um, I wanna caution us about um, having uh, what, what the optics look like with um, having so many um, of us, supervisors, as well as um, our staff joining us for for advocacy trips, um, it's just it's a it's a lot of money um, for having you know two people from each office, a supervisor and a chief of staff, going to Washington D.C. to advocate. When I think we could really streamline the number of people going to both Washington D.C. for cap to cap, and then some for Placer Business Alliance. So I share that concern. Um, I know we haven't yet um, set out you know who's going. Um, in October, but it really does concern me that we don't we that we should be we should be thoughtful about how we use taxpayer dollars with our travel, and I think um, it might be appropriate to have a supervisor and or a staff member, but um, I think we ought to be cautious about how many people we're spending or sending to um, advocacy meetings like this. So that I want to share that concern because we're going to be having travel requests come up for the for the item in October. Supervisor Gustafson. I, I think I brought this up, um, gosh, a, a couple meetings ago that I think uh, as we went through the governance process, um, one of my goals last year as chair was to establish a budget and then give flexibility within that budget for each supervisor to make a call, but the, there would be equal budgets for each um, Department, I share Supervisor Gore's strong concern um, about people, you know, too many of us going to too many of the conferences, uh, especially when they're clear across the country. It's a whole different thing if we're driving to Sacramento. Uh, and so I, I would share that. I think we're coming up on our budget workshops, and I think that's a good time to discuss it. But when this comes now, uh, tickets have already been purchased, things have been booked. So we need to plan now for future. And so I would agree with that, um, that this one is fine, uh, but we should plan for the future and make sure that we're very clear on what our expectations are as a group, because staff can't police us, we have to police ourselves. This is a decision the board members need to make for themselves and for their staff, so. Okay, any other comments from board members? I see none. Uh, Jane, would you, do you have a comment? Certainly, thank you, Chair. Just a point of clarification. As board members recall from the governance discussions, there was a request for budget transparency going forward, and we have shared that information in our governance manual. We will reiterate that when we again meet with all of your staff on May 2nd with the information on the pro rata share each district has for your budget, travel, training, and otherwise for fiscal 23-24 which can help inform such decisions. Okay, thank you. So, 
Yeah. Is there anyone in the audience uh, that wishes to address the board on this item? Anyone online? Yes, Chairman. Okay. Sandy, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Yes, good morning, everyone. This is Sandy from Placer County. Um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Supervisor Gore for bringing that up. Um, uh, that's obviously very important. And I just wanted to, um, I guess, encourage you guys to uh, look at this current trip. I know that it's been mentioned that things have already been set, but there are cancellation policies that can be considered um, if necessary to um, cancel any unnecessary travel expenses that could be associated with this current trip. And uh, that's just for your consideration. Thank you. Is there anyone else? None, Chairman. No more? Okay, I'll close public comment on the item and we'll bring it back for Supervisor Jones. Yes, I would. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a comment on this. I think maybe they're referring to me and uh, and my uh, chief of staff who's going with me on this trip. This trip I'm going, uh, this is my first trip to cap to cap ever. And uh, this year I'm not only the vice chair of the board, in which the chair will not be at the entire uh, cap to cap meeting, I'm also the chair of the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency and I also serve on the Air Pollution Control Board. And both of those committees are very, um, they're going to be widely addressed at this meeting. So I'm taking my chief of staff who can attend some of the meetings because I can't be in all the places. I can't be at the transportation meetings and the air pollution control meetings. So that's partly, that's why I'm having to take my, my, uh, my chief of staff with me to support me and to help in attending all these meetings. Thank you, Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you. I was basically talking about the full policy for all of us because I think the equity for all of us is important that everybody have the opportunity and each of our directors have the opportunity uh, for such um, experiences because it is very important to all of us no matter what capacity we serve in and what capacity they're in. And so I think just setting up that equity moving forward and and I really appreciate that we're bringing it forward transparently to the public because I think that was a concern I also shared with many of you that um, that it had fallen off of something that we brought forward to the public and they should see what we're doing and not just hear about it and rumors and innuendo about it so I appreciate that and with that I'm happy to move approval of this item okay. I'll second Okay, it's a motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Landon. We don't need a roll call. No. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, the item is moved. So now is the time for public comment. Persons may address the, the board on items not on this agenda. Please limit comments to three minutes per person since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If all comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time limit, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular session. The board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. Good morning. Good morning. Skip Myers, Placer County resident. Uh, good morning to you, Mr. Chair, and all members of the board. I wanted to bring up some uh, salient points about our election process. And actually, looking at free and fair elections, how we get there. So the primary problem uh, that has been uncovered is that the inputs and outputs to the Placer County and to the national elections are un unverifiable. That's a big problem. So I have some suggestions of, for ways to try to remedy this. Uh, initially, um, we really need to have voter ID. And we need a sign true signature verification and elimination of DMV voter registration. And I, if we do verify each voter's um, 
status as a citizen of the USA, uh, then we preclude uh, illegal foreign nationals from voting. And I also would propose that we look at cleanup of the voter rolls every two years at a minimum and no same day registration. One person, one vote. If we do that, we actually can fix whatever is inside the black box because the inputs go in, one person, one vote, and there should be a pass-through. should be one person, one vote, registered or recorded um, in the precincts. And I'm not sure that that's really happening. Uh, I have evidence that shows that it is not happening, but that's a whole different story. So I do propose we have paper ballots only in the precincts and that they be hand marked. Uh, we would, would definitely want to accommodate those who are infirm, who have other issues such as um, you know, ha some kind of handicap. Um, let's see here, out of time. If we do one day only elections and declare the elections a national holiday, and a state holiday, we overcome a lot of the issues with the front end and the back end of the um, mail-in ballots, the uh, drop boxes, because these are all things that we can't really verify. Once it goes in there, we don't know. We lost chain of custody. So that's a major concern. And then uh, no discovery ballots or discovered ballots at the, during that, that uh, I would call it the afterglow of the election. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody has ballots stashed away in their trunk of their car or something of that nature. We don't want to have that happen. Anyway, I'm sorry I wasn't able to com complete all of the content, but you guys have the, the slide set. Thank you. So if you have questions, contact me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh -huh. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, board. My name is Doug Wells. I'm from uh, Rockland. I represent New California, and I have a statement about our delegates that have gone to Washington, D.C. New California has sent delegates to Washington, D.C., and the delegates have made significant contacts with lawmakers in Washington, D.C. As New California approaches statehood as the 51st state of the United States, New California is important to you as supervisors and to all of us as citizens in the following ways. It reduces excessive taxation, gas taxes, property taxes, and sales taxes. Reduces ex uh, excessive government regulation. Improves dams, failing dams, failing roadways, and failing public infrastructure. It will lift our failing uh, education system back to its former top-ranked status in the United States. It will restore uh, legislative representation in all counties throughout California. It will return government and education control to the local level. It will support law enforcement and restore constitutional sheriff in all counties. It will return elections to one day on paper with voter ID. So New California will fuel a business boom by manufacturing and production expansion, uh, by energy extraction and production, by agricultural boom, by using stored water, and by labor expansion uh, for reduce, uh, from reduced re regulations. So that's my statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, take this to heart, please, because New California is the promised land. So it is important to uh, you and your future as supervisors and to us as citizens and our futures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Jennifer Plaster County. Um, so a little more update, the rain came um, and it's flooded out our Central Valley uh, where a lot of our food is grown for the whole country. And we're also behind at least a month on planting our food towards harvest. So I, again, just wanna make sure we're doing everything we can to support our ag community here in Plaster County. They contribute a lot of money that helps our board pay for things. 
as well as um, people coming for tourist stuff to come see our county with our wineries and all the other beautiful things we have here. The other thing I'd like to bring up is hopefully Placer County Board of Supervisors will um, start to speak up against um, CBDC, Central Banking Digital Currency. In South Dakota recently, they tried to pass a bill saying that changing the definition of what money is, what currency is, and so they were only going to allow for a CBDC, which is a central banking digital currency through the government, and not allow things like cryptocurrency and, and cash as things come up. Now we've seen them, we've seen the government try to create new definitions. They did this during the pandemic. They changed the definition of what pandemic is to help create, facilitate lockdowns and give experimental medication to people and overestimate things and create issues. This will do the same thing. So in China, they have a CBDC type system and their um, currency or these credits, because it's not really a currency, it's a credit given to you, actually expire. And what does that mean? Expiring credits would mean you're no longer allowed to save money. Well, what does that mean? That means you can no longer save money to buy a car, to put a new roof on your house, um, to do intergenerational wealth, so money can't be passed down from father to son, uh, grandparent to child, all, uh, grandchild, all these different things. So um, it really creates um, indentured servitude because you can never save money to get ahead. And if you don't spend the money you have, it just disappears out of thin air. So I hope as we are working with our legislators for our area, we're keeping on top of this and that we're voicing concern because this will affect everybody in our county and it will create issues creating, supporting our small businesses, our mid-sized businesses, and go to big box business where we don't have choices anymore on how to live. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Janelle, and I live in Auburn. I've been an IHSS provider in Placer County for the last six years. I'm also a proud member of my union, UDW. I care for my sons, both whom are diagnosed with autism. My children do not understand what the social norms are, and I must be there with them to guide them. They do not understand the, different, the difference between safety and danger, so I need to constantly prompt and remind them. I ensure that their autism does not get in the way of becoming independent. The IHSS program allows me to do this. Despite my hard work, I've struggled to take care of my home. The simple truth is that the IHSS program does not pay enough to allow essential workers like me to maintain a dignified life, and prices everywhere keep going up. We need a new wage that reflects that. I shouldn't have to cho choose between paying my rent or buying food. <coughs> If I could just share with you a little bit, I'm gonna go off course here a little bit. Um, a lot of people that the IHSS program who we serve, uh, we are an integral part of health and human services. Uh, we serve persons from Alter Regional, the older adult community, veterans, disabled, and mental health. Persons discharged early from the hospital also are, are now seeking care from IHSS providers because um, insurances are kicking people out early now. So uh, we're having to care for those in which we don't mind. Um, and these are also including uh, mental health patients too who have been on maybe a long hold. So um, thank you so much. Thank you for letting me be here. And I love living in Placer County. My children and I love it. And please keep doing a great job with your health and human services. And please don't forget about the IHSS providers. We are an integral part of health and human services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, Placer Board of Supervisors. 
My name is Farnoosh. I live in Rocklin, and I'm an IHSS provider for my almost 100-year-old mother. I'm a proud member and the recording secretary for my union, UDW. My mother 100% depends on me, and without me, she wouldn't be alive today. My mother has AFib, bladder cancer, kidney stones, P dementia, shortness of breath, and hearing problems. My mother does not speak English, and I take her to all her medical appointments. I purchase her groceries, help her get dressed, bathe her, cook for her, give her medications, everything from A to Z. We can help. The IHSS program is important because we can help our loved one, neighbors, and community members to receive better care. All home care providers work extremely hard and deserve a living wage with good benefit. This board has the power to make that happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. Good morning, Placer Board of Supervisors. My name is Nicole, and I live in Rockland. I am an IHSS provider for my son for the past 17 years. My son Johnny has dystonia, cerebral palsy, sensory issues, spastic quadriplegia, scoliosis, ADHD, and is wheelchair bound. When Johnny was a baby, we had to go to physical therapy, occupational therapy, feeding therapy to teach him how to live. We had to teach him how to eat food and swallow properly. Seeing your baby choke on food and his face turns purple from lack of oxygen is the scariest thing. Excuse me. Having this program is very important to Johnny and I because it allows me to stay in my home, thank you, and care for him rather than having a stranger come in and do these things for him. Without this program, I would have not been able to afford the car payments for my son Johnny's adaptive special needs vehicle. It is not easy taking care of Johnny. Lifting him is not easy. Having a Hoyer lift saved my back. Johnny is a teenage boy. Imagine trying to lift that. <laughs> He's very heavy. Imagine caring for your child around the clock and not being able to afford to pay your bills. Minimum wage is increasingly hard to live a dignified life on. There are limited amounts of programs for special needs children like my son Johnny. He is the only child in Rockland Unified School District that is in a wheelchair. And at times I can tell you this makes him feel like an outsider. Just to understand who Johnny is, please take a look at the photos that I've given you. He is my pride and joy. He has had four surgeries his entire life so far, but he is my little soldier. Johnny has told me that he feels if this program didn't exist, we would be homeless, and that could very well be true. We deserve a dignified wage because our jobs as providers is life saving. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Good morning, Good morning. supervisors. My name is Lori Dyson, and I'm an IHSS provider for my 18 year old daughter, Emily, who has Down syndrome and autism. Sensory processing disorder, rheumatoid arthritis. She's kind of got a host of things. <laughs> and um, I'm a proud member of my union, UDW. 
Emily's nonverbal, and she requires a lot of one-on-one -on -one care. We feed her. She has a G-tube and a secostomy tube, and, and we blend all of her foods, and we feed her, and we, and we, we diaper her, and she has to have bed changes every morning because, you know, those diapers are not super efficient. So she's a lot of work. I had a high-paying career before Emily, and as she got older and older, it dawned on me that I'm not going to be able to pay for someone enough money that she actually requires. She deserves a dignified and clean and safe environment to live in. And it was just too hard to pay for someone to come in. So I thought, you know, I, we sacrifice as a family my career to take care of Emily. Without IHSS, I don't know that we could keep the heat on. I guess we're asking to keep her heat on, <laughs> keep the healthy foods in her stomach. She's alive, she's a miracle. She's amazing. She's got so much to give to this world. So we want to keep her home and safe and clean with dignity. But with the higher cost of everything, you know, health care and our insurance went higher and uh, just gas and taking her to all her therapies just cost more money now. It, everything is more money. And I guess we're asking for just a little bit more to support us and keep us home with her. Because we, have, we sacrificed a lot to stay home with her, and it was worth every penny. She's worth every penny. She is an amazing human being, and there's just not anyone who doesn't meet her that doesn't love to be around her. She's a lot of work. She's worth every minute. So thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My good morning. name is Sofia Cardenas. I represent the Sacramento Central Labor Council. Um, we're an organization, an AFL-CIO organization of unions. We represent about 200,000 workers um, in the larger capital region, including here in Placer County. Um, I'm here today to stand in solidarity with my siblings uh, from UDW um, and to ask you all to support uh, increasing their wages. The, the one certainty that we have in life is that we will age and as we age, um, our bodies will potentially deteriorate. And so I'd like to ask everybody on the Board of Supervisors to ask themselves, when I'm in a position that I need help, when I need somebody to help me retain my dignity as I enter old age, um, do I want somebody that's being paid uh, a sufficient amount where they can focus on me and the things that I need? Um, or do I want somebody who's struggling or thinking or worried about paying their rent or picking up their kids, um, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing I wanted to point out, and I'm so excited to see so many women in positions of leadership here in Placer County, that's incredible, um, and is a testament to where we are in this country, where we're moving towards. The majority of my UDW labor siblings are women, um, and so I encourage you to also think about this as a, as a, a wage gap issue. Right? If we're going to lift women and put women in positions where they can aspire to positions of leadership like this, we also have to demonstrate respect towards them and their jobs right now, um, and we have to protect their dignity. So with that, I'll say uh, I'm with you, brothers and sisters, every single day, whenever you need me, um, and, and also that the Sacramento CLC is, is watching and, and will remember any decisions made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the board under public comment? Please come forward. Uh, yes, I work for um, IHS, excuse me, <laughs> 15, 18 years. And when I first started, I was getting $9 an hour. And I'm 71 tomorrow is my birthday. <laughs> and um, I've been a caregiver for so long and I actually retired at 62, but my, my Social Security was only $900. So obviously I can't live on that. I mean, I'm married and everything. So I just continue to work. And I totally love my job, and I really appreciate the union finally to get our wages up. <laughs> because I don't know how much longer I'm going to have to work. So... Okay. We need your name for the record, please. Holly Rodriguez. Holly? Holly Rodriguez. Oh, okay. Thank you, Holly. Holly hugs a lot. 
<laughs> at gmail.com. And I really love World Hug Day. So <laughs> okay. everybody should do it. I mean, with the virus and stuff, yeah. you know, it's hard to do it. But I gave out, before the virus, my husband and I were in front of Save Mart, and we gave out 500 hugs. And it's called World Hug Day, January 21st. And the whole world, you can plug it in, and you can see everybody hugging all over the world. So I just, I, I hug everybody. So I'm careful, but. Okay. Right. Hugs, hugs are important. Thank you. And they're free. Is there anyone else in the audience wishes to address this board on this item? Seeing none, is there someone online? There is, Chairman. Okay. Sandy, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Yes, good morning. This is um, Sandy from Placer County. Um, so yesterday, something tragic and horrific occurred in a sister state. I would like to take a few minutes to take our thoughts and emotions to that occurrence by reading a statement by Pastor John Hibbs of Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, California. As I read this statement and invitation, please recall that our nation was founded in Judeo-Christian values. And when we take our Pledge of Allegiance, we recall that our nation is under God and that that God is the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, the God of the Holy Bible. So what Pastor Hibbs said yesterday was, was the act of insanity in Nashville an act of random murder or targeted against Christians? The answer to that question is yet to be known regarding the Nashville, Nashville Christian school shooting victims. But this we know, it should be evident to all who are keeping a finger on the pulse of our nation that we have come to a crossroads that will most likely determine the destiny of the United States. The horrific and senseless attack in Nashville, Tennessee is a commentary on the soul of America and it is clear that America's soul is sin sick. Here's why. The gospel has been rejected by our government. The word of God has been rejected by woke pastors and churches. And our nation has loosed itself from the moorings of God and his truth. The Bible tells us that God's grace is what protects us and sustains us. And without his protection, we have no safety whatsoever. God has warned us that if we push him away, we leave ourselves unprotected and vulnerable to the evils of the human heart and man's fallen nature. The only answer to what's happening in our nation is not more laws and certainly not more gun control because laws cannot change the human heart. Only Jesus Christ can do that. This is why I am inviting all of you to please join us online or in person for a time of national prayer for the victims, the families, and the community of Nashville, Tennessee. It's not too late, not yet. The Lord is waiting to hear from us. Our nation has certainly lost its way, and we may be lost as a nation, even as our enemies are at the gates. However, as a people of faith, we can choose to turn back to our nation's beginnings and to him who is mighty to save. As a people, we must receive the conviction of sin and offer to God a heart of repentance so that we might turn to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If we do not turn to him, we will see more of what we're watching today and even worse. Jesus said that his father's house should be called a house of prayer, and praying is exactly what we must do now in this hour of tragedy. By God's grace and invitation, we can stop this together as a people. Let us rend our hearts, asking God to forgive us of our sins and pray that God would forgive the grievous sins of our nation. So the invitation is to pray as a, as a nation Wednesday evening, March the 29th at 7 p.m. And I can go ahead and send the uh, the information to the the clerk and uh, and issue that access to you all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sandy. Is there any more comments online? No more. Okay, we will close public comment and move forward with our agenda. Uh, this is the part for board member and county executive reports. Any board member reports? I do. Supervisor Gus. I do. <clears throat> First off, um, thank you for your patience with me on I think one of our special meetings I was on Zoom and what I noticed being on Zoom is unless your microphone is on, you can't tell, you can't hear a thing coming out of a supervisor's 
discussion. So I just, even on our votes, it's good to, if you could, turn on your mic just so people can see and hear our votes and our discussion. Um, I wanted to, I, as you've seen, we have quite a bit of correspondence, um, much of it related to the Homewood Project and um, directed at both TRPA and the county. And I know county staff are meeting with TRPA staff to continue to discuss uh, that project and uh, how that's moving forward. I've assured many of the public we are not in a decision-making process at this point in time, but will be in the future, and i just um, happy to share any other information as I get that. Um, but I also wanted to let you know that uh, last week at the TRPA Governing Board meeting, I serve on one of the committees. We all serve on multiple committees of that board. Uh, and we had to make a, a somewhat controversial decision on an incline village project. Um, the Washoe County Board of Supervisors had unanimously supported the project. And uh, we, at our committee, passed it on for the full board. Um, and uh, there were a number of articles in Nevada papers uh, related to my vote on that. And since I represent the full board, I wanted you to know um, what the newspaper articles didn't share is that our, our counterparts in Washoe County had considered it and had unanimously supported the project. So I passed it on to the full board for decisions um, as well. But I'm very conscientious that I'm representing all of you when I serve on that board and want you to know about controversies. And there's plenty coming, as you can see from our correspondence. Um, and then finally, um, for the two of you that serve on PCTPA, um, I wanted to let you know that we were so happy to um, Supervisor Bullock from Nevada County and myself and Mayor Romack from the town hosted a meeting with PCTPA, the Tahoe Transportation District, Placer County Public Works, Nevada County Transportation Commission, the um, RTC, which is the Reno Transportation Commission, to talk about the rail, increased rail service. We know that uh, Caltrans is completing that study that will look at either two to six round trip, additional round trips up through to Reno. Um, I can tell you from all of the discussion we were having, we all stand behind uh, raising the funds necessary. We know there'll be an operating deficit. We know there'll be capital needs uh, to increase rail service. Um, but it is one um, of the most important contributions we could make to trying to resolve some of the traffic issues we have. And so our counterparts in Nevada County, Town of Truckee, and Reno all stand behind this. So just wanted to let you know that I forgot to mention uh, Washoe County Commissioner Alexis Hill was also on that meeting. Mm -hmm. So we had electeds from each of those entities along with staff from each of those. So thank you. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Thank you, Supervisor Gustin, and the board is pleased that you were able to handle all those issues up in, <laughs> in your district. Uh, Supervisor Jones? Good morning. Um, I would like to report about the uh, Kaiser's groundbreaking last Friday that I was invited to speak to, and it was quite impressive. It's a, going to be a six-story new facility, and they're also building an additional parking garage on the back side of the, of the group. But, um, as it was said the other day, uh, they've come a long way since 1980 when they first built the facility on, curb, on Riverside and, and Kirby with that one small building. And I don't know how many of you remember when they built the actual the Kaiser right there on Douglas years ago. It was just one small building on that huge expanse of property. And it looked so odd thinking back then, wow, what are they going to do? What are they going to do with all that land, you know? And now look, they're just come. This will completely build them out. But it was quite an honor to be invited and, and asked to speak at the event. And so, just wanted to let you all know. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Gore. Thank you, and thanks for the reminders about putting our microphones on when we speak. That's helpful, Cindy. Um, as you may know, I serve on the executive committee for CSAC, the Sacramento uh, Council of County, Sacramento. Area Council of Counties or whatever. Anyway, I should know that. Um, but um, as the county or the, as the state is grappling with homelessness, the primary issue for CSAC really is how we're going to address homelessness comprehensively um, as a state. And so CSAC has put together 
a proposed plan called At Home. Um, and basically it's a framework work of how we might look at addressing homelessness um, comprehensively in the state of California. And so the idea is to really have a comprehensive system in which roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. And we're really gonna focus on the, the A in the At Home, um, which is accountability, right? Who has what roles? What is the county's role when it comes to homelessness, the city's roles, the state's roles? And so um, there's gonna be more work um, on this, but I want you to know that I really appreciate our HHS team. Uh, Amy Ellis has been an integral part of helping share her expertise with the staff at CSAC, and there's, there's a lot to come on this, um, but I'm, I'm really glad that CSAC is looking at how are we going to talk about a comprehensive um, issue? How are we gonna talk about funding and who's going to do what? Uh, because if, if we, the counties who are addressing the issue, don't help drive the conversation, we're gonna have our state legislators who have never sat in our seats um, try to tell us how to address the issue. Um, and you know, there are lots of ideas out there, but you know, we're learning right now what's what works and what doesn't work we have programs right now that are that are effective we're trying to see if our our mobile um, homeless location is effective and what's working and not working and so the electeds at the county level have a lot of experience our staff have experience and so we're working really hard to help drive these conversations with the governor's office and um, I'll, I'll keep you posted. I think you all received the at-home information. And yeah. as I mentioned, we'll focus on the accountability portion uh, right now. Um, but if you've got questions, and I, you know, I told our staff if they've got suggestions, um, I appreciate hearing from them because then I can share those concerns with my colleagues at CSAC. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor. Did you have a uh, comment? County executive I did. officer I did thank you chair um, on a related note on the homeless front I just want to call the board's attention we are keeping up with our bi-monthly updates to the board on our mobile temporary shelter great credit to our multidisciplinary team who put together that update which includes mobile temporary shelter metrics to date success stories emerging trends and other takeaways from this six-month pilot effort so I just wanted to call the board's attention to that okay thank you all right, seeing no more comments from board members. Uh, now we're gonna move to our 9.30 timed item. This is a proclamation for Donate Life Month. We are asked to approve and present a proclamation establishing April 2023 as Donate Life Month in Placer County. Is uh, someone, oh, there you are. Come on forward, please, as I read this. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. And your name? Valen Kiefer. I had the honor of meeting you last year. You came to the event at oh, the that's right. courthouse. Yeah, yes. thank you. Thank you <laughs> nice to see you again. All right, I'm going to read this proclamation declaring April 2023 as Donate Life Month in Placer County. Whereas one organ donor hero can save the lives of eight people through donations of organs and improve the lives of up to 75 people with eye and tissue donation. And whereas more than 107,000 patients continue to wait for life-saving organ transplants on the national wait list, including 101,500 in our service area. Whereas every day, 22 people on the wait list die because of the shortage of organ donors, and every year, 1 million people need cornea and tissue transplant and whereas Sierra Donor Service Services serves the Northern California and Northern Nevada communities and is the center of a dynamic interconnected system supporting donor families local hospitals and transplant centers in the vital mission of saving and improving lives through organ eye and tissue donation and whereas in 2022, Sierra Donor Services for the second year in a row and through a pandemic, facilitated the transplant of 401 organs, saving more lives than ever before 
thanks to the selfless generosity of 153 organ donors and 881 tissue donors. And whereas uh, there, was an eight, there were 18 Placer County patients who became organ donors and 42 Placer County patients received organ transplants in 2022, good work. And whereas we honor all those who have given the extraordinary gift of life through living and deceased donation. And whereas Californians can register to be donors regardless of their age or medical history. And whereas we encourage every Californian to register as an organ donor, tissue donor on their driver's license or ID card at the Department of Motor Vehicles or online at donatelifecalifornia.org and talk to their family about giving the gift of life through organ, eye, and tissue donations. Now, therefore, let it be known that the above proclamation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held March 28, 2023, proclaiming the month of April 2023 as Donate Life Month. And I will entertain a motion to approve this. So moved. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. Before we take a vote on that, I would like to ask anyone from the public if they had any comments regarding this item. Oh, here we go. So close. Hi, uh, Jennifer, Placer County. Um, I think this is such a wonderful program, and I hope now that the, I don't know if this program in particular, um, discriminated against recipients not getting vaccinated or not. Um, so I hope if that's the case, that has been lifted, that you don't have to get vaccinated to receive any kind of a organ transplant or tissue transplant. Um, and to acknowledge that many people during the pandemic weren't allowed to get organ donations because they didn't vaccinate and probably lost their lives as a result of that because they weren't sure about putting whatever it was into their body. And I hope that we are celebrating the medical autonomy that you are saying in the speech. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Is there anyone online? Nothing online. Okay. Uh, now, hope we have a motion in a second. Justice and Jones. And did you say this is a roll call? No. Oh. Justice and Jones. Oh, thank you. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> all right. This proclamation is passed. Now, would you like to say a few words? Hi, I'd love to. Thank you all so much. Um, good morning to Board of Supervisors and Chair. It's nice to see you again, Mr. Holmes. Um, my life has been doubled because of organ donation. I have been dealing with chronic illnesses since a child and I have polycystic kidney disease. And I spent a year in the hospital when I was 19 years old and was on death's doorstep, on dialysis every day, inpatient in the hospital needing a life-saving transplant. And thanks to a good family friend, living donor who stepped forward, I am alive today. And we just celebrated last year my 20 year anniversary with that kidney, which is just remarkable. Um, at the time we had trouble seeing to the next hour or next day, let alone thinking I'd be standing here today at 40 years old. So it's just really mind blowing every day. And I became really ill again in my mid thirties and I needed a second life saving transplant and it was a deceased liver donor that enabled me to continue life and to continue doing what I love. And when you're a transplant recipient, saying thank you never feels like enough. So when I was growing up, I didn't have any resources or support other than my parents. I didn't have a visual representation of hope. And when I was 19 years old and received my kidney transplant, I decided to build that and I started a support group in my local community back in Pennsylvania and did educational seminars, fundraising walks, started public speaking, have now shared my story at over 100 events across North America. And I've dedicated the past 20 years of my life since my kidney transplant of expressing my gratitude through action and striving to be the role model that I wish I had when I was younger. 
My husband and I have lived here for over 10 years and Auburn is our home and we love it here. And it means so much that you have joined me in supporting this really important cause and um, opening up this conversation and educating the community. And it's really exciting that you're doing this for a second year in a row. It means a lot to me to continue this. And also last year, the Placer County Courthouse lit up blue and green for organ donation, which is the colors of Donate Life. And they're doing it again this year. So this continual support in the community is just so meaningful to me. So I wanna thank you for helping me provide education and give a face to transplantation. I, I want to demonstrate the joyful and productive and fulfilling life we can live post-transplant and most importantly, show the gratitude that transplant recipients have with the hopes that others will say yes to organ donation when they can see the opportunity that they have to give a second chance and a life to other individuals. And something else that's important to me is to provide education to our community because the transplant is one day, it's a surgery, but it's a lifelong journey. It's a journey of living immunosuppressed. It takes a lot of work. I've had over 30 surgeries. I have 65 inches of scars crisscrossing my body. I take over 20 pills a day, but I want to show that we can live a really wonderful life. It just takes work, par partnerships with our doc doctors and our families and caregivers. And so I recently created a docu-series on the trials and triumphs of transplantation that will be aired at the Auburn State Theater this summer, which I'm really excited about. So I hope that I can share that information with all of you and we'll have your support for that as well. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I'm grateful to be here to be able to thank all of you because I couldn't do that in person last year because, um, you know, which wonderful that Jim came and presented the proclamation at our event. Um, thank you for this. I hope you'll share with your friends and family why the courthouse is blue and green and open up this conversation because I think that's really important for our family and loved ones to understand our wishes and um, desires to be organ donors. And if you're not, I hope you'll consider being one. And if you already are, thank you so much. Thank you. I can't let this moment pass without uh, uh, reminding the board members that we have a county a, a staff member in the county executive office that, that donated a kidney a uh, couple, two or three years ago. So I will, that person will remain unnamed, but anyhow, mm -hmm. uh, we're very, very grateful for her participation in the program. Amazing. And I will bring this down to you for Thank you. a photo. Alrighty, we will now move to our 9.35 a.m. timed item. The California Department of Transportation, a presentation and receive a presentation from the California Department of Transportation regarding fuel taxes. Oh, hello. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, well, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, Supervisors. My name is Lauren Prohoda, and I'm from the California Department of Transportation. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here with you this morning to share some information about um, an issue that's coming down the road at, at the state um, and some of the things that the state is doing to uh, think about this and prepare um, and also some opportunities for you to be involved in this. So um, as you may be aware, uh, most of our transportation system in the state of California is funded by the gas tax. Um, this is state roads, county roads, city roads, transit, um, all the things that we rely on. Uh, to get around and do the things 
that we need to do. No. Um, but if we look to the future, though we're not going to be. But if we look to the we're future, a... though we've, it's not going to be reason for this. In general, tap, uh, bomb. Can you hear me okay? Well, we're, it's breaking up a little bit, so uh, we haven't been able to hear everything you're saying. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, No, we lost you. Can you take okay, off your am video? I, am my Maybe. back? Take off your uh, video. That might help. Okay, I'll try to that video. All right, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> um, another issue is that um, some, some Californians are shifting to vehicles that use no gas at all, uh, and that's definitely expected to increase in the future. Uh, thirdly, you know, just inflation, as, as that continues to go on, that can diminish the purchasing power. That's not as much of an issue at the state level. Um, when uh, the state passed SB1 in 2017, they did index the gas tax to inflation. However, there's also a federal gas tax, um, and that has not been increased since the early 90s. So you see that aspect at the federal level. And as these issues continue to grow, we're seeing an increasing um, unfairness in, in the way the structure of the gas tax and who's paying what. Um, those who can afford more fuel efficient vehicles um, t are paying less to use the road than those who cannot necessarily afford those, those types of vehicles or need them for their way of life. So the way this tends to play out is that those at the lower end of the economic scale are paying more uh, to use the road. Also, those in rural areas who need um, some of those larger, less fuel efficient vehicles for their way of life. So these issues are, are coming down the road at us. And what the state has uh, started investigating is an alternative um, collection method that, that's called a road charge. This is a per mile fee um, that basically it's kind of a same kind of concept as, as the utility bill. You know, you're paying for how much you use the road. Um, and so what the state is looking at this as is, again, a replacement for the gas tax. It would potentially be um, one per mile rate for all passenger vehicles so that everyone is paying the same to use the road, which is not necessarily the case under the current gas tax structure. Um, not, it's not necessarily looking to bring in more money. We're just trying to stabilize the existing revenue that the state and counties rely on. Um, it's not have, including any necessarily behavior changing aspects to it, such as charging by time of day or things like that. Um, just to illustrate some of the, the imbalance that I mentioned in terms of how, who's paying what, this is just an example of, of a handful of vehicles that you might see on the road uh, and what they're paying to drive the same number of miles under the current gas tax system. And you see that there's quite a range in any given month between these vehicles. Um, under a potential shift to a road charge, you see that coming into balance so that there's more um, equal access to using the road. I just want to give kind of a quick overview of how this system might work. Um, kind of the back of house operations and the structure of the system that we're envisioning and that we've tested in a couple of pilots is having a state oversight agency that would um, oversee and, and certify some private third party commercial account managers. And these account managers would handle the day-to-day -day interaction between um, the taxpayer and collecting that road charge and providing the invoicing. All that would be provided to the state at the end of the day would be the number of miles and the tax due. What it looks like more on the taxpayer perspective, is there would be a range of choices on how the taxpayer could choose to report their miles. Um, and these would range from very low tech options to very high tech options. And one of the things that we feel is very important in providing these options is really giving taxpayers choices on how they wanna interact with this system. Um, in our society today, we're constantly faced with choices on how to manage our data. Um, and there's usually some sort of trade-off between 
efficiency and privacy. And we want to make sure that individual taxpayers can be making that decision for themselves. Um, so on the low tech end, you know, you'd have something very simple and straightforward, such as a third party odometer read. So you could envision something like a smog check scenario where you go in, you have someone read your odometer and report it for you. There's no technology required for that. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, we have vehicles coming off the line today that are including in-vehicle telematics that are constantly automatically reporting tons of data to the car manufacturer without any effort by the driver. And some people prefer that efficiency and understanding where they've been driving and things like that. So again, many options for the taxpayer to, to support that choice um, and also just to support access across different kinds of vehicles. Because obviously if we're thinking classic vehicles, they're not gonna have the high tech stuff as much. Also different people have different levels of access to technology. So we, again, that's another reason to support a range of reporting options. So what, I just wanna give you an overview of the national picture and what's going on on this front, because this is an issue that all states are facing uh, because all states in some aspect rely on the gas tax to fund uh, some part of their road maintenance. So uh, there are actually already three states in the U.S. that have an active road, road charge program, Oregon, Utah, and Virginia. Uh, there are a number of states as well who have done pilots, those are the states in green, uh, and then a bunch of other states that are actively studying the potential of this. In addition, um, in last year's federal transportation bill, Congress included a national pilot, which we expect uh, the, the U.S. Department of Transportation to start unrolling this year. So a lot of states um, are looking at this as a potential option. You see, you know, it's both sides of the country, the middle, it's both red and blue states, looking at this as a practical usage-based fee that has potential to replace the gas tax. So I really wanted to, to share this information with you because California is rolling out its next pilot on this issue. Um, and this pilot that we're just about to launch um, is really focused on the impact to rural drivers and to tribal communities. Um, we want to study how this system may interact with the unique considerations of their day to day uh, and the unique concerns of their communities. Um, so we're, we're looking to recruit folks from very rural areas of the state and from the tribes that call California home uh, to participate in this pilot, pilot and just live with it a little bit, see how they like it, see the, how they hate it, give us their feedback. Um, we're also just really trying to do a lot of outreach in rural areas uh, to talk about this and to share this information and get feedback. We really want to bring the rural areas of the state and the tribal communities of the state to the table, make sure their voice is heard as this idea is being developed and considered um, so that we make sure that their, their concerns and priorities are included. Um, so as I said, we're about to launch this pilot, but we are still recruiting. Uh, you can see the link on the screen. Um, if you're interested in signing up, we are offering incentives of up to $250 per person if you wanna participate. And we're still really looking, uh, especially uh, for members of tribe to uh, sign up. Um, we're also happy to come to any meetings that you have in your community to, to talk about this with your community uh, and engage and, and listen uh, to what people's questions and concerns might be uh, and really just um, offer an opportunity to be involved um, as the state is considering how to solve this, this coming issue. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions, any feedback. Um, you can see uh, my contact information there. Uh, also our website that has a ton more information um, it also has uh, a calculator on it. If you want to understand what what the numbers are, what it means for you personally, uh, you can go onto our website and in that calculator, put your own car in, the number of miles you drive, and it'll give you an estimate of what you currently pay under the gas tax and what you might pay under a road charge. So you can see the numbers for yourself. So with that, hopefully you caught everything and um, uh, happy to take any questions or 
or hear what your your thoughts are. Really appreciate this opportunity to to engage with you all and share this. Chair Holmes, I have a question for Lauren. I'm sorry. I have a question. That I know. I have a question. Could I go ahead and ask? Yes, please. Yeah, um, Lauren, this is Cindy Gustafson, and. Um, I represent a lot of the rural uh, part of our county um, through the I-80 corridor. Um, and my question is not so much what we pay, um, because we pay a lot in gas taxes now to live in rural communities, but more importantly, how the funds will be distributed. Because we get huge numbers of individuals from other areas, other jurisdictions who vacation or recreate in um, you know, at one end of our county and come through our county and yet, you know, if the funds are distributed back based on where they live full time, it wouldn't be fair to the more rural areas. So I'm very interested in that dynamic. We have 10 to 12 million visitors a year that uh, come to Lake Tahoe and many of those come on the I-80 corridor through Placer County. Um, and that's millions more than our local residents. So I'm interested in uh, what discussions have been there on how the funding would be distributed from these revenues. Thank you, that's a great question. And I know it's, it's a very important one, especially in some of the areas of the state that have a lot of tourism, such as Tahoe, Yosemite, those kind of areas of the state, because the existing funding formula that's in currently in state law does not include that BMT aspect, right? So um, I realize it's an important issue. The scope of my research program is not necessarily looking on the expenditure side of things. We're focused on how it's collected. Um, that being said, all of this has to be debated by the legislature. Uh, and as we know, the legislature has the power of the purse. Um, and if they, if they wish um, to change that funding formula, they certainly could. Um, with road charge, I will say there is some potential for some better data on the VMT front. Um, because some of those high tech uh, reporting options can include location uh, tracking if the taxpayer so chooses, that could provide more detailed information in the state about where those miles are being driven. Um, so it could serve as an additional data source potentially to better inform that expenditure formula. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things to think about looking ahead, should the legislature um, decide to consider this as an alternative for the gas tax, um, you know, that, that could be a conversation of, of, of change, point of change at that point. Um, I, I can't say anything specific to what it might be, because again, the scope of my program is really on the intake side, but I realize that that's a, a big point of concern as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and um, I just, I know that for many of our rural communities, there's so many people who come to recreate and enjoy lifestyle and they're impacting our roads and we need those funds from the state. So we'll have to work with our legislature um, to fight for a, maybe a more equitable way to distribute those funds. Thanks for your uh, report today. The, excuse me, the rural county representatives of California are also concerned about this. Yeah. Supervisor Landon. Yes, I have a couple questions. Um, my first one, and I don't know, this might not be something you can answer right now as you kind of just addressed, but is will, will there be a guarantee that the gas tax would go away? Just looking at the history of way things had, the way things have worked in California, um, I'd like to know whether there will be a guarantee so people aren't being double taxed. So that's a great question. Um, and I will never guarantee what the legislature may choose to do. You know, that, that will be a political question. What I can say is that the way that the administration is looking at, at it right now in, in our research efforts is as a replacement to the gas tax. The, the, the gas tax would be sunsetted, it would go away. That that this is, you know, trying to stabilize that existing revenue. Whether the legislature, you know, chooses to take that tack as well, I, you know, I can't, I can't speak to that because that's the legislature. Um, but that is, that is the way we're studying it at this time, that it, again, it would be a replacement. Okay, thanks. And then a couple other things that, 
if you can't answer them, I guess I would at least want to put on the public record of concerns and questions I would have would be um, how would out-of-state travel work and whether those funds would be captured for people that are traveling here um, to California. And then on the flip side of that, for people that are traveling outside of California, would we then be charged going into other states for those miles traveled as well? So those are a couple questions, but I know you can't answer those right now. <laughs> oh, but, but I can. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, out of state travel is, of course, you know, a, a big issue. We recognize that people go outside of California. Um, and if it's, a, if it's a issue for us, you can only imagine how much of an issue it is for states in New England, where a good 40% of their travel is in another state. So we have been working with a number of different states who are looking at this issue. We've actually tested um, an interoperable system model with the state of Oregon. Uh, and this idea is kind of built off of the concept of, um, if you're familiar with the International Fuel Tax Agreement, that is the existing system used for interstate trucking to sort out state-by-state uh, -state gas taxes. So it's kind of the central clearinghouse model that sorts out the funds based on the miles uh, to the appropriate states. So we kind of took that idea and we've been testing that, that system with other states. So we anticipate that that could be um, a very good model to handle that interstate traffic issue. Now, that being said, there would be a transition period. I would not anticipate that all 50 states would change to a road use charge system at the same time. Um, so we would probably, you know, have a, that transition period, but that's how we're, we're approaching the out-of-state travel issue um, that would capture, you know, both Californians traveling in other states and giving the appropriate revenue to those other states and folks from other states who are visiting California. Okay, and then last question. If we wanted you or someone from your team to come speak at one of our MACs, um, is the best method with that website the contact us website or is there another method oh uh, yeah you can get through us to the website or also my direct contact information is on the the powerpoint you're happy, welcome to reach out to me directly as well okay thank you thank you any other comments from board members seeing none is there anyone uh, in the public wish to address the board on this item hello again hi uh, I'm back Jennifer Placer County um, just a few um, things to maybe think about with this program we start a lot of programs with really good intentions like this sounds really fantastic you know equaling out not paying more hopefully distributing so the roads everywhere will get attention um, but a lot of times we end up starting something with really good intentions and then we go well maybe if you drive more than X amount of miles a year, you're gonna actually pay a little bit more. And I feel like this is gonna end up creating an inequality that it's trying to um, fix right now, which we already have. So on top of that, if we start going into a lot of green initiatives which are coming our way, we are going to be penalized for driving and we are gonna be charged more per mile, and the rural communities are gonna end up being penalized even more so, I believe, especially if we go into the central banking digital currency, and it may actually cut off so you can't buy gas, and then you won't be able to travel and you'll be stranded. Um, so I, I think we, we need to look at this at a bigger picture. Um, the concept sounds really good, but we need to build in um, safeties so we can't end up changing it down the road and penalizing people even more than they're being penalized right now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other com public comment? Okay, that's not all. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we look forward to a continued conversation about this item. Uh, particularly for the rural areas. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we will move to item, timed item, the 1005 timed item. This is a board ratification of HR 1586 support letter. Uh, and this. Good morning, Chair, members of your board, Jane, Karen, Joel Joyce of the County Executive Office. 
Uh, today I'm asking the board to ratify a support letter for HR 1586, otherwise known as the Forest Protection and Wildland Firefighter Safety Act of 2003. What this bill does, this bill explicitly allows a Clean Water Act exemption for the use of fire retardant chemicals or water for fire suppression, control, or prevention activities. Uh, you may ask yourself, as I did, why this bill's needed, uh, as we've been using fire retardants uh, for fighting fires uh, since I can remember. Um, this bill was introduced because a group out of Oregon called the Forest Service Employees for Environmental Ethics is suing the United States Forest under the Clean Water Act to require a permit to drop fire retardant chemicals or water. Um, you, the United States Forest Service has agreed to seek this permit. However, this past fall, uh, this group did request an injunction uh, to stop the use of fire retardant being utilized to uh, fight fires. And if that injunction is granted, uh, the use of fire retardant would not be allowed for 2003, 2004, or however long it takes to, for this permit to be granted. Uh, so with that, uh, Congressman Doug LaMalfa, uh, formerly represented Placer County, had introduced this bill on March 14th. It has been referred to three committees within the House of Representatives. And it's currently co-sponsored by 28 uh, different members within the House of Representatives, including our own Congressman Kevin Kiley. Um, within that 28 co-sponsorships, you have 25 Republicans and three Democrats. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know we have some folks in the audience that are more knowledgeable about fire science than I, and I know they're, they're available as well. So do they have any idea what we're supposed to do while the forest is burning down, while we fill out the permit? Any idea about that? No comment. OK. Good. Good. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, any board member comments? I see none. Does anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Always work in the crowd. Always work in the crowd, yes sir. <laughs> Chairman, supervisors, thank you so much for your support of HR 1586, the Forest Protection and Wildland Forester Safety Act. We really appreciate that we called, and in such short order, we received a support letter from you and the board, and we really appreciate that. Right now, we are waiting for the Ag Committee and TNI to either have a markup or waive jurisdictions back to Natural Resource. This is a high priority for the House Ag Committee. We want to get this to the floor. Senator Cynthia Loomis from Wyoming is carrying the companion bill in the Senate. And of course, I will keep you updated as things progress, but we appreciate your quick response and your understanding of this very pressing issue. So thank you very much. And thank you for having me here today too. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions? I have none, no? Oh, uh, Suzanne. Yeah, Suzanne I would just like to make a comment that I, it surprises me that only three Democrats signed on to this bill because of the implications if we don't use the fire retardant. I mean, we suffer a greater loss of life loss mm -hmm. of property, loss of business and or financial livelihood, as well as all those insurance companies that we're struggling with to, to keep insurance mm -hmm. coverage for those people who live in these potential fire areas. Sure, and Maybe infrastructure as well. And you know, I, I deal with federal agencies when it comes to permitting, and can you imagine trying to get a permit and waiting two to three years as your forest <laughs> burns down? So um, we, are, uh, we are paying attention, we are doing everything we can, and um, we do appreciate the bipartisan support that we do have right. on this bill as well. So we feel like it is common sense legislation that we do hope to get to the floor. Thank you. Sounds good. Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to thank Congressman LaMalfa and staff for bringing this forward and Chair Holmes for getting it signed and back and putting it on the public agenda so our community hears that you know that this is a threat and those of us that have been now through two and a half three wildfires i guess we can call one a half <laughs> in the last couple of years this was instrumental in protecting our communities and certainly the town of forest hill the community of forest hill was saved because of the retardant so oh absolutely when uh, when this came to our attention i immediately thought of the city of colfax and forest hill as two communities that just in the last two years, I believe, you know, 
those communities, that infrastructure has been saved by this vital tool that we have in our tool chest. And I do feel, and the Congressman feels this way, that firefighter safety and lives are also at risk. So. Our PIO has a great photo of Chief Estes and the, the uh, retardant being dropped to protect Wharton. So I think that should be go with uh, any lobbying you do in yeah, right. D.C. Absolutely. Thank you again, and I will keep you updated. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public? I see none. All right. Uh, I think we need to take action on this. I'll move approval. It's motioned by Supervisor Gustafson and seconded by Jones. Supervisor Jones. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item's moved. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Now we will move to uh, the 1015 a.m. timed item, County Executive Office. Propose multi-agency multi model within the Office of Emergency Services. And this is kind of uh, appropriate following our last uh, item. Uh, good morning. morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board. Becky Reagan from the County Executive Office. It's my pleasure to introduce this proposal for your board's consideration today. <clears throat> Before I begin, I'll acknowledge the experts who will be presenting the model to you. Um, Sheriff Wayne Wu, uh, Cal Fire and Placer County Fire Chief Brian Estes, and Assistant Director of Emergency Services, Dave Atkinson. The action before you is to receive the presentation on a new multi-agency service model for emergency services. Should your board direct staff to proceed, this would be a new investment of just under $1.1 million into emergency services. The basis for this recommendation is really an intersection of several factors. The unprecedented frequency and severity of emergencies across California and here in Placer County. As your board is well aware, in the past two years, we have had five state or federal emergencies. And during that time, we've also had over a dozen lower level activations of the Emergency Operations Center. All of these events underscore the need for enhanced planning, public information, and coordination before, during, and uh, following these emergencies. To our knowledge, the proposed model is the first of its kind in the state. Uh, and that continues to build upon the history here in Placer County of seeking innovative solutions for all the challenges that we face. I'll now turn the presentation over to the experts, uh, beginning with Sheriff Wu. Good morning, Mr. Sheriff. Good morning, Chair, uh, members of the board, Jane, Karen. Pleasure to be here to talk about um, this proposed model for OES. And I'd like to start with just maybe talking about a little background of some of the Office of Emergency Services models throughout the state of California. Really there's two dominant models throughout the state. It's either run kind of like ours is run under the county executive's office, more of a civilian run model, or it falls under the office of the sheriff and it's run by the law enforcement uh, arm of the county under the office of the sheriff without county executive's office involvement. Um, you know, Chief Estes and I started having some conversations about this, uh, talking about the need, um, like Becky mentioned, when you think about Placer County and the number of emergencies we've had, and not just the number, but uh, quite frankly, the duration, and in today's day and age, the public expectation, and really there's just zero room for error anymore, uh, really, brought a lot of points to the forefront and really made the chief and I start having some in-depth conversations with the county executive's office on where we saw the future of OES and where we could take it. And quite frankly, I think uh, the county is really going through some growing pains. Like Becky mentioned, we've seen uh, unprecedented emergencies and quite frankly, I feel like we've been in an, one emergency after another or critical incident since I've taken office. And, 
I'm not ready to blame it on myself yet, so I'm going to say it's growing pains, quite frankly. Okay. You know, uh, our county, uh, as much as we love that small town feel, we have to, you know, realize that we are over 400,000 people and growing rapidly. Um, you know, and sheriff's office, I'm sure it's probably the same with county organizations as far as National Association of Counties. At 500,000, there's a different organization, major county sheriffs and other things that you become involved in. And hard to think that Placer County would be considered a major county in the, in the entire country, but that's the truth. And so as we look towards the emergencies we're facing um, and the unprecedented nature that maybe we're not used to, I think we had to look out a little bit outside the box on how we were going to address that moving forward. So we start talking about this multidisciplinary model. Um, you know, our relationship with CAL FIRE, I'd like to think, is somewhat unique compared to the rest of the state of California. We've always had a very good collaborative uh, relationship with CAL FIRE, and we've done joint training starting, uh, you know, two decades ago, I can remember doing joint training days with CAL FIRE. And we've only expanded and built on those relationships over the years to get to where we are today. Um, those other approaches I talked about in the beginning that other counties use, they, they really do create silos. And there are silos in emergency services, and especially when it comes to emergency response. And I think that's one of the keys, is you take our culture here in Placer County, where we really are going to approach this thing as Team Placer, with the Sheriff's Office, the CEO's Office, and the Fire Service, arm in arm, and address all incidents that we're willing to face. I think the other I think strength and bonus we get out of that is um, we're each very good at our individual disciplines. Um, we each have certain responsibilities that we're very good at, but we all have our own strengths and weaknesses too. And um, you know, I, I really am passionate about this if I'm willing to say in public that there's a lot we can learn from the fire service, I think. <laughs> so we, can, we have strengths and weaknesses and we will make each other better. Um, I think with this approach and in the end have better outcomes and it'll be better for the citizens of this community. So we talk about what is this going to bring? Obviously it's going to bring enhanced response, um, but more importantly it's going to bring assistance in the planning, preparation, training, education, and the communication phases that I think are so important when you're talking about emergency management today. Uh, you just look back to the response in the mosquito fire and i um, very proud of the work the men and women of the Sheriff's Office did and uh, the way we handled those evacuations, but that didn't happen by accident. We worked um, collaboratively with CAL FIRE on a process to make specific maps just for the Forest Hill Divide and broke them up into individual sectors so they could easily be disseminated to incoming agencies, even agencies that were out of our jurisdiction when we called for mutual aid to quickly evacuate the Forest Hill Divide because it was always such a concern of ours over the years, knowing that there was going to be a large wildland fire in that area. Um, that process took 18 plus months to get done. And I think those are some of the kind of things that are, are, are critically important as we move forward to put more plans like that into place all over our community and continue to adapt and evolve as our community grows. The other part, the training and education, communication, um, really I think with this model we can train not just and educate the public but other first responders. Um, I think we can coordinate incidents and scenario training like we used to. We used to many years ago have uh, countywide emergency responses whether it's at the Roseville, Roseville Rail Yard, um, hazardous material spills, all kinds of different things that I think we can put in place with a model like this. And then of course, uh, in this day and age of social media, um, the expectation on communication is ever demanding of critical real-time information coming out during critical incidents. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the Sheriff's Office responsibilities. And as we first had this conversation and started talking about it, it made a lot of sense in many ways. Um, but quite frankly, as you saw in a previous slide, you know, uh, we saw what it would cost. Um, and it is an expensive investment. Uh, and as I really looked at, I want to make sure I'm being a good steward of the taxpayer dollar and make sure we could justify not only the emergency response, but all the other things that could be done in those planning, preparation, training, education phases. And I'm going to touch on a few things um, 
it's not all encompassing of all the duties and responsibilities, but I think it's uh, just to enlighten maybe the board and other members of the community on some of the responsibilities we have under the office of the sheriff that I think would reside under our person assigned at the Office of Emergency Services and why it makes so much sense. So obviously they would be engaged in the law branch of the emergency operations plan. It's, it's already listed in there. The other thing is by statute uh, as the sheriff, I'm the law enforcement mutual aid coordinator for our county. Um, which is unique because you know mutual aid comes in many different forms so it would be really nice to have one centralized location for all mutual aid requests that's all run out of OES. Right now a lot of these duties are the responsibility of a swing shift watch commander which I already talked about our growing pains, um, how busy we are. Uh, a lot of times if there's critical incidents that need to be managed in the field sometimes they don't have the capacity or the time to schedule mutual aid for you know the protest over the Memphis video release that's getting ready to happen down in Sacramento and, and pre-position all of our resources. The other thing that we're responsible for by statute is search and rescue. Um, our search and rescue team is, is very well regarded in Placer County and throughout the state. We have a great reputation and we get used a lot so a lot of mutual aid requests come in we utilize them a lot and they go all over the state of california with mutual aid requests and then i talked about hazmat hazmat's i think something that touches all three of the disciplines that we want to put in the office of emergency services um, but statutorily it's law enforcement's responsibility so the fire department runs the hazmat team it's our responsibility and then oes has a component as well and as you all know with the rail system and interstate 80 and what we've seen on the news just over the last month um, hazardous material spills can be critical and uh, need to be managed appropriately because of the impact it can have on a community and we also oversee the mass notifications. Some of the other special teams, dive, our air operations unit, and things like that will also be uh, under this assignment um, to have additional duties assigned. Um, I, I put grant funding opportunities because I really feel like that's an untapped resource. Uh, whether it's grant funding for some of the fire evacuation preparation I just talked about, like we did in Forest Hill, um, training for hazardous materials and things like that. And with this multidisciplinary approach and such a unique opportunity, um, I think it positions the county well to compete for these grants when we are going after it and attacking these problems with kind of this three-pronged emergency response approach, including fire law and our county OES partners. So um, I think there's plenty of work, obviously, to justify these positions. Um, it is going to be a little bit of a culture shift, I think. It might be why uh, you don't see it in other communities or other jurisdictions. Um, but I think it's the culture that we have and enjoy here in Placer County that already exists, which is why this can be successful. Our collaboration with all of our partners, the fact that we work together towards a common goal, all those things I think have pre-positioned um, us to make this extremely successful um, should your board choose to uh, approve it. Now, I thought a lot about this. Um, thought a lot about the potential, thought a lot about the need. Many times as I've thought about it, I've often wondered why we didn't think of it sooner and how come nobody else has thought of it because it just makes so much sense. And uh, as I close, I'll just share some of my thoughts as kept popping into my head. And one of them is uh, an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And every time I think of this model, that pops in my head because I, I truly think that by working together, I'm confident with the product that is going to come out of this team. I'm confident in how far we will be able to take it, and I'm confident that we will become the model in the state of California that other counties eventually look to and want to emulate. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and consideration, and I will turn the presentation over to Chief Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Chief Estes. Good morning, Chairman, and thank you, Sheriff, uh, for the kind words. Um, uh, good morning, Chairman Holmes, members of the board. Um, thank you very, very much for allowing us the opportunity to speak with you this morning. My name is Brian Estes. I'm the state and county fire chief. 
And um, I could not echo the words from Sheriff Wu um, more succinctly, uh, and, and especially those, those last words about walking forward as a team. And, you know, when I, when I look back um, over the last 33 years of my career in the fire service, I remember um, one of my first chief officers telling me that um, I could, you know, it's not rocket science on how to pump water out of a fire engine, but it's all about relationships. It's all about working together and, and really um, gathering the strength of those around you. And, you know, without, without sounding too cliche about this, in my time with the incident management teams across the state of California, I can tell you with great certainty that these relationships do not exist across all counties. The integration and the communication and the openness of the sheriff's office and OES and the fire uh, department to be um, willing to learn from each other and to be open to new ideas and new ways of doing business is uh, is truly unique to our county. And and I agree that um, you know what what Wayne was saying about our county growing up. The fact of the matter is is that we have had an abnormally high amount of state and federally uh, declared emergencies, and that's not including the. Um, the smaller activations that we've had over the last six years in my tenure as your fire chief. And I, I reflect back to our pandemic, our health emergencies. We were activated in the EOC for over four months with the COVID-19 pandemic, something that the sheriff's office and us, frankly, we didn't know how to deal with. We really didn't know what the steps forward were, but we figured it out because we trusted each other and we asked and we learned from each other with the assistance of the expertise out of OES. So as I move forward and talk a little bit about the fire department's role in this, um, I, I wanna couch it in, in the same things that Wayne said, which is we have learned a tremendous amount and opened ourselves up to what an organization as professional as the Placer County Sheriff's Office and the CEO's office and OES brings to the table and we're better for it. So in Placer County Fire's role in OES, the current emergency operating plan mandates that fire rescue branch. And the, and the branch is simply just an organizational term. It's just a division of labor, comes out of the in incident command system, division, groups, branches, sections, et cetera. And really it's to keep your span of control. And the fire service um, may be slightly different from law enforcement in Placer County has a, 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 a um, a real diversity from municipalities to our county fire department to our special districts that range from large, medium, and small in size. And, and all those jurisdictions are important. Um, and I think that even rings more true why the importance of having a single point of contact in, in OES and in the EOC is. And as the county fire department, we assume that role and we respect the jurisdictions and the roles of all our allied fire service partners across both the east side and the west side of our county. And as that intel comes in and as those needs come in from our partners, having that single point to validate and verify intel and turn it into information and needs and fill those needs back out to the field is incredibly important. All of our disasters in this county are going to, ha going to have a, a tremendous impact on both PCF and PCSO. You know, as Wayne said earlier, the jurisdictional authority for uh, evacuations in a wildfire is with the sheriff's office. The decisions on where we're going to evacuate fall on the fire department. Um, as Gene and I have talked about many, many times, we have more habitable structures within the SRA than any other county in the state of California. The vast majority of the entire county sits within a, a high or very high fire severity zone uh, within CAL FIRE's rating system. Of our 475 square miles of county fire department protection area, over three quarters of that sits in a high fire severity zone. And that's just wildfires. That, that puts aside all the stuff that Wayne and I and Dave have been dealing with in our departments for, you know, really since January 1st. Low snow events have become more of a common, occur a common occurrence. Flooding events have become a common occurrence. Civil unrest, health pandemics, and we really don't know what the next uh, event over the horizon is, but what I can tell you is that working together, we are prepared. We are more prepared than working alone. Um, and, and that is a guarantee that Wayne and I will make to you. 
We currently have no mechanism, and one of the things that Wayne and I have talked about as a challenge is when we are all hands on deck and we have the scope of these emergencies in front of us, it's very difficult for us to peel a person at a command level off of our command structure um, and put them into the EOC. It's incredibly important, but we've done that on the backs of our, of our existing employees. And, and it's really tough. We also have the regional demands. You know, one of the things I'm so proud to say about our relationship with the sheriff's office is they were one of the first sheriff's offices in the state to commit a command officer to our type one incident management teams. And that was then Sergeant Shane Wright, now our under sheriff, uh, back six years ago. Um, and, and that has fostered an environment where our type one teams rely on and integrate uh, sheriff's officers onto those teams. Standing in the back of the room is Assistant Chief Brian Mackwood, who just came back last night from two weeks over in Bishop, deployed with one of our two type one teams assigned in the state to assist uh, the east side of our state and Southern California. So it's very real, it's happening in an integrated manner and it's happening all over the state. As Becky and, and Wayne both mentioned, five state and federal declarations over the last few years, really since 2020, and our demand for bringing that intelligence in and validating it, turning it into credible information and getting that information out to all of you as electeds and to our stakeholders, both internal and external, is so critically important. <clears throat> so this proposed model would, would bring that, um, that dedicated command officer, that assistant chief position, into the EOC, uh, not only for the, for the response component, but for that planning, that preparedness, and that recovery. That collaboration with PCSO, having the jurisdictional authority, as Wayne said, it took us over 18 months to do an evacuation plan for Forest Hill. It sure paid off, but we were just doing that with the backs of, on the backs of people um, like Ty Connor, who's standing in the back of the room, Kevin Griffiths, um, some of my battalion chiefs who were trying to do it while doing their day jobs. And we have, you know, probably in excess of 30 or 40 different evacuation plans that we could put as a priority tomorrow, but we just don't have the bandwidth to complete those. They're very, very intensive projects, but they really paid off in the case of um, the Mosquito Fire. As, as you all know, Grass Valley uh, Emergency Command Center is our Region 4 Coordination Center, coordinating 11 counties, including Placer, uh, for um, the Office of Emergency Services and the Fire Rescue Branch. So having, as Wayne said, being the Lima coordinator and having myself there to have nothing lost in translation when we have that need to bring in mutual aid resources or in an extreme case, a type one incident management team uh, to support our needs locally here. As Wayne did say, we have a multi-pronged approach to the management of our hazardous materials response team in the county. Currently, there are only two teams. Uh, that's ours and the city of Roseville. Um, and our jurisdiction for our team responds basically from the city boundaries all the way up into uh, Truckee to state line. So it's an incredibly important team to oversee, but we have to be able to do that in conjunction with OES and uh, the Sheriff's Office. We have additional teams that we work very closely with the Sheriff's Office on, including our tactical EMS team and, um, and our technical rescue team, which is the only team um, signatory with the Sheriff's Office in the county. And we saw such an amazing use of that team with the Sheriff's Office on the east side during this snow event, doing things that they had never done before, literally cutting blocks of snow and ice five and six feet deep off the tops of roofs and winching them with complex rope systems off to relieve the pressure off of schools and county buildings and residents that were at risk. Um, we couldn't have done that if we didn't have these people working together, communicating, talking, Dave and his staff in there, giving us the information and us being able to look at solving those problems. And then, you know, the other thing that's right on our doorstep is the Community Preparedness and Wildfire Mitigation uh, Division out of the state, mandated by Assembly Bill 38. And that has everything to do with, with the CPUC, with home hardening, with defensible space inspections, coordinating our work with fire safe councils, firewise communities, OES, the fire marshal's office, both state and county, and having that collaborative effort and being able to um, access grant funding and meet our needs for that 
is also a tremendous attribute of this proposed position. So um, I want to echo in closing before I turn it over to Dave, just m my um, appreciation for the board's support for emergency services in general. It is very much known and, and not taken for granted and very much appreciated. And, and also my thanks to uh, my partner, Sheriff Wu, for his support of both the fire department and, and the sheriff's office as a team. So with that, I'll turn it over to our assistant director for OES, Dave Atkinson. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Good morning, board. Dave Atkinson, assistant director of emergency services. Uh, our objective for this initiative, um, very simply stated, to foster a ready and resilient Placer County of course, the challenge is when we dig deeper into those eight words, we really start to understand what's before us. Risk is going up. You've heard a bit about uh, the hazard frequency, five declared disasters in just the last couple of years, uh, uh, almost unprecedented. And then also we have more exposure. Uh, was just listening to a presentation, I think it was last week, about what's going on on the west, west side of the county. I think almost 20,000 homes coming uh, our way. Uh, in a very different uh, field than maybe the other parts of the unincorporated of Placer County. And so how do we get in front of that and make sure that we're well prepared, well positioned uh, to deal with those challenges in addition to the ones that we already face? The, the populations that we're serving are changing and so are their expectations. Um, but we also have some opportunities. Uh, that same increased operational tempo has built some really strong relationships and I think is the little bit of the aha moment that got us to this point about how much farther we could go with this uh, with a little bit more uh, resources available. And so really we think this positions us well for an innovative, effective, efficient, and coordinated community risk reduction. And I think we need to stop thinking about this and, and we chatted about this a little bit more of an emergency management mindset than an emergency services mindset. We have to manage the risk. How do we decide where are those most vulnerable things, whether it's people or infrastructure, whatever those are, put the, you know, the right resources in the right places at the right time. And all of that uh, uh, takes time and effort and the right folks with the right um, knowledge sets uh, to put that all together. And so that leads us to planning. And of course, planning is that very critical step in that risk management where we really dig into the who, the what, and the how. Knowing what data is needed. Uh, as an example, those five des declared disasters means we're now in five recoveries. Um, through trial, uh, we have learned what, what the state and the federal government expect on the back end when we do recovery. And that knowledge has allowed us to push that data collection uh, I think you have seen the disaster uh, survey that we have put out. Um, that helps us make the case to the state and the federal government about the needs that our community has in these disasters. And we've now learned uh, to push that up farther earlier in the process so that we can be uh, more ready when the time comes when the state and the federal government starts asking those questions. Planning, of course, speeds recovery, reduces administrative costs, and gets us ready for mitigation. There's also a lot of new state legislation in this area. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, evacuation planning. There's some new requirements out there for the safety element about uh, modeling our, our roadways and that that will be critical for our evacuations. Uh, also, the ability to really to do uh, more work and be more in front of uh, large pre-planned events. We actually have quite a few of those in our county. The ski cup was just the most current example of a uh, little bit of extra work we would be able to do because of that investment of having some extra folks in the EOC uh, to sit down and have time to devote to that. Public information and warning. Communicating with the public and the media or in the community is absolutely vital. And it's not just during emergencies. We really, we really need to, uh, to put more into that, get more information out there, and enlist the help of our communities that we serve in this process. Government just can't do it all, um, and we really need their help. And so how do we engage the community in that? Uh, things like our fire safe councils and our firewise communities and all those other groups out there uh, that are willing and eager to help 
uh, with a little bit of understanding and a little bit of knowledge and guidance from the group that we're proposing to put together. Of course, operational coordination. And another aspect of this that we're hoping to bolster is the training and exercise. Going through all that planning effort and getting well-written plans is, is wonderful and a very much needed step. But then we need to also train on those plans and then exercise them. We need to put them under a little bit of stress and see, did we catch everything? Is there something we missed? Things are always changing, so we always need to be training and exercising on those to see where do we need to revise our plans. And then, of course, training and exercise really helps us just translate planning into action, which is, of course, uh, what we're looking for. It also provides us an opportunity to think about mit hazard mitigation. So areas where what can we do to keep uh, the impacts of those disasters and those hazards uh, from being uh, as large as they might be. And it just helps us identify opportunities for recovery as well. And of course, we talked a lot about mutual aid and relationships. So there's really four or five mutual aid programs in California, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and having most of those already housed in the Emergency Operations Center just adds to that coordination, adds to that efficiency. How do we share resources? They're limited. You know, you heard a little bit about some of the type one teams heading down south. How do we make sure though that while resources are headed in other directions, do we ensure that we maintain uh, the capacity and the things that we need so that we can respond here as well? And so just having that, all of that housed in one place just increases our ability to communicate, our ability to share resources, and our ability to maybe leverage things like volunteer programs. We already have a strong, you heard about the Sheriff's Volunteer Search and Rescue, our Placer County Fire also has a great volunteer program and we've talked about are there other opportunities for volunteerism that would even uh, you know, further enhance our ability to respond and recover. So uh, we did our best to try to take all of this and put it in something that made a little bit of sense. Um, uh, as an engineer, the Venn diagram is always, uh, always makes me smile. Um, but uh, just trying to understand, you know, that there are a lot of places where these, uh, these uh, groups, these organizations that, you know, we know have some overlap, right? We all have emergency services. We have emergency something in our name or in our work. But how do they overlap and where are there opportunities to expand that to outside of response? Uh, just to make us more ready and more resilient because uh, the risk is just going to continue to go up and we have to continue to do our very best to stay in front of it and manage that risk and that's and that's very much our goal and with that I will turn it back over to Vicki uh, thank you Dave Just to review, um, again, should your board uh, provide direction for us to proceed on this, the um, fiscal impact is anticipated as follows. Um, just under $1.1 million total, one-time cost would be for building renovations to the EOC of approximately 120,000 uh, vehicles and equipment for both fire and law come in at 167,000. And then the ongoing costs uh, for sheriff's lieutenant allocation are 390,000 and a Placer County Fire Assistant Chief allocation at 378000 So again, should your board so direct, uh, these elements would be incorporated into the final budget and to the Placer County Fire contract with CAL FIRE. So that concludes our presentation, and we're all available for any questions or comments. Okay, I just want to thank everyone for their presentation. Uh, you know, I've watched uh, your multi-agency training out on, on Atwood Road uh, two or three times, and. You've always been prepared to work together, and I think this is just a logical result of that uh, to bring this forward. Uh, Supervisor Gustafson. Of course, I had to go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I just want to thank Sheriff Wu, Chief Estes, Dave, and Becky um, for the great presentation and cooperation. Um, it is time for our county to take a leadership role in this arena. And not that you haven't all been doing that already, but to solidify that with our support and resources. Um, in addition to everything you mentioned, again, I don't know how many days this year I've been stuck down here, but I'm assuming it's another day this tonight. Um, 
we get cut off from the East Slope. And so we have a, a vast number of resources and agencies up there to protect that often your staff are cut off from protecting as well. And so that coordination goes beyond what we're talking about here today, but with Nevada County, Town of Truckee, uh, Washoe County, whatever other resources that we need in those emergencies, which we've had far too many of in my district in the last four years. So um, I just, I really thank you for that. When we're dealing with not only uh, full-time residents, but thousands, tens of thousands of visitors or people traveling through our county. We just talked about this a minute ago with Caltrans. Um, we have lots of people we're responsible for that go above and beyond our 400,000 that are full-time residents in our county, uh, and we need to be prepared. So I'm, I'm so supportive of this, and I thank you for your efforts, all of you, to put this together and um, move us forward. I, I'm excited. Um, some of you may have heard that uh, there was a survey done in our community on the East Slope recently by the North Tahoe Community Alliance where the number one issue that was raised by everybody was fire evacuation and capacity of roads and how it would work. And so we've committed to getting out in front of that community again. As long as I've been in office, I've known that to be the case, but to see it in the, the raw data, to see the numbers of people that are just not sure who you all are and what you would do and how would they get out of their home. And so uh, the, many of those are second homeowners as well. And so they don't have faces of what Placer County is. They sometimes don't know which county they're in, <laughs> which city they're in, which state they're in. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in the, because we have a lot in the Tahoe Basin and the valleys around it. So I, um, I know we have a lot of work to do um, to educate our public on this great model. And I, I know that you'll be working on that. So thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Landon. I just have one question that kind of came to mind when you guys were talking. Well, first of all, thank you to each of you and your teams as well for bringing this forward. Um, and then I have a couple comments. So one question that came to my mind is, obviously, you both are great. Sheriff Wu and Chief Estes, you are amazing. And I've been so pleased and happy with the relationship that you have. Do you have any concerns, you know, let's just look 10 years down the road and we have a I mean, maybe you'll still be here, Wayne, but um, let's say 20 years down the road and <laughs> Sheriff Wu is no longer here and we have a new sheriff, new sheriff in town and a new chief and they don't have a great working relationship. Is there, do you have any concerns around that? Are there any kind of things that could be put into place to kind of help hedge some of those future relationship issues? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up and actually we've had that discussion. So, um, you know, I touched on it a little bit in my presentation when I talked about culture. And honestly, it, it, it all comes down to organizational culture, whether it's the Sheriff's Office organizational culture, CAL FIRES, and Placer County as a, a, an organization, our culture. Um, we have that here. And um, I think when we had the discussion as a potential concern, exactly what you're talking about, because it could come up, is why we really thought right now was the most important time to set that tone and set that organizational culture. While Chief Estes and I were here working so collaboratively together, um, now's the time to put this model in place, build that culture to hopefully um, negate that from happening further on down the road that you know we, we, we build the building blocks in now while we have it and uh, hopefully it remains in place. But it, it could be a concern, and we did discuss it. Okay, and then just a, a couple comments. So I, I think this is great. Um, it's, to me, just another opportunity for Placer County to be innovative and a leader for other areas of the state. It is pretty shocking that it doesn't exist anywhere else, and so that makes me even more excited because I think you guys can really kind of shape the narrative on what this looks like, and that is exciting to me. Um, and then I think another thing that kind of came to mind is that I really believe that relationships are, in order to have a good relationship, you need to be communicating and working together outside of just crisis mode. And I think this is a really great opportunity for you all to build your team and to communicate with each other and to work with each other outside of a crisis so that when the crisis mode comes, you all can just jump right in and already have that basis. 
Um, and so um, that was one thing that came to mind. And then one other thing was, uh, I just wondered if maybe in a year or so, or um, if we could maybe have just a check-in and just see how things are going. And I'm sure you probably already planned that, but just wanted to note that I would love to have an update in a year. And that's it. Thank you. Supervisor Jones. Good, good morning. I'd um, like to thank you both, all three of you, actually four of you, for, for a great presentation. And I know, as I'd mentioned before, you know, having been a, a young military spouse with a young child, first time in Europe, 12,000 miles away from home, you know, they had, uh, we had to prepare for evacuation over there and to be ready for evacuation at a moment's notice. And so I understand the operational preparedness um, and how much actually goes into doing all of that. And because in our case, our evacuation preparedness included training and exercises where we all had to come to the gym at five o'clock in the morning with our children, with our passports, with our ID cards, with a plan for our children if we get separated, with a go bag and a few of our belongings and all of those personal things that we needed to have. And believe me, I know how much goes into all that and I think this is a great addition to what you all do because you're very good at what you do already. And I've told you before how I feel about the coordination that all of the reports that you put out are amazing at what you all do and how well you all do it together. And then never forget, as my mom always told me, two heads are better than one and so three heads are even greater than one. <laughs> and not only that, but many hands make your work light. So. Congratulations on all of this. I really support every bit of it and support all of you. Thank you so much. Supervisor Gustafson, did you have another comment? I did. I did have a question. And I just, um, Chief, I wanted to um, ask you specifically, because our rural communities often have smaller independent fire districts um, that are that are well-trained and well-equipped to deal with their local residents, but maybe not some of the bigger incidents we have and taking charge. Um, you mentioned that you'll be coordinating with all of them and leading on behalf of them, but um, do, do you have any more specifics on that? Yeah, um, thank you, Supervisor. And, and you know, I, I really, when I said earlier, that we, we have such a diverse um, fire service model in Placer County across both the east side and west side, and, and all of them bring such a great uh, system to the table. And we, I, I think we have a really respectful model of fire services in Placer County. Um, but it's probably a little bit more bifurcated than on the law enforcement side. So I think even more so. I would say a lot more bifurcated. Yeah. <laughs> the supervisor can say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I've lost track of how many fire <laughs> departments there are in, in Placer County. But, but everyone brings something really good to the table, but we're only as good as a coordinated approach. Mm -hmm. And that's that coordinated information in, validating it, information out, and resource allocation. And I've made it a point to be very upfront with all of my partners in the local government capacities about this model. We've actually exercised it really ever since the COVID model. Um, and, and I think it's, as, as Supervisor Jones said, you know, just putting three, four, ten heads together is proven to be better than one. Um, and uh, reducing that redundancy um, of effort and ultimately keeping things from slipping through the cracks and um, and I and I think just to echo what uh, Supervisor Landon said um, you, you know you'd never want to build those relationships on the hood of the pickup when things are rapidly um, falling apart around you so I, I think to your to your point having the buy-in from our local fire districts and having that allied approach to it just makes it in incredibly important Thank you. And then to Sheriff Wu, I won't let you off without a question. Is that new Burton Creek facility going to have an EOC, or does the county have other plans for an EOC location on the East Slope? Well, if this is my opportunity for a wish list on what we want in the facility, then yes. <laughs> I've just given you the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, when you look at the Sheriff's Office model, and uh, you already spoke to it, um, 
we do have to have certain redundancy in services for the east slope and i think this winter is a perfect example of how often that part of our county gets cut off from resources and our staff up there have to be able to manage any emergency that comes up in the basin when i-80 is closed or impassable and be able to manage that incident until the cavalry can arrive so yes i would 100 percent advocate for um, a facility like that to be stood up on the east slope in times of crisis when people are cut off. Thank you. I'll go to work on that one too. <laughs> Our county executive officer has a comment. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Just briefly, I want to thank everyone for bringing this concept forward. I know when both Sheriff Wu and Chief Estes came to talk to me about this last fall, I couldn't help but think you more than demonstrated proof of concept in the Mosquito Fire, where I think the collaboration, the multidisciplinary approach frankly saved Forest Hill and, and many of the communities in the wildland urban interface. And I always think back, if we're thinking of phrases, you practice like you, like you play. And so having the opportunity to co-locate, to embed law and fire resources in OES really makes us that much better for when the emergency does happen because we're drilling, we're practicing, and that the proof is in the pudding certainly with our mosquito fire experience. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I now open it up to the public. Is there anyone in the public that would like to address the board on this item? Please step forward. Good morning. Good yes. morning, Chair. Paula Selig, a formerly a Forest Hill resident for 40 years. I can't tell you how proud I am of these men and women who put their lives out there to stop that wicked fire from taking over the town. Um, that's my heartfelt thanks to you. And if this board doesn't approve your plan, talk to me. I'll see what I can do for you. you got it. Anyway, thank you so much. I do appreciate you, and I know everyone in Forest Hill certainly does. Uh, so thank you. Did we, I know you said your name, but I don't know if we picked it up. Paula Selix, was spelled with a C. Yeah. C-E-L-I-T-K. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Paula. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else uh, wish to address the board? Please come forward. One on Zoom is on. Oh, hello. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Karen Green. I've lived in Penryn since 1977 also lived at Homewood at Tahoe, so I so appreciate all the services and over the years have been delighted to support the fires and the chiefs and, and uh, all the wonderful services that we get. My concern today, though, it involves what I see as a missing piece, and that is the schools. I've been an educator for over 55 years, and you, I, I really took to the statement that you made about that the goal here is to foster and be ready and resilient in Placer County and have a county that's such. I think that our schools are at risk, a tremendous risk that really we can no longer just expect that the, the schools are gonna call 916 or 988 and one of you is gonna to respond to whatever that emergency is on campus. And I've been under the desks where there've been um, in, in student classrooms where there's been a threat at the schools, and it's frightening. It's frightening as an adult, and it's very frightening for the students. I would just encourage you to m really look at including the schools as a full-time partner. They need, it's not enough to just have a resource officer on campus. We've got to have protection for our kids on these campuses, and despite the fact that We've trained the school personnel to lock their doors and lock their classrooms and get under the desks or whatever is needed, pull down the shades. Um, we need protection on the campuses, not waiting for protection to arrive for whatever the crisis is on that campus. So I, I really want to encourage you to reach out to the school districts, make them a full partner in this. This is, a, this is a great partnership that you've got going, but it's not enough if we're honestly looking at the risks that, that is so vulnerable out there. And this latest incident was just a, another example that locking the doors isn't enough. 
a shooter who was determined is going to shoot through the door and enter. And in this tra latest tragic case, um, we've got three young dead children and three adults. So I don't want to see that crisis occur here in Placer County. I don't want to be a person who, as a counselor, has to respond to these tragedies to help kids get through these terrible experiences. So I really, really want to ask you to please, please include the schools in your partnership here so that we can, in fact, address the risks that our school districts are facing these days, sad as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Well, well said. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online? There is, Chairman. Michael, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors and people in the chamber. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Um, I am with Placer County tomorrow. Uh, I want to point out the obvious that doesn't really need to be said, and that is that planning is, in effect, making major decisions about public safety, safety every single day. Uh, and I don't want to talk about the current situation. You've heard from me about that any number of times. But I want to look back for a moment. And there was a period when I regularly attended the County Fire Safe Alliance. This was four or five or so more years ago. And also uh, sometimes one or two of the, the local uh, uh, fire groups that meet like that. And I only remember one time when there was somebody from planning in one of those meetings. And it happened to be when that planning a body was meeting next door, et cetera and uh, uh, came in uh, towards the end of the meeting. And uh, I think uh, enough is said, uh, enough is said. The issues are there, the, the wooey situation is well described, and um, how do we get planning on board and their decisions is a major problem. Good luck with it, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Is there anyone else? No, Chairman. One last time, anybody in the audience? Chair, if I might. Oh, oh, I did. Supervisor Jones, did you have a comment? Go ahead. Please. Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with regard to the schools, I just wanted to mention that um, having served on the Placer County Board of Education for 10 years, uh, the county superintendent of schools, Gail Garbalina Mojica, had established a relationship with the sheriff's office to do extensive training with their teachers and their students on this type of um, random school shootings and so she's very aware and she's been on top of the situation and training and making sure all the schools within the county so I'm sure but you know whatever you want to do to reach out to her again and make sure that she's all updated on any of the latest and the greatest kind of information you have yeah we have a very close working relationship um, we're always working on plans in fact I think in the next week or two our staff and her staff have been working together on a new reunification video uh, for parents and students that I'll be filming with Gail um, as a continuing part of that education and communication phase and I think this team will only be able to expand on that planning process and run drills and exercises during the summertime and and continue to get everybody trained up and ready to go not just first responders fire service but also staff and teachers at the school great thank you so much thank you supervisor Gustin. I was just looking whether you wanted a motion to provide this direction or if our direction has been clear we don't need a motion today okay I was willing to jump in there but we'll look forward to seeing it in our budget presentations so you wanted yeah. to bring this to closure is that what you're trying to say <laughs> well no I was I, but I know Dave wanted to say something but oh, I was just okay. Uh, just a quick comment about uh, bringing planning uh, Cedar Group into uh, things. Uh, we've had uh, good success, as your board knows. We had a California Fire Safe Council grant uh, approved uh, not quite a year and a half ago. Uh, as part of that, we've really strengthened our ties with planning. For example, we're working with uh, the Cedar Group. They're getting ready to, to start some uh, analysis work that's required by the state, actually, on the safety element, going to be a direct uh, uh, tie to the ingress egress and the evacuation planning that we've been talking about so uh, they're definitely getting more involved and uh, we are looking for all of those opportunities across the county 
to, to bring in folks uh, with their expertise to strengthen the team. Alrighty, thank you everyone. This is a uh, long overdue, a great, great uh, pr presentation and a great plan moving forward. So go out and keep us safe. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we will now move to our 11.10 a.m. timed item. This is Public Works and Annexation, the Brady Estates Subdivision. Hello, Sarah. Good morning, Chair Holmes and other board members. Thank you for having me here today. Again, uh, Sarah Gilmore. I'm here on behalf of the Environmental Engineering Division to present the Brady Estates Annexation. As stated in the board memo, we're requesting the board open a public hearing to adopt the resolution included in the staff report to annex the Brady Estates property into the boundary of County Services Area 28, Zone of Benefit 173 Dry Creek. Brady Estates is located in the southwest corner of Baseline Road and Brady Lane in West Placer. And I need to read into the record that there was an error in the description of the location in the staff report and resolution. It said northeast, but it should have said southwest of this intersection. Um, we also want to note that an amended attachment A uh, resolution has been provided to the board that corrects that um, error. The development here is consistent with the Dry Creek West Placer Community Plan land use zoning. The proposed subdivision is for nine lots on 5.18 acres and is outside the CFD1 reimbursement agreement area and therefore no reimbursement fee is due. Staff supports this request and in order to move forward, we request that your board open the public hearing and adopt the resolution in the staff report to annex the property into the boundaries of County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 173, Dry Creek. And please let me know if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Alrighty, thank you. Uh, any comments, questions from the board members? The three that are here. No, I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wishes to, oh, well, this is a public hearing, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'll open the public hearing. Uh, is there anyone in the audience wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? No, Chairman. No. Alrighty. So we'll bring it back uh, to our action. Mr. Chair, I move approval of the item. It's been moved by uh, Supervisor Gore and seconded by Supervisor Jones. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? The item is moved. Thank you, Ms. Gilmar. Thank Appreciate you. It. Wow, we're almost on time. Say that. So I now we're uh, going to move to item 1120 AM, Community Development Resource Agency. Uh, we're going to conduct a public hearing, uh, establishment of new agricultural uh, preserve and Williams of that contract. Okay. Yes. Good. Good morning, Chair Holmes, Supervisors, Chris Bahuli, Planning Director. The item before you this morning is a uh, request to uh, split from an existing agricultural preserve and Williamson Act contract and for a property owner to uh, enter into a uh, agricultural preserve and Williamson Act uh, contract specific to their property. Uh, the lead planner uh, for this item, Chris Graham, has a brief presentation for you, and we are also joined by uh, the Agricultural Commissioner, uh, Josh Hunziker. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Chris Graham. Good morning, Chairman Holmes and Supervisors. My name is Chris Graham, Senior Planner with the Placer County Planning Services Division. As Chris Pahuli said, the item before you this morning is the Barbier Agricultural Preserve and Williamson Act contract. Act contract uh, where the applicant is requesting to remove their parcel from the existing Agricultural Preserve 204 and enroll their property into a separate Williamson Act contract and establish a new separate Agricultural Preserve. The subject property is located at 2215 Buttes Lane uh, in the Auburn area. Existing Agricultural Preserve shown here in the yellow is approximately 115 acres in size, was enrolled in the Placer County Williamson Act program in 1972, and it's important to note that uh, it consisted of three parcels that were under one uh, ownership. Today, the parcels are under separate ownerships, and the red, uh, the red object up there, or the red uh, 
outline up there shows APN 31, uh, 30, 370, 26. The blue outline shows APN 31, 370, uh, 7. And the subject parcel is shown in yellow, and that's APN 31, 30, uh, 370, 27. The subject parcel shown here is approximately 23 acres in size. To meet the requirements of the Williamson Act contract, improvements have been made, including planting of 168 mandarin trees on a 1.3 acre plot, as shown here in the yellow, and installation of an agricultural building, as shown here uh, with the red square. Uh, the applicant has also installed an irrigation system, irrigation filtration, and fencing. Future row crops or vineyards will be planted on six acres of the, of the parcel, which is shown here in the dark green. Um, a three-acre portion will be used for or grazing, and that's shown in uh, light green. And then there will be two ponds that will be established. And then uh, in the spring of 2023, so pretty soon here, there will be another 200, uh, 200 uh, mandarins that will be planted uh, on the site. This slide shows the 1.3 acres of mandarins that have mandarin trees that have been planted and the agricultural building that has been developed on site. Though the property is not yet in active production, the Williamson Act contains a provision allowing contracts to be considered if the property owner can demonstrate that the site has installed irrigation, has been planted with trees for orchard production, and that the site could eventually produce a minimum gross annual income of at least $4,500. Based on the 2021 Placer County crop report, the average mandarin yield was 5.365 tons per acre at $2,800 per ton. Based on this information, the 1.3 acres of existing mandarins on the subject parcel could produce a gross annual income of $19,565. The board may determine the proposed preserve of less than 100 acres qualifies for approval because it is located in an area with unique agri agricultural enterprises. The establishment of the preserve is in the public interest and the contract qualifies because it is adjacent to 92 acres of enrolled lands to the east and west, which will be remnant uh, agricultural preserve 204. The Agricultural Commission on December 12, 2022 determined that the applicants have demonstrated a long-term commitment to agriculture as evidenced by their investment in Mandarin orchards agricultural irrigation, construction of an on-site agricultural building, and plans for additional agricultural improvements. With that, staff recommends the board take the following actions. Conduct a public hearing to consider division of Agricultural Preserve 204 to allow the 23.3 acre Agricultural Preserve and Williamson Act contract. Adopt a resolution approving land conservation P agreement PLN 22-00414 and determine the establishment of Agricultural Preserve and Williamson Act contract PLN 22-414 categorically exempt from the environmental review pursuant to section 15137 of CEQA. This concludes my presentation. The property owner is here and I am also available to answer any questions. All righty, any questions from board members? I see none. Is there anyone online? We need to open up a public hearing. Oh. Sorry, this is a public hearing. Let me open it, please. Thank you. Uh, is there any member of the public wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? Not online. Not online. Already. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, what is the will of the board? I'll move approval. I'll second. Uh, it's a motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you. Now we'll move to our 11.40 timed item. Ah. What? Oh, it's not 11.40? Come on. Oh, good. Wow. <laughs> we caught up. Yeah. Uh, too much credit. Uh, <laughs> not Okay, we've got item number 10 then under our department items. Amend Chapter 2, Article 2, Related Health and Human Service Fees. Good morning. 
Great. So, good morning, Chair Holmes, member of the board, and Jane Karen, Rob Oldham with Healthy Human Services. Uh, here this morning uh, asking that your board uh, uh, introduce an ordinance amending Chapter 2, Article 2. <laughs> Dot 116.110 of the Placer County Code regarding health and human services fees and waive uh, oral reading of that ordinance. Um, just as, as background, uh, many of you may recall every year uh, we, uh, we have a, uh, an ordinance that comes, comes before your board updating our uh, fees um, in Placer County Code, um, including our health and human services fees, updating them uh, for inflation. And so what this, uh, you know, the amendments here in this ordinance propose is really to clean up uh, that language so that um, there are certain fees within HHS that really uh, don't necessarily require um, being updated every year uh, for inflation, some because the state sets the fees, others like our animal services fees. Uh, we find it's, it's helpful right now, by the way, uh, we, our uh, animal services center is still full, so it's a great uh, <laughs> time to adopt a pet, but you know, trying to you know, sometimes lower those uh, fees so that they're not uh, keeping up with inflation so that we can uh, have other benefits to the county, like um, getting our, our animals adopted. So um, that's generally what the, the uh, uh, amendments to the ordinance uh, uh, are, are proposing. Um, And, and just a couple of other uh, changes so uh, that's uh, included, I'll uh, highlight, I won't go through the whole ordinance, but it's removing languages, uh, language uh, regarding our public health laboratory and medical clinics, you'll recall, uh, those were clo closed a few years ago. So when our fees go uh, update, uh, there's language in there that, pro that needs to also be updated that's removing uh, some of the, the services that are uh, no longer um, uh, administered, including the public health lab, uh, medical clinics, uh, and uh, removing language uh, targeting our tar uh, concerning our targeted case management services as those are also set by um, state law and not subject to um, separate and inflationary uh, increases. And then um, finally, uh, removing references uh, to rates uh, charged by the Placer County Public Guardian as rates uh, are not charged to the general public but are instead uh, sought via court order in the administration of conservatorships. So I'm uh, just, again, um, a asking for an amendment and a uh, Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from board members? <clears throat> uh, oh, Susan, Supervisor Jones. <laughs> just, just a comment. Based on the fact that the um, um, SPCA is kind of bursting at the seams, are they having a special adoption day on, I think, this Friday on the 30th? Uh, I wish I know. In fact, you, I happen to have, Jason, I believe uh, that Jason Philippe is here who might have that more information. I don't okay, know uh, just, exactly, uh, Supervisor Jones. It would be a good time to announce it to the public or anybody who's here or anybody that's listening on Zoom. Yeah, not. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. A great question. Uh, Jason Philippe, um, Environmental Health and Animal Services. Um, our shelter actually is very full right now, um, a combination of a lot of factors. Uh, but we're actually, uh, um, there's an event this Friday at the shelter and we um, are adopting uh, on the animals at the shelter from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, adoption fees um, are being reduced. Um, that's including a rabies vaccine, uh, spaying and neutering. Um, so everyone should come on down and see if they can find a new family member. Great, good time to put in a plug. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great, thanks Jason. I appreciate the plug. I actually went online yesterday to look at all the animals, and my husband would kill me if I went and adopted a dog right now. But there are some adorable dogs out there. So to your point, if you're looking for a forever panion, there are some really adorable dogs. For sure. Already. <laughs> Is there anyone in the public wish to address the board on this item? I see none. Is there anyone online? There's no one online. All right, I'll bring back to the board for action. I move approval. Okay. I'll second. It's been moved up by Supervisor Jones and second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 11, human resources, bereavement leave. I can probably use a little right now. Good morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board, uh, Jane and Karen. My name is Jennifer Duvall. I'm an HR manager with the Human Resources Department, and I'm here today with four requests related to bereavement leave. Specifically, it's requested that your board approve a side letter agreement between the Placer County, I'm sorry, between Placer County and the Placer County 
sorry, Placer Public Employees Organization to update bereavement leave provisions, approve a side letter agreement between the county and the Placer County Law Enforcement Management Association to approve uh, update bereavement leave provisions, approve a side letter agreement between the Placer County Deputy Sheriff's Association and the county to again update bereavement leave provisions and introduce an ordinance, waive oral reading, to amend various sections of chapter three of the Placer County Code related to bereavement leave for all eligible employees. As background information, the governor signed into law AB 1949, which entitles eligible employees up to five days of bereavement leave upon the death of a qualified family member. And it makes it, um, the regulations make it unlawful for an employer to refuse to grant eligible employee time off for bereavement purposes. The, plus, the county's existing benefits actually were very similar and aligned with the provisions of 1949, but slight modifications are needed to ensure regulatory compliance for all of the employee groups. PPEO, PC Lima, and DSA have all agreed to updated provisions, which are documented in the proposed side letters. Additionally, the county met and conferred with the Placer County District Attorneys Association, and um, similar language was agreed to there as well, and that'll be recommended for approval in the unit's inaugural memorandum of understanding. There is no significant fiscal impact since the um, bereavement leave provisions already were very similar to the county's um, provisions. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions you may have. All right, Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Jennifer, appreciate that. And I just have one point of clarification sure. as I was reading the language. So it struck out um, stepchild, stepparent. I am assuming that then those categories are included in parent Absolutely. and child. And yes. so that would not negate those relationships. Definitely, yes. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other comments from board members? Seeing none, anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Do we have anyone online? Oh, yes. Okay, now I need a motion. Oh, we, do we have a motion? I don't know, I was just- I'll move approval. Okay. Um, second. It's been moved by Supervisor Landon, seconded by Supervisor Gore. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank, oh, you. thank you. The motion has been passed. So what were you saying? Oh, we're gonna take part time. You're gonna need a lot of public comment here. We've got a break at noon. If you want to maybe take 15, I'll order. It's a little shorter. I want to take this one. Okay, that's great. I know you got this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Finally, we will move to item 12, parks and open space uh, funding agreement for Newcastle Elementary School field improvements. Uh, Mr. Andy Fisher. Good morning, Chair Holmes and members of the board. This uh, item before you today is to approve a funding agreement with the Newcastle Elementary School District for development of a sports field at their facility off of Kentucky Greens Road, uh, just off of Taylor Road in Newcastle, to make the necessary financial transactions and authorize the Director of Parks and Open Space to sign said agreement. Before I describe the project, I do want to introduce some of the folks that are here with us who have worked hard on this project. Denny Rush, the superintendent of the Newcastle elementary school district who's been wonderful. Sue Wasselius, the project manager on behalf of the school district and a familiar face from earlier this morning, Sarah Gilmore, who is also a board member of the Newcastle elementary school district and is here for this project as well. The popularity of sports all throughout the foothills uh, region has continued to grow as the number of sports has increased, as the season length has increased and kids have stayed vigorously involved in sports. The primary fields that we operate, Placer County, that serve the Newcastle through the Loomis Basin area are the um, Loomis Community Park and Franklin School Park. In 2022, the combined reserved hours uh, in those two parks for youth sports activities was just under 8,000 hours 
They are fully saturated. We rent them as, as much space as we have available and turn away others. Some of our core participants in that part of the county, Five Cities Girls Softball, Loomis Youth Soccer, Golden Eagles Baseball, Sierra Foothills, and Granite Bay Lacrosse play on those fields. Placer United Soccer, a higher level competitive field, and even Del Oro, which is another one of the sports field providers, the high school, uh, some of their sports require time on our field. So there's a clear need that showed up in our Park and Trail Master Plan surveys for additional sports fields within the, the entire foothill area from Newcastle down through Loomis and Granite Bay. And uh, given that, a couple of years ago, the Loomis Youth Soccer uh, group approached Placer County and the Newcastle School and said, you know, they're at the district office off of Kentucky Greens Drive. There is a flat two-acre area. It was graded at one time. It was not turned into a field. We think that would be a perfect area to, uh, to bring a field forward and, uh, and develop that. Is there anything that you could partner and, and do for us? And so we, we approached the school. We talked with the school. They have been zealous about the idea. They got right to work in coming up with a design. They have completed the design. They have actually even gotten some durable bids uh, for the project. Their design was influenced by some of the success that the counties had in converting our fields from high water use fescue rye to the new hybrid Bermudas that work really well and that band of the county that doesn't freeze so much. Uh, so they're looking at using that hybrid Bermuda for water savings and durability. Uh, gives you a lot of hours of use and it heals itself very well. Uh, so the funding plan before you today, the total cost of that project, the construction cost, uh, will be $525,000. That includes some allotment for contingency. Um, and what we're requesting before the board today is that we use $375,000 from our Area 15 park dedication fees. That is the area in which the school resides, the Newcastle Ofer area. There are about $385,000 in that account today, so it would take that account down. Uh, there are some projects out further on the horizon, but I think we will be able to recover and find funding for those projects as they come along and, and, and uh, partners for those projects and the, the, this much smaller projects. Uh, we're also asking for an augmentation of $150,000 in general funds. If all of that is approved, uh, we would enter into an agreement with the school district, and that agreement would specify that the district takes on and maintains the field uh, for 20 years and that they open that up for the public use outside of school hours. Uh, and to give you an idea of the benefit of, of that kind of partnership to the county, if we were to go buy property and develop it as a park ourselves, it costs us about 12000 a year uh, per acre to maintain a park. So this would be about $25,000 per year, almost a half a million dollar savings to the county providing that you know, service to the public. And that is borne by the school district, and because I think that field is ancillary to the rest of their district uh, offices would cost them less to do so. But that is the benefit of the partnership uh, to the county is that the school does the operation and maintenance over time, and those partnerships have worked out well. We have contracted similarly with the school district uh, for playground replacements and things like that in the past. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back to the board for any questions, and the folks I've introduced are also here to answering. Okay, questions. thank you, Andy. I'm really pleased to see this move forward. I want to thank you and uh, the school staff for uh, uh, moving it forward as well. Uh, Supervisor Gustafson. Thanks. I uh, strongly support this project and the staff's recommendation. Uh, but when I was talking to Andy, the but is, um, on the uh, 16 areas uh, where we collect park dedication fees, we often have this crossover where people from adjoining communities and fee areas participate on the fields. And I'd really encourage, I know staff is talking about, we're very outdated in looking at those park dedication fees um, and the nexus and really doing some survey work so that we can use uh, our general fund as, as less as possible and park dedication fees as much as possible. But that's going to require a nexus of some sort, I assume, uh, to look at who's using the fields and can we draw from their other park surrounding park dedication districts. And this just comes from my background uh, where we have that crossover all the time. You know, we barely understand our own county boundaries, let alone when you get within that to who's playing it from which school and which area. And I think we need to look at that holistically where we can. So just an opportunity for us to, to refine that 
um, but strongly support this project and the use of uh, general fund to augment it for this time. So. Thank you, and we'll strongly agree. We do believe it is high time to revisit our park fee program, especially with the completion of our park and trail master plan. So you will be hearing from us at the budget workshop to get a consultant and get that off the ground. All right. Great, thank you. Any other comments from board members? Seeing none, uh, is there anyone from the public who wishes to address the board on this item? Um, thank you so much. This isn't my normal voice, but you're getting what I've got. So um, it is just heartwarming to know that we'll have another place for kids to come after school into a positive activity where they gain relationships with adults and other students. Those things we know create the balance that we need in our kids that we, they don't get from reading and writing and math and science. We need them to have those healthy relationships. So thank you so much. We are very excited to share this opportunity with our neighboring districts and their students. And I'm not crying, I'm just running out of voice. <laughs> Although I might. Thank uh, you. Thank Denny, you, we need your name for the record. Oh, Denny Rush from uh, Newcastle Elementary School District. Uh, do you need the address? No, no. Okay. We know thank where you're at. <laughs> no, <laughs> find me. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online? No, sir. Already. You might like to make one comment. Any pardon? Can I make a comment? Oh. You're making a motion? She has a comment. No, no, no. Oh, a comment. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I was trying to do this one. Thanks, Andy, for doing this. Um, I do fully support it as well. In Granite Bay, we're a little bit different than everybody else because we have a parks assessment um, that, that we all pay into. And so our folks, we have a lot of uh, teams and stuff in Granite Bay who play soccer. So I'm sure they would be looking forward to this addition to the, to the uh, fields for them to play soccer. So I, I do support it very, very firmly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, was that a motion or is there? I'll make a motion. <laughs> okay. A motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor? Oh, we need a roll call. This is a roll call vote. Will the clerk please call the roll? Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Thank you, the item is moved. Yay. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna move to. Uh, oh, we're gonna do 13 now. Okay. Oh, it's. Okay. Now we're gonna move to our 1140 item. Uh, this is a community development resource agency. Housing element. 2022 annual progress report. Good right? morning, supervisors. I'm Anne Marie Novotny oh, with uh, Placer County Community Development Resource Agency. And um, on this item, I just want to start off by saying that planning and zoning law requires that each county planning agency prepare an annual report on the status of the housing element of its general plan and progress in its implementation. Housing element law requires the county to hold a public meeting before the legislative body and receive public comment prior to submitting its housing element annual progress report to the state. The annual progress report or APR is required to be presented to the Board of Supervisors to receive the report and take public comment prior to submittal to the California Department of Housing and Community Development or HCD and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research OPR. The APR is required to be submitted to HCD and OPR by April 1st of each year. The county's current housing element adopted by the board in May 2021 is for the eight year planning period from May 15th, 2021 to May 15th, 2029. The housing element includes Placer County's share of the regional housing needs allocation, otherwise known as RENA, R-H-N-A, within the Sacramento Area Council of Governments Metropolitan Region, which is a total of 7,854 units. This total is divided into four income categories and is shown on the table on page two of the staff report. In 2022, 807 total units 
were issued building permits compared to 468 in 2021. For 2021 and 2022, 1,275 total cumulative units were issued building permits. Of that number, about 87% or 1,115 are in the above moderate income category. 83 are in the moderate and 77 in the low income category. No building permits were issued in 2021 or 2022 in the very low income category. Um, in this past year, 1,132 housing applications were submitted for 1,138 total proposed units. Um, of that mentioned earlier, 807 building permits were issued, 663 residential units completed, of which 80% or 530 were single family dwellings. Uh, what's interesting to note out of the total building permits that came in last year, about 12.5% or 101 are, uh, are worth, worth for accessory dwelling units or ADUs and 43 were completed. Um, compared to 2021, we received 50 ADU permits uh, that were issued and 34 completed. Uh, new for 2022, the state is asking for additional data on applications submitted and units constructed pursuant to SB 35 streamlining provisions and lot splits pursuant to SB9. The county did not have any applications submitted or units constructed under SB35. The county did receive four applications for lot splits under SB9. Two parcels are in Auburn and two are in Granite Bay. The 2021-2029 housing element identified that Placer County has enough sites zoned to meet its need for moderate and above moderate income housing but it has a shortfall in capacity for lower income households of 1,107 units. To address this shortfall, the county is obligated to rezone at least 55.3 acres to allow for a high density multifamily development at a density of at least 30 units per acre by May, 2024. In 2022, the second year of the 2021-2029 planning period, the county initiated housing element implementation program HE1, which is called Rezone to Meet the Reno. Planning staff are currently assessing a list of candidate sites that are included in Appendix A, Table A.3 in the housing element that have potential for being rezoned to accommodate the shortfall housing need. This process will involve notification of property owners who will be affected by a future rezoning effort and this effort is anticipated for completion by May of 2024. The 2021-2029 housing element that the board adopted in May 2021 includes 49 implementation programs, of which 28 were new programs for the sixth cycle of the housing element. The programs are being implemented by eight county departments with support from other departments. 22 of these programs are ongoing and 12 of the programs have been completed, six of which were part of the housing related zoning text amendments approved by the board in July, 2022. The 12 completed programs are summarized on pages four to six in the staff report. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, any questions from board members before I open up at the um, public hearing? Supervisor Gustafson. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, Anna Maria, can you uh, explain how property owners that are potentially being rezoned are being notified? We've heard some co very strong concerns from some of those that may be rezoned, and I just wanted to check on our process uh, on that and make sure the public's aware of how that'll work. Um, yes, it's my understanding that um, planning uh, will be sending out uh, a letter directly to those property owners when we narrow down that um, that site, the project manager is Jen Bayus. So she's the one that's um, overseeing that and um, under Chris uh, Pahuli's uh, direction. And then if the county uh, is unable, if the, the property owners object, what is the process? I mean, I'll just get right to the yeah. tough question. I'll jump in here, Anne-Marie. This is Michelle Kingsbury from the Community Development Resource Agency. Um, we're hopeful we don't get there. Um, certainly through Gen Bios's, um efforts, we are, as Anne-Marie mentioned, going through our candidate rezone sites. 
um, to determine um, uh, the, the viability of those sites and we'll be back with the board later. Certainly we don't want to get into a position I think where you're alluding to is forced rezone programs and things of that nature um, but there's certainly more to come on that work program effort. Our planning staff is working diligently kind of going through the rezone um, candidate sites um, and hopeful that we won't get to that point but there is more to come in that conversation. And the state requires uh, the identification of 55 acres is that correct? Uh, that's what's noted in our housing element, correct? Right, but if we are able to satisfy that in less acreage, then we may not need that, and can we offer incentives to those? So currently right now, um, that's Owners. kind of what staff is going through, is going through that candidate okay. rezone site to determine the capacity and kind of narrowing down that list um, to exactly what are we dealing with okay. um, to meet that. But there's certainly, it's, it's imperative that we're moving that work program forward and more to come on that one. And the county can provide incentives to those property owners if, if that's the path, if we absolutely need it, how can we incentivize them to see a benefit? To so one of the tasks staff is reviewing is uh, the overlay, um, looking at an overlay and those types of incentives that could encourage that type of development. Um, but I, ha I hate to uh, project what that will look like and okay. certainly more to come Great. on the planning side. Great, thank you. All right. <clears throat> Any other comments from board members before I open up the public hearing? Seeing none, this is public hearing. I'll open the public hearing for any comments from members of the public. This is a public, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're being summoned. <laughs> Hello, Mike. <clears throat> I've got voice problem too, also. Um, good morning, supervisors, staff, and guests. My name is Mike Letzger. I'm president of Newcastle Area Business Association, and I also sit on the North Auburn MAC. I am a real estate agent, and I'm here today because I have two clients that have been rezoned, and they were not notified. Um, they wanted, these are vacant lands, and my understanding of the bill, SB 6 and, and 2011, was to revitalize existing uh, unused uh, office buildings, warehouses, and so forth to convert to um, low-cost housing. Placer has rezoned two of my clients' vacant lands in Newcastle to residential without checking with them first. One client has been working with the county planning for over a year and has invested over $100,000 with engineers in the county for permits. The left hand and the right hand of the county are not talking to each other. The other client had a 40-year commercial lease in place, which is now lost. These are both projects that would bring hundreds of thousands of tax revenue into the county. Neither person will build affordable housing on these sites as it will not pencil out. One reason is in the bill that passed by uh, Sacramento, you must use prevailing wage to build the low cost housing. There is no such thing as affordable housing. It is subsidized housing. The inflation rate is not 7% for building the industry right now. It's more around 20%. The county has now made these properties worthless. The county needs to change the zoning back to commercial immediately or the county needs to buy the properties and build the housing themselves or do like we did with Mercy Sisters up here and have somebody else build them. The bills are not meant to take vacant land. My client with a property on Taylor Road has a loan coming due. He will not be able to refinance this property because the property will be worthless. He can face bankruptcy because of this rezoning on this property. So we need to look at each of these properties individually and be more forthright with the owners of the property and sit down and talk with them and change these out. Both of these um, clients of mine have been in Placer County for 60 to 70 years. They're not outside developers. They own businesses in the county and these were additional businesses that they wanted to um, provide for family and for future. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Is there anyone else wishes to address the board on this item? Good 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Elliot Rose. I own the property on Indian Hill Road and I-80 that's scheduled to be rezoned. Uh, currently, the uh, zoning is commercial, and the current evaluation by the county is $55,400. We have a service station developer who is presently in the permit process to build a service station, convenience store, uh, car wash, and about 12 charging stations. The cost of this development will be between five and seven million dollars. If the property is rezoned to residential, the county stands to lose significant property tax revenue. There is less than an acre of usable land in this piece of property, and um, to put affordable housing on it is not uh, viable at all. Uh, because if the county only needs 55 acres, this is a one acre parcel. Right across the street, there's a 40 acre parcel on Taylor Road. Uh, next to Portuguese Hall, there's another 30 or 40 acres that could be rezoned. So why is the county rezoning commercial property? Think of the tax revenue you're gonna lose on this particular item when you're talking about a five to $7 million development as opposed to a piece of property that's now worth $55,400 according to the county and that's your tax assessment and uh, <clears throat> we will never ever build affordable housing on it and as mike has said there is no such thing as affordable housing unless you allow me to build a six-story uh, apartment house with 100 units and 30 of them will be affordable the rest of them will be above market cost if you have any questions i'd be more than happy to answer them I see none. Thank you, Elliot. No questions. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Hello again. Good morning again. My name is Karen Green. Um, I um, want to just chime in on the way, as a business owner, I've been treated by the county with no notification at all. I own a couple of businesses on one of the parcels identified by the county. Um, to uh, be submitted to the state for uh, potential uh, future housing, low-income housing. No one ever came to our businesses and contacted us about what, would the, what would the plans were. We totally found out about it kind of in the middle of the night um, that, wait a minute, you're talking about turning the properties where my businesses are located into, or into low-income housing and have rezoned, looking at rezoning those properties. So um, I, I, I guess I'm just dumbfounded. This looks like eminent domain to me, uh, but uh, it's without compensation, and it's obviously without any kind of communication. So it's very stressful, very disturbing, and I, I have to say, in, in, uh, in light of the other comments made, the loss to the county in tax revenue is, is just, a, it's undeniable and it's, it's just mystifying that the county would move forward with such a project. These are properties that are commercial um, and are commercially zoned as such and have projects started on them and others that are interested in starting projects on them. These are not the kinds of lands that the governor was talking about in his executive order where we're talking about finding affordable housing sites that are near jobs, that are, that are uh, have schools nearby, medical services nearby, transportation nearby. N these properties don't meet those specifications. The school district has told us they can't uh, assume any more children in, their, in that district, so where would the kids go? Because if you're building affordable housing, you're obviously talking about families inhabiting those sites. So again, I just am expressing as a citizen and a business owner on one of these parcels that this is um, very distressing uh, county practice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Is there anyone online? All right. Uh, we just see, I'll close the public hearing and uh, determine that the action request is not a project pursuant to secret guidelines. So. Do we need to take a motion on this? Is that I was wondering yeah. if maybe planning wanted to respond to some of the comments or? Oh, well, sure. Before we made a motion, I just wanted to hear kind of <coughs> thoughts. 
Yeah, certainly. Uh, again, Chris Bahuli, Planning Director, um, we uh, are working through a, a process currently to evaluate uh, the roughly 160 acres um, of properties that are uh, identified as candidate rezone sites. Just want to be clear that no properties have, have currently been rezoned. Um, so those properties that are being um, evaluated, and we're also looking at other properties as well that weren't included in the candidate rezone um, list. We have spoken with uh, State Department of Housing and Community Development. They have indicated that if there are other sites, um, including sites that were mentioned today, uh, that might be able to be um, uh, included in a future rezoning package, that they would consider those uh, as part of a uh, amended housing element. So at, again, we are uh, evaluating sites um, for a rezone package. Uh, we need to have that completed by May of 2024. So we have uh, about 13 months or so to accomplish that. I also want to point out that currently we are looking at it being in, uh, rather than a hard rezone of sites, we're looking at it being an overlay um, zone that would be placed on properties. And so the uh, difference there is that commercial properties, uh, if they are have an uh, underlying zoning of commercial, would continue to be able to be developed as commercial. Uh, but with that overlay, we're looking at an incentive package for developing housing, including affordable housing. So there's still some work to be done. Um, we have been in communication with property owners that are on the candidate rezone site. We've indicated to them that they can continue to move forward uh, with their commercial um, projects, and we will process those properties, and we'll continue to meet with property owners on the list. And we should be doing an outreach, I would say, within probably a month to all of the property owners that are on the candidate rezone um, list, letting them know about our efforts and letting them know how to get in touch with us to talk about their plans for their property. Supervisor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, a couple of questions on how, what's the difference between a property that for rezone and a property eligible for lot split? Uh, I'm sorry, the last part What's of What's the difference between a property that's going to be rezoned or one that's going to be a candidate for a lot split? A lot split. So, um, again, the, the properties that we, would, um, that we would apply this overlay zone to, um, those properties um, will be rezoned. They will have that overlay, um, overlay zone placed on them. Uh, any residential property that, that's subject to um, SB9 uh, provisions, so it has to be in an urban area and so forth, is eligible to do a, a lot split. So those are, uh, I guess I would say, two different approaches to increase the number of housing um, units in, in the county. Two separate programs, though. Okay, so how, how does your department go about determining which uh, properties are candidates to split their lots? Is there a process? Yeah, there, the, well, the, there, is. There, there is an application that, 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 the, um, that planning has uh, for folks to uh, contemplate a, a lot split under SB9. Um, they, that follows uh, state requirements, so there's state uh, requirements for what properties are eligible for a, a lot split, and our application follows those state requirements. Okay, but do you determine um, beforehand which prop parcels in, say, Granite Bay are, can be eligible for lot splits? Yes. You do? We and do. So that's the process. I was just curious if you could tell us about that. Process. Yeah, so uh, again, there are state requirements, uh -huh. and so we've, we've evaluated what those state requirements are. They have to be in an urban um, uh, designated uh, area. Uh, they also have to meet, um, uh, they also have to be served by utilities. Um, and so there's certain overlays and layers that we look at in order to determine if a site is eligible. If it's eligible, it still has to go through a, an application process, but we just have those minimum requirements as required by the state. Right. So if somebody comes in and applies to, to have split their lot, how are their neighbors notified? Or is there any notification? I, I'm actually not sure of that. Um, we can follow up with you, though, on that. Okay, great. Yeah, because I had uh, um, a resident contact me a little bit outraged that their neighbor was going to split their lot 
And so for fear of their property value declining, said they were going to sell and move. So, I mean, you know, that's one of the, I guess, problems that we don't plan for. <clears throat> so the last question that I have <clears throat> is regarding the rezones and that Ms. Green was talking about. How, how do you notify people? Does, does the county just rezone property? No, we will, we will contact those property owners. We will send out a, a, uh, a letter to their legal address, the property owner's legal address, and we will uh, also have information available on our, on our website as well. So we'll have a uh, community engagement program for those property owners. Do they have an opportunity to opt out of that, or do they have to? Participate. I, um, I, I caught a little bit of, of what Ms. Kingsbury was saying earlier. I, I think we, again, don't hope to get to that point. I think we hope to um, work with folks, again, given what I said earlier about there being an opportunity for especially commercial property owners to continue to develop their sites commercially. Again, this overlay will uh, take more of a carrot approach in providing incentives for folks to develop housing on the site. So again, we hope that folks don't get to that point where they are not supportive of the rezone. Uh, and if that is the case, I think ultimately we'll have to evaluate um, whether or not their property is, is um, recommended for inclusion in the rezone package. We need to, at a minimum, get to the 55 acres. Obviously, we're going to be looking at going above that um, so that there's some buffer uh, with properties that are currently on the inventory should those develop uh, in in a in a manner not um, not consistent with uh, it being an affordable housing development. So can I tell the constituents to feel free to reach out to you folks? And Absolutely. See if you'll be willing to work with them, because it sounds like you will. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Supervisor Gustafson. I I just wanted to know. We've had some testimony today that it has already affected property values or business ventures and. From what I'm understanding, your, this process is not yet, it should not be impacting their ability to develop their property commercially as it is now, even if an overlay were to be approved at some point in the future, but it hasn't been now. And I just want to get you to be specific on that for the three that have testified today. Yeah, sh should not be. They are, they are just identified as candidate rezone sites, and so we can, um, you know, make clear to those property owners that their property has not yet be, been rezoned and that we um, uh, will, will um, again, entertain commercial um, development on those sites. So they're not precluded from submitting a commercial application today while this is underway? They're not precluded, no. Okay. Um, yeah. we, will, we will point out that there are incentive, that there are likely to be incentives for residential development on those sites. And again, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're going to be looking to be um, fairly aggressive with, with creating a buffer as well, given that we're likely to need some level of buffer. Great, uh, but again, and, you're, and you can talk to these folks right after this is done because I, I, I heard this concern the other night at the MAC meeting and, and the previous MAC meeting. I want to make sure that, that these individuals are clear about what this means and what it doesn't mean today yes. with their entertaining those proposals. Supervisor Landon. Just a quick question. If you mail a letter to someone and they don't respond, how much effort will we put into making sure that you do make contact with that person, whether it's knocking on their door personally or how, how much effort will there be? I'll say that there'll be considerable effort. I mean, we're, we're really not going to be talking about a huge number of property owners. So um, I think we'll be making a considerable effort to get in contact with them. Supervisor Gore. Thank you. I would um, appreciate a copy of the you know when the when the lists go out when the letters go out i think the entire board would like to know which properties have been identified and we'd like to know when those letters go out so that way we're aware um, and we're not cut, caught surprised and then we can refer people to you with questions that they have that would be appreciated absolutely thank you okay um i think that's Oh, we need you to take an action on this? Yes. Uh, uh, Supervisor Gore? Yes, sir. I was just going to make the motion on it. Okay. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. 
Okay, <coughs> motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a comment, uh, Mr. Kwan? N no, Chair. Not anymore. I, 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 didn't, I was wondering if I needed to add to staff's comments. I think there was just concerns that these are candid rezone sites and that's causing some business prospects to go away. Um, that's probably the concern that when, when people hear there might be something looming, that's causing some concerns over there as opposed to what we're gonna be, in terms of what we're, we might be doing as a staff and, and recommending to the board. Um, so, but hearing your, your thoughts in regard to having really a robust notification um, process as we do more than just the noticing for the rezone. I think that we've been talking about that and how we try and implement something like that uh, and maybe even on a district level as well. Well, I think if we can also explain an overlay versus a forced rezone, you know, in that map so that people can, we can take away that fear for investors. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, uh, Karen, I apologize, but that already closed public comment, so. I couldn't take your comment again. All righty, thank you. Now we're going to go to, uh, we're going to move to item 13A, Public Works. Are we ready? Yeah, they have a, they have a meeting that they, they're over, they're late for. Good afternoon. Or, yeah, it's afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Holmes, members of the board. Uh, Rob Mahoney with the Department of Public Works. Staff is requesting today your board consider for approval the following actions. Uh, number one, approve and authorize the county executive officer or designee to execute a funding agreement with Gen CA Placer Ranch LLC for Placer Ranch Sunset Area Sewer Improvements and execute any amendments to the agreement subject to county council and risk management concurrence. Number two, approve an allocation of up to $28 million in American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA funds to provide Gen CA Plaza Ranch LLC pursuant to the funding agreement. Number three, approve a fiscal year 22-23 budget amendment, AM792 for CC12086, Environmental Utilities Capital Improvement, PJ02193 in an amount of $28 million and cancel American Rescue Plan Fund FD 49060 in an amount of $28 million. And finally, number four, determine the proposed actions are not a project pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15378A and B5, and also are consistent with the previously approved Sunset Area Plan slash Placer Ranch Specific Plan Environmental Impact Report um, pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15162. So I, I want to orient, uh, orient you to the area um, and the proposed infrastructure associated with this, this agreement. Um, you can see up here um, the area uh, for Placer One, formerly known as Placer Ranch. Uh, the name has changed. Um, and the proposed infrastructure is shown here in brown, pink, green, dashed purple, and there's also a small square for sewer pump station that's also included in this infrastructure. Um, for further orientation, up on the north is Athens, um, and down near the center of Placer One from the east is Sunset Boulevard. Uh, for way of background, Placer County entered into a, de a development agreement with Gen CA Placer Ranch LLC that committed $17.8 million from the county to help fund infrastructure in the Placer One area and get infrastructure to the university. When ARPA funding became available, the county saw this as an opportunity to fulfill this obligation. The proposed agreement deal points are summarized here. Uh, the premise of the agreement is that the developer will bid and construct the infrastructure in Placer One and the Sunset area and be reimbursed by the county using ARPA funding. Uh, the term of the agreement includes a requirement for the developer to construct all of the infrastructure by December 31st, 2026. The maximum amount of the agreement is $28 million. This is divided into two amounts, 
uh, the maximum amount of $17.8 million for the infrastructure within Placer 1 and off-site to the south. And you can see the infrastructure extending to the south beyond Placer 1 to connect to the Roseville SPWA infrastructure here. Another deal point is the county has step-in rights. If the developer has not designed, submitted, and received technical approval by the county by specified dates, or if the developer has not caused construction of them to commence by specific dates, the county has the option to assume responsibility for the design and or construction of the infrastructure. This is to ensure that the funding is spent within the ARPA funding timelines. And the final deal point is uh, the developer is required to comply with all applicable requirements. Um, the county has agreed to assist the developer in ensuring that the ARPA requirements are met um, throughout the process. Um, once again, staff is requesting the board consider for approval the following actions. And in light of time, um, I will entertain any questions. Okay, any questions for, for board members? You know, I, um, I just want to make a point, and it's not really a question per se, but we're taking these ARPA dollars and investing in the infrastructure in this area, uh, which is going to be a huge revitalization project to allow for a university to come to the area and then additional businesses to come to the Sunset area. And so this is just a really terrific opportunity. And I'm really pleased that our board is choosing to make this investment with those dollars. So thank you for your hard work and working with the developer on this. And this is moving fast, oh, moving more quickly because of this action. Thank you. Any, any other comments from the board members? Oh, yes. Supervisor Jones. <laughs> yes. Um, I wanted a little bit of clarification. I, I'm not sure whether you or legal, but I believe that we um, are funding with the ARPA money up front, but yet we will get paid back, because the county was going to front that money for the sewer project at first, weren't we? So the way the structure is set up is the amount will be, um, the project itself will be contracted out uh, by Gen 8. Um, they will perform the work. Once they've performed the work, we will reimburse them for the amounts. So there won't be a payment up front, but there will be a reimbursement once the amount is expended. Okay. So, so the ARPA money will be spent then, but this is monies that will be recuperated, right, over the years as the, as the developers? Is that how it works? Here comes Ken. <laughs> so at least for the ARPA portion of it, and I'll let Ken speak to the, the portion afterwards in terms of connection fees, but that ARPA fund amount will go out after the work is constructed. Um, and then there will be connection fees that will be paid at some point later that may come back into the county. So Ken Grimm with the Department of Public Works. Two parts to this, this process. Uh, one is your board several years ago with the development agreement for Placer Ranch agreed to make a commitment of about $17.8 million, uh, basically for the, for the infrastructures for the university. That money will not be returned. That is your board's obligation that you made to Placer Ranch in the past. So move forward, we'll be spending approximately $28 million for this entire project. For that portion, that is through Placer One. There is $17.8 million that we cannot recover because otherwise we would have to, in accordance with the uh, uh, development agreement you approved years ago, would have to pay that back. But the remainder we should be able to recover through connection fees over time. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Ken, for that clarification. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Any other comments from board members? See none. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address this item? Is there anyone online that needs, that needs to speak to us? Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mike Garabedian, Placer County tomorrow have a serious concerns about the university project as a viable and good project for the state uh, and uh, also for the uh, the mechanism you're discussing here uh, and I want to point out for the last agenda item there was no call for public comment that I heard and I had raised my hand and I was not called on There was no hand raised on the last comment. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Garabian, go ahead and you concluded with your comments. Uh, that's uh, all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Any no. other comments? No further, Chairman. All right. Is there a motion to approve? I'll move approval of the items along with everything that Robin said earlier. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll second that. Okay, this motion is sec uh, by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Landon. This is a roll call vote. Will the clerk please call the roll? Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. The item is moved. Thank you for uh, your patience. Thank you. Well, let me ask. Uh, we have next on the uh, agenda the Hidden Falls Regional Park. Is the board willing to do this or do you want to take a break? I'll leave it up to you. We could take a break. Break, break would give probably people, be good before people that a chance one. to come. And what is it? Is there anybody here to? to well, the there are. I think there are going to be some folks online. online. On this oh. Mm -hmm. There are. Could we take a 30 minute break? Uh, would that be appropriate? I'm, Appropriate to take a 30 minute break. We do break? closed session during that time? Yes. No. Uh, what I'd suggest we do is adjourn to closed session, see how much we can do in 30 minutes, and then come back. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I would hate to keep people waiting at the same time. I would like us to be yeah. fresh. Right. And with us not having a break, it's just hard to power through. Yeah. Okay. I need to. Oh, on the record. Yeah. Uh, the board will now adjourn to closed session to consider one item of existing litigation two items of anticipated litigation, two items of labor negotiations, and one item of public employee performance.
Okay, the board has just returned from closed session and county council will report out. The board met in closed session. First order of business was to adjourn as the county board of supervisors and convene as the county in-home support services public authority. Motion made by Gore, second by Landon 5-0. At that point, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. The board then adjourned as the Placer County in-home support services public authority and reconvened as the Placer County Board of Supervisors on a motion by Gore, seconded by Gustafson, 5-0 vote. The board then considered uh, the item under 2A, initiation of litigation. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. That concludes this portion of the report out of closed session. So now we will move to item 12B. This is uh, Hidden Falls Regional Park Trails and Open Space Expansion Project, phase one. Thank you again, Chairman Holmes, members of the board, Andy Fisher with Parks and Open Space here with Lisa Carnahan, Senior Planner with Parks and Open Space and Josh Hunsinger, Interim Director of Parks and Open Space. Uh, I'd like to start uh, today, the item before you I'll begin with, is, regards the first phase of the Hidden Falls Regional Park Trails Expansion Project. The specific action before you is to approve a request to approve plans and specifications and authorize the bid uh, for the Twilight Ride parking trailhead uh, to be constructed off of Bell Road. I'd like to take a moment um, to go over briefly the history of the larger Hidden Falls Expansion Project uh, and how this uh, piece of it fits into that project and turn it over to Lisa to talk about the details of the plans and specs that we have before you for your approval today. And then I'd like to finish by talking about some of the correspondence and additional opportunities for public input. We'll try to keep that as brief as we possibly can. Hidden Falls Regional Park was opened in 2006, expanded in 2013. It now includes 1,200 acres. And in 2017, your board ordered the preparation of a subsequent um, environmental impact report. Uh, that studied the impacts for an enlargement project that looks like that. Uh, the expansion project involved the parcels that are outlined in red. Existing Hidden Falls is the, is the gray parcel that's not outlined in red. Uh, specifically, the project would construct a trailhead that's before you today on the parcel in green. In 2017, we began an environmental impact report, the subsequent EIR, uh, in looking at the expansion, we looked at all areas from land use, soils, geology, cultural resources, visual impacts, transportation, circulation, air and water quality, noise, wetland, biological resources, public services, um, wildfire risk, among others. And so it was a very robust process. The uh, EIR itself we worked on for over three years. During the um, process of the EIR, we were presented with an opportunity. Your board authorized the application for grant funds from the state uh, that we received in the amount of $3,027,090 uh, from the Trails and Greenways program. That's a Prop 68 uh, program. So the receipt of that grant now is kind of driving our critical path uh, toward construction of this project. As we went through the project, we had robust public outreach and robust con comments. I know many of you, all of you, I think remember those. Uh, over 30 public meetings where this was addressed. Um, and out of that, we, the project was, we did listen to a lot of those comments, particularly from folks that live around the area. And the project was modified quite a bit from its original inception. We originally were gonna have a, two parking lots. One would be up on that uh, far northern parcel in the Auburn Valley neighborhood. That was eliminated from the project. And then the, the project before you today off of Bell Road was originally to have spaces for 102 automobiles and 38 equestrian spaces. That's been reduced in the approved project to 54 autos and 20 equestrian spaces. So that all came out of discussions with folks really that lived in the neighborhood. Uh, your board approved the project, certified the EIR and the use permit on March 8th of 2021. It's hard to believe it's already been two years since then. Uh, and we have been busy working on designs and um, in, in management issues since. It was very important to your board at the time of approval that we continue to engage, particularly the neighbors closest to the project, and we have done that. We've had a series of meetings 
uh, began with two uh, meetings of the general neighborhood. That would be the Lone Star, Bell, uh, Kramer Road area. We focused then down, uh, we had one meeting just with folks with concerns about the Auburn Valley neighborhood. And then after that, a, a, a meeting with just the, the folks adjacent to the property. So the ones that kind of border the property or within a couple of parcels that we call our adjacent neighbors. <clears throat> we had one more meeting about, uh, from folks that live on Ore Creek Lane, which is the next uh, lane over from our project. And then as we developed plans and we got to the 35% um, schematic design phase, we did invite the design team as well as the neighbors out to the property. We walked the property. Um, we did hear uh, concerns and comments from folks at the time, and we took those back. We wanted the design team there so they could hear it firsthand, not um, taken through us. So they took a list of comments. Lisa will be talking about those specifically in just a moment as they pertain to the plans and specifications that we're, they were working on. Out of those uh, meetings that we had, that series of five meetings, there were also other areas of concern that the neighbors brought up for us that we've been working on in just categories. Those were signage and wayfinding, how do we make it clear throughout the neighborhood uh, where the project is, signage to get there, uh, wayfinding within the project, what are we gonna do for fuels management, um, we are, in, we are contracted now with the Placer Resource Conservation District and their foresters working on a fuels management plan that is in progress. Uh, emergency response plan, we're working on that for access in and out of the park in emergency situations. One of the mitigations to this project was to purchase, it's called a light rescue vehicle, which is a vehicle that will get into most areas of the park uh, with water for initial attack and also the ability to transport injured out of the park. So that was ordered. Uh, almost a year ago, it was ordered as a long lead item. We ordered that in June of 2022. Uh, folks were also concerned about how we would cooperate with the Placer Land Trust because most of that property outlined in, lead, in red is owned or in easement uh, by the Placer Land Trust. So we've had regular meetings with them working on a cooperative agreement of how we will operate once the public is on the property. That's ongoing. Uh, and then finally, we did have categories of change to the, the plans and specs themselves, which I'll turn it over to Lisa. And I did want to mention, uh, we do have a meeting uh, scheduled April 18th at 6 o'clock. That is in the Planning Commission hearing room. Um, and there will be a Zoom option because we want to go over with folks how we're making progress on a number of these issues. Uh, some of them, because of our, our grant deadline, they need to work in, in parallel, so getting the project out to bid soon to get it constructed within the timeline of the grant is important, but we haven't forgotten about the other issues related to the project that are not in the plans. We want to go over all these categories of issues and the progress that we're making on those with the neighbors. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa, and then I'll close up with some of the comments we received in the last couple of days. Thank you, Andy. Hi, Lisa Carnahan. Parks Department. Uh, yeah, before you today, I'm going to be talking a little bit more in depth about the uh, Twilight Ride Access and Parking Trailhead area. And again, that's that green area on the map there. And as you'll see, one of the things uh, is that it will give, there's an existing eight, approximately eight miles of trails within the Placer Land Trust properties over here. And it will give immediate access to those eight miles of trails and eventually will connect to Hidden Falls and will connect all the way up to the Bear River. Um, but this is the starting of it. This is the uh, parking lot, like Andy said, will provide for 54 automobile spots and 20 equestrian spots. It's at 5345 Bell Road. Um, and along with the parking area, there'll be a restroom with drinking fountain, there'll be a educational kiosk, a picnic area, a ranger booth, planning and irrigation, fencing and equestrian amenities and storm drainage. I'm gonna, and so here's the diagram of what is going to be built, hopefully, and the total construction is estimated at uh, 3,670,000, which as Andy stated, is being provided mostly by the state grant with some supplementary matching county funds. Um, so after, after approval in 2021 of the entire project, uh, 
Andy, as Andy mentioned again, we went and we met with the neighbors, we gathered their input, we listened, and they had a lot of comments on things that we could do to help make the project better for them. For example, um, up here, this is the closest neighbor, and the, the, up here is another neighbor um, with residences. And so they wanted some more vegetative screening in this area. So we planted vegetative screening here, and we also planted it around the entirety of the parking area and the restroom area for, this, for these folks up here. Um, some of the other things they, they brought up um, were tapers and fencing. So they wanted tapers off the road. We, we placed the entrance so that it would get the best site visibility from either side. And we do, did provide as the tapers here and here so people could get off safely and get out safely. Um, we provided, uh, another thing they wanted was fencing at the front so that people couldn't drive into the property. And there is either fencing or boulders along the entirety of the area and all the way around the backside. So people that come to visit are restricted to driving just the access road and parking and then walking in. Um, there's also, with the fencing here, we provided gates so that, and gates up here, so, and not for the public, but just so that in the future, if we so desired, there could be uh, livestock grazing, which there is now. Uh, we've, one, another thing they wanted was gates. So there's a gate here at the entrance, there's a gate at the exit over here, and there's enough room if somebody were to come in um, before hours, we put a turnaround so that they could go out. And also, there is enough room if people come in before the gate is opened by the rangers that they, there's um, more than six spots there so that people won't have to line on the Bell Road itself. Uh, water quality measures was a really important thing for folks. They wanted to make sure that none of the runoff from this roadway or parking area was gonna get down into the adjoining properties. And so there are, um, along the entire uh, roadway, there's a drainage ditch on the side, and those drainage ditches go into water quality treatment bioswales that are next to the water, so that the water is always treated before it goes into the water system. Another important thing, especially for these folks that live right here, was the ranger booth. Originally, it was closer up to the property line. And so with their suggestion, we moved it as far away as we could with the system that we were putting in. We moved it about 40 feet south. And we also angled it so that the window opens up this way and not directly at the neighbors so that they, it would minimize that sound. Um, Another thing they were interested in was a camera. So we've put wiring in. There'll be wiring that will connect the ranger's booth without in the parking area so that the ranger can see what's going on in the parking area and be attuned to things out there. Uh, another thing was they wanted very little lighting, which we also wanted. We, our parks do not have a lot of exterior lighting on them purposefully. Um, and there's only one light and it's on the restroom on the outside and it will go off an hour after dusk. And that's just, uh, again, to keep this as in a natural state as possible as far as the light. Um, and lastly, this gentleman that lives up in this area, he, wanted, he has fainting goats and other livestock that he was afraid that even though there's an existing perimeter fence, the cross fencing all the way around the property. He wanted to have um, the assurance that no curious patrons would come up and, oh, look at the cute things, let's feed them and, and you know, and unwittingly, you know, harm them. So 
we have included within the plans a, a, another fence here. Um, so, in essence, these are the design comments that we addressed that I just talked about. Uh, in addition, the environmental, environmental permitting, um, we've been working with the PCCP, the Placer County Conservation Program, the CDFW, <coughs> California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Army Corps of Engineers on our environmental permitting to make sure the county is following uh, all the environmental regulations. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to leave you with this slide showing the design comments that were addressed by the neighbors, and I'm going to hand it back over to Andy. Thank you. So uh, to wrap up, I did want to just mention again the meeting that we will have in the Planning Commission hearing room on April 18th at 6 o'clock. Uh, we got notice about that out yesterday, and I need to apologize for that. Our intent was to have a good week of notification. It also told folks about this meeting. We have a, it's a list we've compiled over the last several years, several hundred people who have asked to be kept informed. Um, we let some of the uh, details about the, the Zoom link and the meeting venue get us delayed, and that got out yesterday, and we want to apologize for that. We, we regret that we didn't give people more notice of that before this meeting. Um, and also some of the, the letters we've seen come in in the last couple days, most of them uh, are from recognizable folks. There does seem to be a core of concerned folks around the property themselves. We know them pretty well. We've kind of become friends over lots of meetings. Um, we do know how to reach out to that core group who is, con who is very interested in the plans themselves. Um, and I can, we can, I'll offer a couple of opportunities. One is that the plans are online. So if you go to the item 12B on today's agenda, and you click on the additional documents right next to that, you can view those plans. We will update the notification we sent out yesterday with that link and also an offering of where they can contact us if they, you know, some folks out in that area have bad bandwidth and it's a big document, so we'll arrange to get it to them in a different way. Um, there was, um, folks suggested that we pull the item today and come back and give them a chance. I'd like to suggest this by describing the bid process. So when you go out to bid, uh, you're out to bid for several weeks, maybe six or eight weeks, and in that time, contractors pick up plans. They also get a chance to turn in comments, and they'll pick up good things. Uh, we walk the property in a pre-bid meeting. Uh, they will point things out to you, uh, sometimes with good input. Uh, you know, this product you're specifying doesn't exist anymore, things like that. So you do get a series of comments from contractors. Those get compiled by the design team. Ideally, if folks um, from the local area wanted to look at the plans again and, and put in any more comments, I, I hope you know, there might be some dispute on, on our agreement of how many rounds of review they were to get. I do hope they will see that we really applied ourselves uh, and our energy to, to addressing those concerns and making the plans better. And if they want to take another look, if they still have some comments, ideally getting all of those to the design team at the same time, as well as some other um, kind of straggling comments coming in from regulatory agencies so that all of that could be addressed at once and then that goes out in the form of an addendum uh, before the bids are open so uh, we do have time to do that I think that would probably be you know at least in my suggestion uh, the best scenario uh, to get the plans all wrapped up with final comments and we will return to your board for approval of that contract before it goes out to bids or before it goes to construction to award the bid um, wanted to throw that out with that. I'll turn it back to your board for any questions. Okay, any questions, comments, Supervisor Gustafson? Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate your time. And I know we had a meeting yesterday to discuss some of the public comment that was coming in. And I appreciate the apology. Um, I think these folks expected to see and hear from you again before today. I mean, before, you know, not wait till after we've already approve the plans and specs. Um, so I, I would still urge that there's something before the 18th so that as soon as possible, if there is some issue that we misunderstood or you misunderstood in the design, that they could better comment on that. But I had two questions um, specific to the design. Um, because at Hidden Falls, the existing park, when we have red flag days and closure days, we notice people ahead of time, and we also notice about the reservation system. Have you contemplated where you would put those kinds of signs, and is that part of this project? 
Because I think what we want to avoid is people driving all the way in and then finding out they've got to turn around and drive back out and doubling the traffic on the road. So is there some thought about how you can more quickly notify those folks? Indeed. So we do have a, uh, you know, we've got a social media list for people that are looking. We do have advance time for anybody. If it's a reservation day, we're able to reach out to folks with reservations and give them a personal email mm -hmm. uh, with, a, with a credit to their, to their fees. Um, we have changeable message boards. Um, we have not posted at the site. We usually have rangers there to mm -hmm. shepherd people that, you know, still come. Um, it has, uh, it's been pretty successful at Hidden Falls. We have very few people anymore that do show up. So apparently our network seems to be working. Okay. Uh, we are, we do seem to be able, and we'll carry that same network, the same reservation system and notification system to this new trailhead as well. Can, and yeah, because I, I could see a sign, you know, out at, certainly at Bell Road, but maybe even out at 49 saying, right. don't try, don't turn, you know, rem, you know, it's closed. So exactly. And we um, do have those changeable messages. And do we have any reason that we've needed auto locking restrooms at night? Have we had that at the other park at all? No. For that? At least, knock on wood, we haven't had any break-ins. We've had some vandalism to the exterior, but we haven't had attempted break-ins. Yeah, it was more people residing in restrooms when it's inclement weather overnight. Yeah. <laughs> it sometimes happens at other public park facilities, but if we have an experience, there's no reason. It's in a quick fix, but you can design the restrooms to have auto um, locking. Um, those were my only technical questions. I. I do feel strongly that um, those that have participated, it's been a year or two since you've met with them, is that correct? How long has it been since you met with the neighbors? It has, yes, it's been about a year. And, and I, I personally would prefer that you meet with them before I approve these plans and specs in case there's something major that you didn't pick up on. And I think we talked a little bit about whether we could continue this till next Tuesday, how much would that impact your construction schedule? I think Supervisor Holmes and myself were pleased that it would be a week delay, but that wouldn't be insurmountable to the project. Um, but I, I want to hear from the public on their uh, comments um, before I make that recommendation. But I just wanted the rest of the board to know uh, that's what Supervisor Chair Holmes and I talked about yesterday with um, the, the staff, and then I relayed to the, some of the individuals who emailed us. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? So I'll open it up to the public. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to address us on this item? We have two on Zoom. Beg your pardon? Judy, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Jim and Cindy and um, Suzanne, Shante and Bonnie. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. It, um, this timing went well. I do have an open spot during all my meetings today. So that's why I'm here via Zoom instead of in person. And I appreciate um, Cindy what you just mentioned about um, learning more about what um, and meeting with the neighbors prior to approving this very much so I just want to take everybody back in time to June of 2018 and this was the impotence of this whole like I say planning fiasco of Hidden Falls it was, uh, we were poorly notified, and I'm not blaming that on the parks. I'm just saying as the um, notification process existed at that time, they did their due diligence. But as you know, we're a rural property, and um, the homes are spread out. So when you have a notification area of a small radius, it works in neighborhoods, but not in the rural community. And so the plan was to have this all pushed through and done and ready to go from June 20, uh, 2018 to December 2018. And now we know what a long process it really takes when we have due diligence. And we know how much this project had changed from the first um, design plan. So uh, that is why I think it is very important for us to make sure that as a community, the area that's being impacted does have that time to meet with the parks. Um, I 
I wasn't any under misunderstanding. We were going to be contacted at 65% done and 95% done. And um, I know that my colleague, uh, Jane Wurst, contacted um, Parks Department and even, you know, like, hey, when are we going to hear from you? And we hadn't heard anything. So really, um, again, I just want to reiterate, we would like to have the opportunity be, to understand and meet with the Parks Department about the design before that um, the board makes this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Suzanne, you, uh, Supervisor Jones? Yes, I wanted to just express that I support both you and Cindy in your communities, whatever you decide. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Uh, Mark, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I am Mark Rideout, OFA resident and former deputy director of public works. I reviewed the project plans and specs, and given my direct experience with this project, I find the consultant and staff reliably incorporated all the mitigation measures and required details contained in the certified EIR. As you recall, this EIR was developed over many years with an unprecedented level of public input and scrutiny. Based on your board's prior actions and the facts, it's now time to move this project forward. I urge you to approve the recommended actions today and utilize the potential bid addenda process to address any neighbor or contractor input that may come forward in the future. Thank you. Michael, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good afternoon, Mike Garabedian, Placer County Tomorrow. I agree with the issues of the community and the, their efforts for disclosure and involvement. Um, uh, this is a case, in my view, of let's assume that all the legal requirements of uh, state local governments have been followed. I mean, in terms of local governments, not necessarily state, uh, but there's still, to, from my point of view, is inadequate county governance. Um, the, the grant and the project fragment this agricultural area through the acquisitions and trails and uh, events proposed and, and so forth. Uh, it's a project that is the conversion of the PCC uh, P reserve area um, to recreation and uh, it's a, a misuse of the the funds which aren't supposed to are supposed to have cautionary and not prevent permit such things um, the uh, the question of um, well I would like to be uh, before I forget I would like to be added to any Andy's list. I have not been on that list. I was on the list for a different project some years ago, but would like to be on this list. Uh, but I, I, I urge the county not to make the mistake of um, leading the state into uh, this kind of an agricultural impact. Uh, I submitted a written uh, written notes overnight to cover the point, cover it, list the issues, uh, and uh, uh, look forward. To to figuring out how to make a change in the process so that rural communities uh, have a um, the kind of thing that we we have at other levels of government more secure. Thank you. Chair, no more commenters on Zoom. No more comments. All righty. Okay. What's the will of the board? Did you? Uh, I had one. I had one more question uh, for staff. So I think yesterday we talked about this potential one week delay and how much that would hold up the project. It sounded like it wouldn't be a significant impact to the project timing. A am I correct in that? Um, it's just, it's incremental, right? It's incremental. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is until the, the neighbors have had a chance to review the, the plans and specs and make sure that what you've suggested to us, I have no reason to doubt, that you have addressed the concerns to the best of your ability. But until they've had that chance, I feel like delaying one week is a reasonable request given the miscommunication. And, um, and the other comment uh, that I had asked yesterday is even if after we approve, if it were to be delayed a week and then approved, and comments came from the community later that you could issue an addenda to the RFP and, and get it out to any proposers on that and it might adjust as well. Is that correct? 
and, and that's ideal to get it in addenda form because it, then it gives all bidders an opportunity to adjust their bids to that. And agenda. how long would they have to do that? We ju generally uh, adjust the end of the bid to give, you know, a week or uh, I don't think there are some standard times that you, if okay. you need to, extend out okay. a, a bid opening so that contractors do have that time to adjust. Okay. Well, if that's okay, yeah. Supervisor Holmes, yeah. then I would ask that we um, bring this back next Tuesday for action that we table it for today and and ask staff to please make yourselves available to meet with the neighbors this week or next yeah. Monday so that before Tuesday they've had a chance to ask any detailed questions yeah. of you. We'll make every effort to make it this week. So do we want to continue the item? Yeah, continue the item. And so that's a, a motion. And I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to second and then can I just clarify one thing? And that would be you would still have this meeting on April 18th. 18th yes. So that a full group of people could still come forward, review the plans, and make any additional suggestions. Yes. Okay. And speak to even broader issues than just these plans. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So, do we have a time certain that we can do that? Yes, Chairman. I would suggest we move this to April 4th at 1 p.m. April 4th at 1 p.m. Is that satisfactory? Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay, so there's a motion by Gustin. Oops. No, no, no. I'm just waiting for the motion. <laughs> Sorry. Don't interrupt me. I'm having a hard time today. <laughs> um, motion by Gustafson and second by Gore. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved uh, to continue uh, April 4th at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank week. you, everybody. All right. All right, now we're going to move to item, <coughs> item eight. our one a time, one o'clock, one thirty timed item, uh, item eight a community development resource agency defay variance. Hey, good afternoon again, uh, again Jim, uh, Supervisor Holmes and Supervisors Chris uh, Pohuli, Planning Director. Uh, the item that we have before you this afternoon is an appeal of the Planning Commission's January 12th decision to uphold the Zoning Administrator's approval of a variance to allow the property owner to construct an expansion of their home uh, in Newcastle, in the Newcastle community. The lead planner for this item is Kara Conklin. She'll be providing a brief presentation for you. Uh, my understanding is that the applicant is on the Zoom call and the appellant is here in chambers. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Conklin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Kara Conklin with the Planning Services Division. And the item before you today is a third party appeal of the Planning's com Planning Commission's approval of the DeFay variance. So the purpose of today's hearing is uh, to appeal or to consider an appeal for the uh, plan Planning Commission's decision to uphold the Zoning Administrator's approval of a variance to construct a 1,077 square foot two story residential addition to an existing single family residence that is proposed to be 28 feet 8 inches from the north west side property line where a minimum of 30 feet is normally required and 25 feet 6 inches from the northeast front property line where 50 feet from edge of easement is normally required. The 1.8 acre parcel is located at 3404 Rattlesnake Road in Newcastle. Parcels to the east and, and to the south are currently developed and the parcel to the north and northwest is currently undeveloped. Um, the project site is zoned residential agriculture combining a minimum building site of 4.6 acres. The subject parcel became a lawfully created parcel in 1980 at 1.8 acres <coughs> and does not meet the current minimum zoning requirement of 4.6 acres. Uh, surrounding parcels within the area are under the same zoning designation and meet those minimum parcel size requirements. The single family residence is located on the northwest side of the parcel, which is also the narrowest and most level portion of the, pro of the property. 
The applicant looked at putting the residential addition in the rear of the property. However, um, it would have required um, significant grading, soil stabilization, and construction of a retaining wall. The applicant also looked at putting the addition above the garage, but that would have required them to remove their solar panels, as well as loss of garage space, attic storage space, and it would have required extensive electrical rerouting. They also looked at putting it on the southern portion of their property. Um, this part of the property contains a garden with raised beds, um, fruit trees, and it also slopes significantly where the septic repair area and leach field are, are located. So the minimum setbacks are 30 feet from the side property line. The applicants are requesting um, 28 feet 6 inches from that side property line. And then they are requesting 25 feet, six inches from the front property line where 50 feet is required. And that is also running in line with their existing home. On October 20th, the um, variance was presented at the zoning administrator hearing and the zoning administrator took action to approve that variance per the findings um, listed below. On October 27th, we received an appeal filed um, by the adjacent Northwest property owner, Tyler Field, and that appeal stated the following points, loss of privacy, potential for impeding views of Folsom Lake, substantially reducing the value of Mr. Field's property, and setting a precedent for special treatment. Um, staff's response to the appeal um, to these points for loss of privacy um, the applicant is requesting less than one and a half feet within the required 30 foot side, side setback, which is the minimum departure from the zoning requirement. Um, there is no house on the adjacent undeveloped parcel and there are no plans, building plans submitted or permits. Potential for impeding views of Folsom Lake and substantially reducing the value of Mr. Field's property. Both of these are speculative as number one, there are no, there is no parcel on Mr. Fields or no residence on Mr. Fields parcel and therefore there is no view to obstruct. Um, and there has, we have received no proof that the um, addition would substantially reduce the value of his property. Um, nothing was provided for that. And as far as setting a, a precedent for special treatment, um, it was determined that the variance met the required findings for a variance to approve a variance, including the sh size, shape, topography, and layout of the parcel, as well as not depriving the property owners of the same privileges that are afforded to other properties in the area. Um, those properties meet the minimum zoning requirement of 4.6 acres and therefore would be less likely to need a variance to do a residential addition on their property. The appeal was heard at the January 12th Planning Commission and the appeal was, um, was denied and the zoning administrator's uh, approval of the variance was up upheld by the Planning Commission. Um, they took action five to zero with one member absent and one vacant seat. Staff received another letter of appeal on January 18th um, from uh, Mr. Field and that appeal contended the, the same points as well as some additional concerns, including the neighborhood concerns, um, questions in regards to the measurement for the setback request, and also the location of the proposed addition. Staff already addressed the loss of privacy, um, value uh, of Mr. Field's property, and um, the special treatment. Um, and so those were addressed at the zoning administrator hearing and the planning commission hearing. Staff received um, a letter that was signed by uh, property owners to the Northeast, Eileen and Russell Field, and it was also signed by four other neighbors within the vicinity. And that letter contended that the variance request tests the privacy, views, and open space of this area. Um, as privacy and um, 
and views had already been addressed. Um, staff did want to address the open space issue. And the DeFay parcel is considered a developed parcel with a single family residence. It is not an open space parcel. Measurements to the setback request. Um, so the appellants provided some pictures and videos um, using a laser measure to um, point from the fence, from their fence line to the DeFay residence. Um, staff says that there is um, incons inaccuracies with using these laser measures. Um, the DeFays provided a professionally drafted site plan and map of their property. Um, those drafters and surveyors used legal descriptions, parcel maps that are recorded with the county, as well as USGS topographical maps to provide an accurate site plan and um, drawings for their residential addition. Location of the proposed addition. Um, as stated in the previous staff reports, as well as in the presentation, the DeFays did look at other options to put their residential addition. And um, due to the, the um, cost prohibitive and um, you know, significant grading and electrical rerouting that was gonna be required to um, put their addition in those locations, the proposed addition is the most logical place and it is the minimum departure from the zoning requirements. And with that, staff recommends the following. Um, number one, to conduct a public hearing to consider an appeal fi filed by Mr. Tyler Field. Number two, to deny the appeal filed, filed by Tyler Field. Number three, uphold the Planning Commission's January 12, 2023 approval for a variance to allow for construction of a 1,077 square foot two-story residential addition to an existing single-story residence proposed to be located 28 feet, eight inches from the northwest side property line, where a minimum of 30 feet is required, and 25 feet, six inches from the northeast front property line, where 50 feet from the edge of easement is normally required. And number four, to find the project categorically exempt in accordance with sections 15303 and 15305 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines, class three new construction or conversion of small structures, and class five minor alterations in land use limitations. And with that, I am available for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Kara. Uh, any questions, comments from board members before I turn it over to the appellant? I'm sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> I've been talking a lot today. Um, how, what is the age of the DeFray residence, the existing one? Um, I believe it was built in the 80s. Okay, so the subdivision occurred in 1980 for the 1 1.8 acres, and at that time um, was the, the structure, because it's within the 50 feet at that one front, from the front easement existing today. It's Correct not within that so that standard was applied sometime later yes. okay mm -hmm. okay i just wanted to make sure that was clear okay the parcel was actually created in 1976 but um there was a boundary line adjustment that occurred to what it is currently as today okay. in 1980 but it was conforming at that time when they built that um their initial structure correct okay yes thank you supervisor jones yeah, my question was um, a follow-up to that. So the ones that now are 4.6 acres, the zoning is 4.6, when did that zoning come into play in this area? I think that occurred sometime in the 80s as well. Okay, so that sort of renders the argument that this, this the applicant's property is not conforming, but it's not applicable because their property was not required to be conforming to the 4.6 at the time they bought and developed it, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So it's a legal non-conforming lot then? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, any other questions from board members? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and open up the appellant. Yeah. Uh, the appellant, please come forward. And Um, you, sir, you have 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes? Yeah. All right. 
I brought in a few documents I wanted to share with the board. Okay. Um, mainly in regards to the measurement that I believe is in question. Um, all right, great. Thank you. Um, so the first document on that list is just a copy of um, showing that there's widespread disapproval of this development. Uh, many local neighbors signed and there, there's um, disapproval of constructing so close to a property line and removing privacy in a uh, rural area like that. Um, I want to move on to some other evidence that I submitted in the photos that are there. Um, what I did is essentially went to the property line right at the fence line and I had two different laser measurements, two different manufacturers. I submitted photo and video evidence of pointing the laser from the fence line to their house at the closest point. And both devices gave a measurement of about 39 feet, two inches. Um, their setback comes off from the property 15 feet, um, which means that according to where the fence line is currently and where their house is at now, the extension would be set back 24 feet, two inches. The current variance is set for 28 feet, eight inches from, from the property line. And when I submitted this evidence, I was confronted with some questions. How do you know that the property line is where the fence line is? Uh, how do you know your laser measurements are accurate? Um, and those are great questions. So I believe by using two different devices by two different manufacturers and getting roughly like the same measurement within an inch, that it confirms that the devices were working correctly and providing video. Um, the other question is, how do I know where the fence line is? And um, the, Ms. DeFay had mentioned in her response to my appeal that she was looking to see if there were any survey records for their property and to my knowledge, I don't, I don't know. I submitted in those documents there a plot plan uh, from Placer County, um, but the true w whether or not that fence is in the right location is, uh, is not known. I, I also included pictures of a stake from a previous survey, which shows that the fence actually is where it should be. I, I included a, a photo of a surveyed stake close up to show the detail of it, that it's not a fence post or something else, and a kind of zoomed out picture to show that this, the stake is indeed in line with the, where the current fence is. And so that, though, that piece of evidence would confirm that the fence is accurate. Um, overall, my, my concern is that there extension will be much closer than what the variance is saying and I'm requesting that the variance not be approved until a survey a proper survey is done of the property uh, that way everyone is on the same page and we can square away all these issues and there's no question um, I'm also concerned that if they build too close and it encroaches that they would be able to take a portion of the property through adverse possession. So that's another concern I have. Um, and just to put a nail on it is, based on the measurements I took with the laser device, they disagree with the set, with the, with the measurements um, pro provided in the documentation for the appeal. The appeal says it would be 28 feet, eight inches setback. But according to my measurements, it would be 24 feet, two inches. And that's like a four, almost five foot difference. Uh, and it's a fairly significant difference. And that's part of why I think a survey should be done. Um, thanks for hearing my appeal. And um, 
Let me just see if, I think that's everything. Yeah, I'm just asking for the, the um, approval to be put on hold until we can confirm these measurements with an official survey by a surveyor. And we're asking that the DeFays uh, have this done. Thank you. So if I can ask a question. Yeah. So there's 28 feet from the property owner's assessment. And you say it's 24 feet. Yes. So why does that make a difference to you? Um, because when, when they, I don't know, it's kind of like proof of what's happening. For example, if someone wanted to build something close to your house and they said, oh, it'll only be uh, 10 feet away, but in reality it's only five, it would be, you know, I think anyone would have the opinion of, oh, it's, we're getting kind of, it's being, it may be portrayed, I'm not saying they're doing this intentionally, but it's a portrayal of, oh, it's only a small amount, but once the survey is done, it may show, no, it's actually much closer than what, than what the overlays indicate. Um, and so all I'm asking is for a survey to be done. But there's no home on the other side. No, but myself and my wife have plans to build a home there. I grew up in this area. Um, my parents live across the street. I have very significant ties to the area, and my dream is to build a house there eventually. Yeah, but you're right, there isn't currently a house there. Okay. Does, oh, Supervisor Just London. A quick question on the, on your lot um, or on his lot. Um, is that lot pretty much all buildable in the future if he does decide to build? Would he be forced to build in a certain area that you can tell right now just by looking at the topography? I can tell you that the part of the reason that I've been ag aggressively appealing these is because based on the topography, right next to where their proposed addition is, is one of the only buildable areas on the property. It's not as if I could build the house easily in another location. Uh, there's a year-round creek that runs through the property. There's a steep, there, it's a very steep, slopey uh, lot. And so when I do go to build, it's going to be very close to where their current house is. So I wish I could build on another corner and avoid it, but it, I don't think I can. Thank you. And I think the other thing perhaps just to point out is that uh, the um, setback requirements that we're talking about today would have to be met by the um, appellant as well should they construct a home. So 50 foot setback from, uh, from the street as well as a 30 foot setback. And if those weren't able to be met, uh, for one reason or the other, then they would have to seek a variance, just as be, was proposed by the DeFay family. I was just going to note page 72 of your staff report shows the um, parcel map. There is a red circle that uh, Mr. Field provided that shows his area where he would potentially be able to build along with the creek that runs through the property. But um, as, as Mr. Pohuli stated, uh, it would be most likely that Mr. Field would also need to request the same variances, depending on, you know, what he proposed to build, but that is also possible as well. Thank you. I see no more comments. Uh, is uh, the applicant available? Mr. DeFay, go ahead and unmute your mic. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, I, I'm the resident at 3404 Rattlesnake Road. Um, we wanted to build this uh, extension for our family so we could grow up, uh, have the kids grow up in the same neighborhood that Mr. Field did. Um, we tried to keep the, the, the size of the extension somewhat modest and um, tried to take into consideration the, the footprint of the the house and um, you know built roughly the plans have 15 feet off um, the side of the house. Um, I, I 
would want to clarify that the house was built, I believe, in the 50s and 60s, and then there's an addition in the 80s adding a, a, a master bedroom on the side of it. Um, uh, we did consider all sides of the house when we, we asked our designer to draw up the plans, and um, the northern side is the current side that, that made the most sense for us. Um, there's lots of issues with the southern exposure and um, easement issues off the, 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 the roadside. Uh, I think that's the eastern exposure. And then the, the western exposure was uh, uh, quite steep and would encroach even further upon Mr. Field's property. So um, I think the, the county report summarized it uh, um, quite well and mirrors our position. So really we have, if there's any questions for us, um, we, we'd love to answer them. Any questions for the applicant? No. I, I had one question that I would like to ask them. In their response to my appeal, they said that they were in the process of tracking down uh, any official survey records that they had uh -huh. and if they were able to find any official were, were you able to find any official survey records of your property we were not able so we looked at the the city parcel map and we were able to locate um some of the the parcel boundaries um along the western side of the property but not along the the northern side of the property um, we just stayed on our side of the fence, obviously, but uh, we we're not able to locate anything from the corner to the road. We're, we're also not a professional survey surveyors either, so um, uh, you know we may have missed something as well. So, okay, thank you, thank you. So that. Uh, Seeing no, oh, you have, did you? Sorry, uh, I was trying to Oh, I see lights on. <laughs> One more question. So um, just kind of glancing at your letter from January 7th, I don't, it doesn't mention anything about a survey request in that original letter. Um, was your desire for the survey, did that come after the Planning Commission's recommendation? And was that something that kind of just kind of came up as an idea or where did the survey request come from? So, Full, for full disclosure, at one point I was the owner of, of the DeFay's current property and I'm extremely familiar with the layout and everything. And when I originally heard about their appeal, I thought, no, there's no way that they could build there. It is so close already to the property line. And I always had just thought in my, in my head, just based on walking around and being out there, it's much closer than that. And, but I'm not going to trespass on their property with a tape measure or anything ridiculous like that. Um, and the laser measure was something I just thought of, hey, this is a way that I can show what I, what I believe to be true without causing, being invasive or trespassing. Um, and so I didn't have that idea come up for a long time because I just hadn't thought of it, but I had always thought that it was much closer than what it was stated on the, on the variance. Yeah. Supervisor Jones. Yeah, my my questions are for the county staff. Oh, okay. You, you may you may take your seat, Mr. <laughs> so regarding the measurements on the setback, um, he's disputing that the measurements that we have are not accurate. What can you tell us about the accuracy of the measurements? Sure, I can mention that. That original determination of the 28 feet 8 inches, it was used, uh, it was done through by a licensed professional drafter and surveyor, and it was done with the original documentation. So the DeFace did hire a licensed surveyor to determine that um, distance originally. Okay, okay. And then, um, well, you may not know. I was curious as to how close the other objecting parties, there were a number of other objecting parties on that um, letter. And I was wondering how close are they in proximity to these properties? They don't, they're not surrounding the property, are they? They're within a, 
Well, yeah, let me ask you that. I'm sorry, I should have asked you while you were up there. How close are those other neighbors that are objecting? Uh, within a few houses down, okay. three or four houses down, but each lot is quite sizable. So right. one um, is from my father, who's directly across the street. Um, another one is, uh, there's, they're all within a mile, I would say. So they're not really going to be directly impacted as if, like, your property is right next door. Correct. So the others are not going to be directly impacted as you would be. It, you're right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the other uh, question I had, could you tell me, um, interpret the um, opinion of the planning commissioner? Tell all of us, rather, not just me. I'd be interested in what they concluded. As I was not at the planning commission, I was not yet uh, there. Uh, I'll rely on um, our lead planner for, yeah. for the item. The planning commission um, voted to deny the appeal and uphold the zoning administrator's approval five to zero. There were five um, planning commissioners in attendance that day. One was absent and um, one was not. We didn't, we have a vacant seat for district five. Do you that. recall if they had an opinion as to why they voted? There was only one question, um, and I believe it was to the DeFays in regards to uh, possibly the staircase or something, the, the design of the, of the addition. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there was also a discussion at the Planning Commission about the height of the building that would be constructed in the variance. That height will be 22 feet. Under the normal zoning, they would be allowed to go 36 feet high. So if they were 30 feet apart from the property line, they could go 36 feet high. This one is proposing 28 feet 8 inches, but they're only going 22 feet high. So the, the loss of view shed or loss of privacy, actually, it could be more under what they were allowed to do. So is that equivalent to like a one-story, single-story, the addition at that height? The 22 feet? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, is there a fence? No. That's two stories. Oh, it two is a two-story okay. okay. addition. Two okay, thanks. Um, and then is there a fence on that side of the property? Is the, is the property fenced by a wooden fence? It's not wood fence, it's wire fence. Oh, it's wire. Cable post. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, before we deliberate. Um, we have two more Zoom. Okay, two on Zoom. <clears throat> Mr. Faye, go ahead and give your comments. Yes, hi, I'm um, the wife of Isaac DeFay, who spoke earlier. Um, and I just had a couple of quick comments to make. Um, in general, um, on the measurement side, yeah, you know, we did use a professional drafter for the process. Um, and then I have actually, in, as far as finding the survey results, um, that happened prior prior to this i did talk to todd thatcher who was a previous owner and i believe installed or had the fencing installed between the two properties and he said um that they did do survey for it um and then on another note is the 28 feet eight inches um it only is for a, a minor portion of it because of the size of the, the way the parcel is um, laid out. It actually is only a corner of this property or this addition that will be going into that setback. And it's about 1% of the project. It's eight square feet based on these measurements. Um, it would probably be maybe double that or a little bit more if if the other measurements were used. Again, it would still just be a corner um, that goes into that setback. And again, it's, 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 a, it's a setback, not an encroachment. So um, that is all I have to say. Is there anyone else? There is, Chair. Mr. Garabedian, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good afternoon, Mike Garabedian, Placer County Tomorrow. Uh, I'm not in a position to comment on the appeal itself. I haven't been to the property in, in particular, but I have a, a couple of notes. Um, 
I, I noticed from looking at the photos that uh, now the structure would be moved closer to the pro, a propane tank. Um, so it, it suggests that not a codes issue to me, but that at one time somebody considered the distance it is from the present house to, to suggest the location of the propane tank where it is now. Now, it could have been a different circumstance at that time and so forth, but I just wanted to, to point that out, and it may not, it doesn't look like it's an issue in the appeal, but it, this also relates to my second point, which is sort of using this issue to shoehorn in my favorite issue of the wildland urban interface and how that's dealt with in uh, planning decisions. Oh, I suggested a long time ago that, that applications and even agendas should indicate the fire hazard severity zone of a property involved. It changes over time, so it's really valuable to anybody to know what, what that zone was at the time the house was constructed and so forth. And it might be something relevant in an in appeal like this. It might not be uh, relevant at all. But thanks for the opportunity here. Bye. No more. No more, Chairman. Uh, Supervisor Landon, did you have another question? Uh, yeah, just one more. Um, I am inclined to uphold the Planning Commission's decision, but um, I do have a question about whether having some type of privacy screen or foliage or trees would be helpful in this circumstance or if it would be hurtful, I guess. I'm, I'm probably asking you as the neighbor whether that's something that would be helpful or not. Yeah, it would be great. Um, part of the appeal was that uh, they would agree to construct a, a fence, a privacy fence, but they didn't, the, in their response, they said that they didn't want the construction to be contingent on that, but if they could construct a privacy fence, that would be fantastic, as well as um, trees or some type of cover. Yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. Mrs. DeFay? Hi, sorry, I'm just gonna to respond to that just really quickly. We did offer to put in some privacy screening. Um, it is actually in our plans, I believe um, in your document, I'm not sure what page. I did show that we did um, mention that we could put in some screening along that way. Um, as far as fencing goes, um, I, in the country, it's not really in the rural areas, It's not usual actually to find solid fences um and he we were it was requested that we install that um our response is basically that i think that the the shrubs or trees that we would put in should suffice for now uh, if and when tyler decides to construct we can discuss um a privacy fence and then we can share the costs as in you know neighborly good faith. So um, that's just my two cents there. Okay. No one else online? <clears throat> Is there anyone else in the public uh, that wants to address this issue? <clears throat> Seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment. And I, I was out there <clears throat> yesterday morning early and saw the site. Uh, the house that's existing there is got to be around the 1960s. It's really, really needs some work. And I can understand why the applicant wants to do this. There's no house on, no structure on the other side of either, either side of the property. Uh, there's a house down below on the other side of the property. But it's pretty much rural, really rural. The applicant has done its due diligence. They've had a surveyor for the lines. I don't see why we need to go any further. This is, uh, I, I would just move to deny the appeal. And I know there's no home there, just the one home that Mr. the applicant wants. There's no structure on either side. I'll second I, your motion. Okay. I heard you move. <laughs> so. A uh, motion by Landon? Landon? No, I thought you moved. Oh, <laughs> I thought you moved. Oh, okay. I mean, motion. Well, okay. 
Okay. Chair, if I could, before we go to the motion, I, I was talking with um, Mr. Pahuli, and based on the comments from the DeFace, we had some question whether, in fact, there was a licensed surveyor that provided the actual determination. I know that's indicated in the staff report, and that's the representation, but the comment from Ms. DeFay made, made it sound like it may be a professional drafter, but not a licensed surveyor that did the initial report. And um, if the motion is going to be based on that, uh, we would just be asking that there be clarification provided by the DeFay's. Okay. Mrs. DeFay, could you speak to that? Yes, that's correct. Um, per, um, since we are not doing an extensive amount of grading, the professional drafter um, used USGS data, and it's it's and he does work with a civil engineer, and the, and they worked together to create this site plan. Um, they don't for this little amount of grading that would be required. Part of the reason why we're building on this side is because it does not require extensive grading. Um, it's standard procedure to use USGS maps and then the plots that are given by Placer County. And then they, they find the, um, like the corner point to base it off of and use the dimensions and the descriptions per the Placer County map. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, the motion before us is to uh, deny the appeal followed by Tyler, Tyler Field. Three, uphold the Planning Commission's January 12, 2023 approval of a variance to allow the construction of a 1,077 square foot, two-story residential addition to an existing single-story resident proposed to be located 28 feet, eight inches from the northwest side property line, where a minimum of 30 feet is normally required and 25 feet, six inches from the northeast front property line where 50 feet from edge of the easement is normally required. Number four, find the project categorically exempt in accordance with the sections 15303 and 15305 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines. Uh, was there, did I have to add anything now? No, you got everything. And I'm, okay. I made a second. I have a friendly modification um, on the, the the description of some screening shrubbery. It sounded like it was in the application. I'd like to make, would you be amenable to putting that into the motion? There's no need for any screening. There's no house next door. Okay, well, <laughs> all right. And that wasn't agreed to. Um, and I wanted to explain uh, why I, I agree with um, denying the, um, the appeal. And that is whether or not it was 24 feet or 28 feet, I don't feel you're harmed at this point. I know you feel you're harmed, but we have had to consider various topographical issues up here and other situations, and, um, and so that is the basis of my vote. Um, so whether or not those dimensions are exact, I still feel there's adequate space there in the rural community for that. And to hear that you sold them a non-conforming site with a very old house you know, also influences my decision that you knew what you bought next to or had next to it. So just wanted to explain that to you. Okay, there's a motion and a second to deny the appeal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstention? Thank you, the appeal is denied. We will now move to our 2 p.m. timed item, Library Services Study Report Update. <clears throat> Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Chairman Holmes and members of the board. I'm Mary George, Director of Library Services, joined today by Assistant Director Sophie Bruno, and in the back, Deputy CEO um, Stephanie Holloway. We are here to provide you with an update to Library Services and seek your direction for future Library Services in the Penryn community. <clears throat> to begin, I'd like to provide you with a brief background regarding library services study timeline and findings. As you know, your board initiated a library services study at the end of 2021. That report was published in March of last year and the findings presented to your board in May. I last came before you in September to present our first steps towards a steady, consistent investment in library services. Study findings include current staffing levels are insufficient to maintain the current number of library locations safely or adequately. Your constituents want more library access, libraries open more hours, more days per week, and a wider range of programs and materials that meet their families' needs. At the same time, libraries in Kings Beach and Tahoe City are too small to meet those needs. Library Services Study Consultants advise the county to identify alternative strategies to deliver library services in Tahoe, as well as in Penryn and Applegate. Funding is needed to maintain and improve library service delivery. One of the goals of the Library Services Study was to consider partnering with the Town of Truckee and Nevada County on a regional approach to improve services in the Tahoe Basin. The study concluded that before we could be a strong partner, investment in Placer County Libraries should be at parity with Nevada County. In September, I outlined a preliminary plan for service improvements in the Forest Hill, Kings Beach, and Tahoe City Libraries. To date, a paraprofessional library specialist was added to the Forest Hill staff and open hours increased. In both Tahoe Libraries, current library supervisors promoted to library specialists. Recruitment for two supervisor vacancies is ongoing once all positions are filled, open hours will also be increased in both Tahoe library locations. Now I'd like to turn this presentation over to Stephanie Holloway to provide you with additional updates on next steps on Tahoe services. Great, thanks Mary. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board. Stephanie Holloway, your deputy CEO from Tahoe. Um, so yeah, I'm here to give you the Tahoe update. Just a brief couple of slides here to kind of talk about um, Mary talked about what, uh, what we've done so far, but just to talk about what's next. So uh, I just want to start by uh, kind of um, highlighting the fact that a lot of our public facilities and, and uh, community service needs, uh, including libraries in Tahoe, have been, um, have been kind of evolving over the last couple of decades. You know, our Tahoe full-time population, um, based on census data from 20, uh, 2000 to 2020, has been in a decline. So we know that less people are living there full time. Uh, we know that our workforce is um, moving out of the community currently. So um, we're, we're working on rectifying that, but just kind of wanted to highlight that there's been a bit of a shift, you know, with the pandemic, we're seeing a lot more um, occupancy of our second homes. And so our demographic of who we're serving with the libraries is also um, in flux. And so I uh, just want to say, you know, as we plan for what the county services look like in Tahoe into the future, we really need to come up with a vision uh, for what the implementation is and, um, you know, we're reevaluating with our North Tahoe communities what that looks like. So um, as, we, um, as we have those discussions really focused on these four key areas, um, asking questions of who, what, where, and how. And so, um, you know, the who, we're really having conversations with our community as we always do in Tahoe. Uh, identifying what those needs are, so the who and what there. Um, once we've finalized really what those specific services are for the unique community needs, um, we will, um, you know, really um, come to the next question is that, and that is where. Um, the next logical question really drives that conversation of infrastructure planning and ultimately funding um, from a capital perspective. So. Um, but speaking of capital, you know, our opportunities in the Tahoe Basin are definitely limited um, with space and regulation on uh, land development within the basin, really uh, needing to kind of expand with our regional partners, as Mary said, conversations around how we provide services on a regional scale. So anyways, just to say, however, we're not, we are not starting from scratch here. A lot of work with the community, a lot of conversations 
um, were had back in 2019 when we did the um, some some initial polling and, and just conversations on the strategic plan. So uh, our immediate next steps, though, just to talk a little bit about um, a additional survey. We like to survey and, and really get a lot of feedback in Tahoe. Um, but we did want to do a bit of a broader survey to really validate um, and elevate that community voice. Uh, and really what that does is provide you with the best possible information for your decisions as you move forward in these key areas. So next slide, I don't know if that's the clicker there. Um, so yeah, I um, want to just talk a little bit about a parallel effort that we're also working on um, as, we, as we advance the survey. Uh, there is an opportunity for um, another round of funding through the State Library uh, with their Build Forward grant. So second round opportunity, as you recall, the first round, um, we did receive funding for the Auburn Library. Um, with that initial request, we did have a, a request for Tahoe area as well. Uh, that was not supported, but the state did give us some really vital feedback, um, really highlighting the need, again, as Mary said, really this regional conversation with Truckee uh, and with Nevada County. So a lot of really great ongoing conversations um, with both of those agencies on how we not only program, support operations, but also identify capital needs and support across those boundaries. So um, just to talk a little bit about a timeline here, as you can see on the slide, March 16th, those applications for the second round opened. Uh, they are due May 18th, and so our team is working on uh, what that uh, ask of the State Library uh, would look like. A uh, couple of key things here just on that grant, uh, $10 million potentially as a max for uh, each individual facility. Uh, it does also include a very similar match, a dollar for dollar match as the first round did as well. So, um, and then just kind of highlight, you know, the, I think what you already know is the library would like to see those funds expended um, within three years. So. Uh, we're excited about this opportunity and definitely one of our next steps for the Tahoe area, but a lot more to come. Um, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of really unique needs in Tahoe from a library perspective, and we're having uh, as many conversations as we can to make sure that we inform you as best possible. So thanks, Mary, for having me. Thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate you. A part of the presentation today is to provide your board with your requested information regarding library services and community needs in Penryn. This is the Penryn Library. It's about 800 square feet located next to the Penryn Post Office, and the county rents this facility from the Freemasons. The Penryn Library's location's proximity to other libraries in the region is noted on this slide. The first dotted line indicates libraries within a five mile radius, including the Loomis Library at 3.1 miles away. The next dotted line shows a 10 mile radius. As you can see, there are an additional five libraries within that service range, including Rockland, Auburn, and Granite Bay libraries in the Placer County Library System, and the Lincoln and Roseville libraries in our neighboring city systems. By comparison, if the Forest Hill Library was included on this map, it would be 20 miles to the east of the Auburn Library with no other libraries nearby. We thought it might be helpful for additional context to build on the comparison to the Forest Hill Library. Each year, the California State Librarian certifies the service population for Placer County Library, including, excluding, I'm sorry, both Lincoln and Roseville populations as they are served by city libraries. Knowing that your constituents tend not to recognize government boundaries in library service areas, we estimated in fiscal year 1819 that approximately 2,700 people may use the Penryn Library. Similarly, we estimated that about 6,800 folks potentially had access to the Forest Hill Library. Fiscal year 1819 was the last fiscal year the Penryn Library was open. On the right of the slide is a pie chart showing both libraries, circul their circulation and percentage to the system. In fiscal year 1819, the library system circulated just over one million items. So when we were last here in September, your board tasked us to facilitate some opportunities for the Penryn community to give some feedback about their library service needs. And so to that end, we um, engaged the support of county, the County Public Information Office to help get the word out and encourage residents to um, make their voices be heard. We offered a couple of options. 
uh, for folks to participate. So first we, we published an online survey. It ran for about three weeks near the end of January through the 10th of February. Um, we asked for folks to respond about how they'd used the library previously, what they valued about that service, and then also what they, if they've been getting library service and where in the, in the intervening three years. Um, we received 236 responses total. And then in addition to the online survey, we also offered folks a, um, an opportunity to come in person to chat with us. So we offered uh, three in-person sessions of about four hours each um, in person at the Penryn Library. Um, we found that, a, that all, all three, we got maybe 17 to 20 folks showed up. Most of them had filled out the survey, but they really valued the opportunity to be able to come in, ask us questions, get some more context about library service, what was going on. Um, so we had some really good um, conversations with people and um, gave us some time to, to, to answer questions. So the overarching response that we received from, from uh, participants was that nearly all of them said, we, we need the Penryn Library to reopen. They really valued the interaction with library staff when the Penryn Library was open, particularly with children's programming. Um, and they also wanted convenient apps, ac access excuse me, to um, a place to drop off their library returns, a place to pick up their hold that was convenient to them. Uh, they also reported in the interim that they have been um, receiving library service elsewhere. So they um, most reported that they've been using the Loomis, Roseville, or Lincoln libraries, as you can see here, with um, the Auburn and Rockland locations and the Placer County library system coming in a, you know, a second and third place here. So this is what they had, had reported in the survey we heard from. So the data that we can validate on our side that we can, we can see in the library catalog is that we currently have just under 1,000 library card holders who identified Penryn as their home library. And of, the, of those 972 folks, uh, just over 800 of them have not used their library card at all in the last three years. And then 166 of those card holders who have been using their library card since March 2020 um, you can see here they've been using Rockland most often and um, Auburn. Mary, I'll turn it back over to you. So in September, um, you asked us to. In September, you asked us to investigate alternative service delivery models, including um, book vending machines, and smart lockers, unstaffed access, and library mobile services. In addition to the cost estimates, we have provided a list of considerations to address when deciding to implement an alternative service delivery, including internet connection and construction costs. None of the cost estimates include staff time. Staff time is dependent on the technology operating successfully and the number of deliveries needed to satisfy users. We'll start with vending machines. Vending machines extend accessibility to the library by offering convenient 24-7 access to up to a few hundred items. I've seen vending mach machines at transit stations, city centers, and in front of brick and mortar libraries to extend open hours. Smart lockers offer library users, again, 24-7 access, but only to pick up their holds that they have placed on items that they'd like to read or review. Their success is dependent on how often staff can fill them. Open Access is a software like Open Plus, seen here used by our neighbors in Nevada County at their Penn Valley Library. Open Plus extends hours to library users through a key card system. After some initial training, customers use their library cards to swipe into the library when staff are not present. And finally, library mobile services. We currently provide library mobile service to communities without a brick and mortar location, to schools, senior centers, and participate in many community events like farmers markets. Paraprofessional staff um, offer access to a curated collection dependent on the stop and staff facilitated programming like story time and book clubs. Costs per stops are estimated at $650 per stop. I did ask the library mobile service staff to scout some potential stops in the Penryn area, and those are located um, near the pin at the bottom of the slide. 
We anticipated your need to consider costs associated to open the Penryn Library. The top portion of this slide refers to the staffing model and costs reported to the California State Library in fiscal year 1819. I will say here, the public library services have become more dangerous everywhere, even in Placer County, since fiscal year 1819. Library workers continue to see an increase in confrontational exchanges. A safe working environment requires more than one staff in a location at all times, even in a facility as small as Penryn. Since we received improved, since we recently improved services in Forest Hill, um, this bottom portion of the model, staffing costs and service delivery, um, at the bottom of the screen, compares what we've done with Forest Hill to what could be in Penryn. And then we need to note here that the staffing costs are so high and three full-time staff are required because staff cannot stay on site by themselves and we can't require them to stay on site during their breaks and their lunches. Three staff allow us to operate safely and manage employee leave. It would be difficult to house three full-time staff in the Penryn Library at 800 square feet and for them to be able to provide space for meaningful programming. So at this time, we're requesting action from your board to provide, provide us more direction um, for future services in the Penryn community. And we thank you so much for your time and support. Sophie and I are here to answer any questions. Um, also here today um, is Elizabeth Carr, who is the library services manager for the Tahoe locations, and administrative um, fiscal officer, Kelly Heikala. Okay. <clears throat> any questions from board members at this time? I have a couple. You mentioned uh, earlier in your report that uh, your concerns about safety and adequate uh, staffing, uh, and that I think you um, articulated that in regards to Penryn, you're going to need three people in the Penryn Library. Yes. And from what I can see from your study, there's not that much activity there to justify three, three people in there. That's true. <clears throat> It's some um, 1.3% of the, of the circulation, which is the, the materials that go out to our customers. Um, the last year that it was opened, we circulated just above 1 million items that year. So at 1.3%, that's about 13,000 items in a year that, that circulated from the Penryn Library. And it, it, it appears that while the library's not been opened, it's, the library, like people from, that go to the library are going to Auburn and Rockland. And the Auburn is what, five miles away? Um, Auburn oh. is probably seven. seven we do have, yeah, it's yeah. seven miles away from, okay. from the Penryn location. Okay. I can see the issue with the Tahoe City Library and the Kings Beach. I've been up to both of those. Uh, the Kings Beach Library certainly needs some work, but there's no, no way to expand it where it's located. So I know we're gonna to have to have some costs uh, uh, if we do that, bring that up to, 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 to current specs. Uh, specs. Uh, King, uh, the Tahoe City Library as well. Is that, they're moving out of that area, that facility, is that correct? There is some talk of, um, <clears throat> of a development, you know, that may happen, but we haven't been, we haven't received any indication that that's imminent. Okay, uh, I don't know. Supervisor Landon. I was just wondering for the mobile services, how long are they on site typically for a mobile outreach? A couple hours or an hour? Yeah, I think it depends on what they're doing. Maybe they'll go to a senior center and drop off materials that people have placed on hold and then the staff help them distribute those materials. So that stop can be very quick and they can do multiple stops in a day. Whereas if they travel to Meta Vista, um, they may go there twice, you know, um, once in the morning to hit the folks walking around the park and then in the afternoon when kids get out of school. Um, they usually stay around an hour, but I think if they're doing a story time or they're doing a book club, it could be longer. Okay. So have you worked with, <clears throat> with the Penrins School as far as 
having a place to drop off or have a your van stop by, by there? Yeah, we had um, the school librarian did come to us and visit us when we had our open houses at the Penryn Library, and is definitely open to, you know, um, to working cooperatively. And of course, we'll do anything that we can to support that school. Sophie, did you want to add anything? No, I think we just we just talked about, um, as Mary said, we scouted out some places that might might be beneficial to have a, a mobile service stop if if your board. Um, decided but um, we would certainly want to want to look further into the, what the community needs were if there was another stop if the school was interested in having um, library support on their facility as well so it would just depend so the school would certainly work during school hours but during when the school is closed is there any other opportunity uh, in the area to uh, have the van stop by or have uh, connections with folks yeah, definitely. Um, are you talking specifically at the school site? Or? Well, if, if the school is closed, well, yes, you could probably go to the school site. It's plenty of parking there. Yeah, so sure. So you would still be able to do that for the, the mm -hmm. residents. And they could order the books online, and you would deliver them at a certain time? Yep, that's correct. Okay. But then, you know, our library mobile service folks are very good at what they do. They get to know a community, yeah. and so they start recommending materials, and then they also deliver those materials wherever people are finding them. They're not locked into a certain site. If they don't f find anybody visiting them conveniently there, then they travel someplace okay. else where they're hitting people. In Sheridan, they go to the Perky Peacock, so, and then I understand that the staff there brings them a coffee, and, and that they're happy that they're there and oh. providing services while their, their coffee shop is open. So do the uh, library van service would work at the post office in Penryn? That yes, that is one of the sites that, that they did scout. It's very convenient. Everybody has to pick up their mail. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, right. Yeah, it is unfortunate that we haven't had more use in the Penryn library. We have, over time, tried a number of different service models. Mm -hmm. At one point in time, we opened up at 7 o'clock in the morning, you know, when the rooster crowed hoping to get the commuters coming out of Penryn and to pick up things. And then we closed up during midday. We put um, some of our shelving and our circulation desk on wheels so we could um, divide you know, the space in, to invite people in to have community meetings or shed, shared space. Um, and then we would open back up in the afternoon to catch the commuters as they came back into Penryn. But unfortunately, none of that moved the needle on, on the circulation or the use. <clears throat> okay, I see a couple of lights, uh, Supervisor Gustafson. Uh, thanks. On the mobile um, facility, does it have a hotspot so that people can download um, and get there if they, because I know that is sometimes what people are looking for as well. Um, and in meeting with the Nevada County Library, and they, they had a lot of programs that I think can be effective for the community, just like you're describing. Um, and you know, might actually enhance some of the users in Penryn uh, with that flexibility to meet them at events at, um, you know, is it available for weekend services? So yes. that mm -hmm. if there was a soccer game or a little league game or little siblings could come up and visit with the librarian while others were playing in sports activities or others. Um, and then related to the Tahoe um, uh, services, I know, uh, the walking distance, the proximity of Kings Beach to so many locals that can walk that are transit dependent um, and it, it is critical. Tahoe City is less walk-in um, or, or more people use their automobiles to get to the site and so there might be more flexibility and that's what we've been talking about with either looking at Dollar Creek or the, the um, Bechtelt building or other locations um, to uh, expand or elaborate and actually have the site be more visible because where it is on the bottom story now they have to put a sandwich board sign out to even try to explain to people how to get to the front door because yeah. it's down and around the corner from the main street um, but I think we're st you know we're still exploring those uh, opportunities and with uh, Nevada County and the town of Truckee they are currently looking at um, creating a larger library in the Truckee community and polling some of our Martis Valley folks in a survey right now to see if they're willing to pay more. 
we've talked a little bit about whether or not uh, we should pull within the lake districts as well to see if people are willing to pay more for uh, library services if we were to choose to do a larger uh, capital campaign um, if we needed to. So I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of, of some of those other efforts to really look at cost effectiveness because obviously snow days are days that moms may want to get to the library and have the chance to take their kids to the library but there's snow days for school that probably means our staff are struggling and if there's anybody out it's you can't send somebody up from down here yeah. so um, trying to work cooperatively across the line up there and kind of keep it um, in that vicinity to back up each other uh, could be uh, quite beneficial uh, for the community because often that's when uh, moms and young kids can get out when um, there's not school or work for some <laughs> um, like that but you know in regards to Penryn I feel like you know taking a stab at trying some of these alternatives we never say never right in public service we always try to adapt and and see if if these needs can help and I, I'm flexible I would I could support trying a different model for Penren and seeing if we can encourage a better service, more appropriate service for the community that would get used and be worth the investment we're making. I don't want to turn our backs on them. And I know there's some in other parts of my district that have felt that their the backs were turned on Meadow Vista, for instance, and, and Mary's aware of this. When I first took office, we had a lot of concern that services that we promised weren't delivered and that was for a number of different reasons and staffing models but um, trying to make sure that that we're equitable in our our access especially in our rural communities they they do take um, different modifications um, to provide those services so i'm flexible i'm open to that as one board member uh, before I go on, uh, how many vans are there? Is there just one for the? Yeah, we have one temporary van right now okay. that is on loan from um, from Fleet. We are in the process of ordering a more permanent van, okay. which will make it a little bit more accessible for our staff to load materials in and out okay. and deliver those services. I mean, it, ideally, we would like to have more, um, including mm -hmm. one in the Tahoe locations. Um, the more mobile we are, the, the better we're able to meet people where they need us, um, rather than just sitting and relying on them coming to us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Jones, you had your light on. Hi, Mary, thank you for Hi. the presentation. Um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the children's reading programs and also about the elementary school that's nearby and how, you know, Penryn Library would compete with that and, would you talk a little bit when we met you told us a little bit about that mm -hmm. sure during um, one of the in-person sessions we um, did have a chance to have a conversation with uh, representatives from Penryn school about the pop the opportunity or possibility that the the library could have the library mobile service stop there they have a library at Penryn elementary they have a um, a librarian who works there and so um, they they have their own their own funding or their own needs um, and so we wouldn't you know we wouldn't want to step on any toes as far as um, we can we can provide library service there depending on what it is their their students and staff need as far as library service or library support great thank you. Does that answer your question yeah okay yes it does thank you I just wanted people to realize that uh, the, the children, the library services for children are not totally dependent on Penryn Library, that there are other options. Thank you. Supervisor Landon. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, as someone who, as a child, the library was my safe place. I have, this is a special spot in my heart. And so, you know, really kind of reconciling the piece of we have to have something that's fiscally sustainable while also meeting the needs, especially of those kids who are, who need that connection with a librarian or with someone outside of their family who can, you know, be that safe person for them. Um, so to me, for Penryn at least, having those mobile services available, especially outside of school hours where uh, a child could come and talk to their librarian and have that person who um, I know for me growing up having my librarian know my name when I came in the library it really truly was a lifesaver for me 
So um, it's really important to me that those services be available outside of school hours, which it sounds like you're already doing, but just wanted to make sure I noted that. So. Well, I can, I can definitely say we, we appreciate that point, you know, as, as former children's librarians and um, professionals who've dedicated our, our personal and professional lives to libraries. Um, there's probably no one in this room who values libraries more than Mary and I do. Um, and, you know, 15 years in Placer County and starting as a, as a youth services librarian, all the, all the relationships that I developed with, with those littles, with the, you know, those kids who were you know, a, a baby laps that couldn't hold their head up and then they're running into the library, you know, a week later saying, Miss Sophie, look, I'm chewing gum now. You know, those, <laughs> those are things that, you know, we hold so near and dear and help us make our determinations about what library service looks like. Yeah. And having these conversations, of course, is, you know, we're, we're running the business is what, what does that look like? Um, how can we, how can we be flexible? That's what I, I've, I've heard a lot today. And um, our staff on library mobile service is that you know they do they do offer that service in fact um, we were we just made contact last week with Sierra Hills Elementary in Meta Vista they're having a science night um, put on by the parent teacher um, association there at the school and asked hey maybe the library could come and a library mobile service will be there on Thursday night so it was a just again that that flexibility and adaptability and having staff ready to do it and ready to represent the library and be that, that safe space, um, even if it's not within a brick and mortar facility, I think is. And I guess lovely. I should have added that. I, that's one of the main reasons why I would feel supportive of the mobile approach as opposed to, you know, a, just an unmanned library where someone comes in with their card because I think that personal touch is so important. Um, and then along the same lines as Supervisor Gustafson, the, the whole adaptive management idea of I think we anything we do today we can we can always revisit and so um, I'm a big fan of adaptive management and learning from what's working and what's not so um, I do feel like we have a lot of flexibility moving forward so um, I'm, I'm guessing you guys will keep us updated on how things are going so no other questions one more uh, Supervisor Jones you're back <laughs> yes you're back <clears throat> thank you sorry I wanted to make one more comment to you both and and your staff that I think um, I have to commend you I think that you do a lot of work um, based on you've done this study you've reported back to us several times I commend you for your creativity your innovation in discovering all of these alternatives to library solutions I never would have dreamed of a, a library vending machine really I think a lot of kudos go to you for trying to solve these issues of not you know when a library the brick and mortar is getting too expensive to rent and then you have to bring in enough staff to be have a safe environment and and all of the things that require that brick and mortar to to survive so i really want to commend you all for for offering us so many alternatives and options thank you okay, seeing no more comments uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up to the public Good afternoon, Muriel. I'm Muriel Davis, and I've been a friend of the Penman Library for a great many years. And I want to read what I, my thoughts, because I don't want to forget anything. Um, and I agree with uh, Mary and her staff for having two people on site. So another consideration would be if there's two people, they could possibly op be open on a Saturday. Anyway, here's what I'm right. I am here to ask that you reopen and operate our Penrin Library that has been closed for no reason since the pandemic. I, I noticed that in December 13th, 2022, the Board of Supervisors approved a $5 million loan to a developer to help fund a housing project in the county. Truly, the county can find a tiny percentage of that loan amount within the budget to open and operate our Penrin Library for a great many years. This Penrin Library has benefited the children, seniors, and adults in the Loomis Basin communities for over 100 years. Many new families are moving into the area and will need this nearby library. You've got Bickford Ranch coming and all these developments on Penrin Road. 
This Penryn Library is a historical treasure of the county, and opening it helps the residents in the unincorporated Loomis basement communities and reduces the miles traveled to get access to a library. Please fund the opening and operation of the Penryn Library. I, I have another comment, too. There was a survey done for the Penryn Library. Because of initial technical difficulties, we will not know how many people gave up and did not do the survey. But why was Penryn Library, library singled out for a survey? If the importance of a library is to be determined by a survey, then the only methodology to validate this, the only way to validate this methodology is to do a survey for every one of the libraries. Our Penryn Library has been critical for not just Penryn, but Loomis, and the surrounding Ofer and the other surrounding communities. And I think the supervisors should make sure to remember our rural communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak for a minute. I'm Donna Delno, 23-year homeowner and resident of Penryn. And I wanted to restate that the Penryn Library is 100, year, 100 years old, community asset and benefit, and the cost to the county in comparison is negligible. It also helps maintain the character of Penryn, which is fundamental to our community plan. And based on the age of the building, it should probably be preserved as historic. But I have one question. Um, our Horseshoe Bar Penryn Community Plan, I believe, calls for our library. So there's got to be a way to find funding if the community plan calls for the library to be open. And of course, we pay property taxes for our library. It's part of the taxes. So if, if they're going to take it away or do something different, then we need to have some property taxes get returned to the residents of Penryn. My other question is, if you're talking about the safety of the library and having two or three people in it, are you going to have two or three people driving around in the van that's going to be having, you would think we can work it out to, uh, if, I mean, the van idea I think is not a good one as far as I'm concerned. I'm old fashioned with Shanty that the library is very important for our kids, especially if our schools are pretty low in the nation. We don't have the best of schools. So again, if there's two or three required in the building, then how many are required in the van? And that's going to become more costly than having our little library open. So one quick story is my kids, we got here in 2000 with two babies. And my both kids have done great. So Penryn School in kindergarten or first grade, Mrs. Mutcher used to take the kids and they walk as a field trip with us parents. We walk up to the library, get a library card, check out books get interested in learning how the library works in the summer reading program. So right now my daughter is 25. She's got through Penrith School, Del Oro, Sierra, UNR, and she's getting her master's in biostatistics at University of Washington, which is the seventh highest in the nation. And then Patrick is UNR, uh, graduating December with his bachelor's in finance and minor in construction management. That I all believe is from our schools. We left the Bay Area to come here and raise the kids. The library, although maybe it's not, again, we have to figure out the money. You have got to find a way to do it. I know there's money given away for free rent to people that are non-citizens and things like that, but the residents of Penryn, which is 871, deserve to have their library stay open. Thanks for listening. Is there any other, anything else? Oh, here we go. Oh, that's my friend. Hello. Hello there. I swam up from Rockland. Oh. <laughs> um, Honorable Chair and Board of Supervisors, Michelle Vass. I am the president of the Rockland Friends of the Library, and I know you know that, but I just wanted to let you know I'm speaking on my own today as just a Placer County resident, and also wanted to echo the comments you made about how hard um, staff has worked to come up with solutions and to take into account the financial aspects of everything and you know looking over the cost and how many people are actually using it and the cost to have the van visit a couple times a week at, with a couple people in it for safety purposes uh, for that 650 really um, you know makes it pretty clear which way we should go to still deliver services to the people that are using it up there. I also wanted to let you know just my use at the library. And I used a calculator that was online, and it's linked on our library website. 
And um, so far this year, just my family, in the first three months, we've rented 12 audiobooks, one adult hardcover, 60 children's books, and you guys have saved my family $1,166 that we're able to then go and use because um, we don't have to do our entertainment and educational needs that we buy just for ourselves and keep. We can share these resources with our community and then put that money back into our community by buying goods and services and employing our neighbors. And then those folks pay taxes that go back to our services. So um, thank you for the investment in my family and so many others. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Anyone else in the audience? Is there anyone online? No? There is none. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> the van. How many people are going in the van? Is it just a driver? And two. Yeah, we always have two people on the van. Okay. Um, there may be one person if they're just driving to a senior center and dropping some stuff off and uh -huh. then coming back to the library. But out for services, there are always two. Okay. And that's just the one van you have now and you have another one? That's correct. One, yep. Another one on order. Correct. <clears throat> and so, if we did... Uh, I'm sorry. Pub public comment is closed. Is there anybody on Zoom? No. So if you did have what you said, three people at the Penryn Library, or mm -hmm. you, and that's for safety concerns. Yes. And uh, it, would that be three at the same day, all on the same day? Yes, but then we would open the library probably 38 hours a week. Okay. So it would be inequitable to the rest of the library system. So as far as staffing in some of the other libraries, if someone called in sick or wasn't able to come to work, how would you backfill that, that position if it was in the Auburn Library or Rockland Library? Um, not very effectively. I mean, the same operation that we've been trying to do in Tahoe. You know, when somebody calls in sick or goes on leave, we do the best we can to pull from our other libraries to cover that sometimes not very effectively. Um, we could have a huge program going on in Rockland where we expect 300 kids to be there uh -huh. and have to pull a staff member off that program to, to be in the, in the library or, or another library to, be, to have it be safe and, and operate effectively. Okay. We, I mean, we have certain um, classifications that, are, um, that have the responsibility of being in charge of a facility. Okay. And um, those are not library clerks. That has to be at a higher level. So it also has to be the right person to fill in behind. So the three uh, librarians, if they were in the Penryn Library, would they be a librarian and a library clerk and a library? No, it would more, li more than likely be a library specialist okay. and, and, a, and a couple of clerks or a library specialist and a supervisor so that we would always have a person in charge available. So you wouldn't be you wouldn't feel comfortable just putting two people in the veteran library? No, because we can't require people to stay on site during their oh, breaks and right. lunch. Yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. So would, it would be modeled after what, what's happening in Forest Hill. Um, so we expanded service and hours at the end of February there. So we have a library specialist and two clerks and they close every day from one to two for lunch, a lunch break. So that means that there's always a supervisory position that's available during open hours uh, should need arise. And there's an also enough a redundancy. So if one person calls out, one of the clerical positions calls out that they have enough staff, and then we are able to um, usually send another staff member up um, from a different division in the rest of Mid Placer to help support if we're at a, p a place where the specialist on site couldn't be there or a couple of people call out, um, as has been the case, as you all know, the last couple of years. All right. Yeah, and Elizabeth herself actually worked there on Saturday um, when a staff member called out. So we have four managers on the management team, including Sophie and myself. And um, Elizabeth is in charge of the, the Forest Hill Library, so if there's any staffing needs, she can um, also work there herself. Okay, good. Uh, Supervisor Gore, you got Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the conversation and the input, and um, I appreciate our residents sharing your concerns because we love libraries, right? And as I've thought about this, I've thought about how our environment has changed a lot. Like libraries were the place where you could go to to check out a book, and now we're so fortunate to have resources that are online. Um, and I think Michelle mentioned you were able to download books, et cetera, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, but I think as I look at trying to address the financial issue, 
one thing we know is that people in our area have cars, unlike King, King's Beach. We have folks who have cars that can drive to go to the grocery store um, and, and can drive to the other libraries. And um, I want to make sure our librarians are well, well utilized, right? Like they're librarians because they want to serve a lot of residents. And if we end up having three librarians, it's already tough right now to get librarians. Um, I want to make sure that they're available to serve a lot of residents. Um, and that may make more sense in Rockland and in Auburn. Um, so this is really tough, but I know that we have the resources. And um, I, I hate to do it, but then I look at the cost benefit analysis. And if we can make sure we've got librarians in other locations and then bring the library resources to our residents, um, I, I think that that's a good workaround. It's not ideal, but we're not like we were 100 years ago when nobody had access to books. Um, and that's why libraries were so wonderful. Um, it gave people access to resources that most folks don't have. And now we have a lot more alternatives. Most everyone can go online and get those resources or even download books or go online and get the books from the library. So I'm, I'm supportive of making a change, uh, the mobile libraries. But I wanted to share with you all my reasoning because I think it's a tough spot to be in, but I do think we can continue to, continue to provide the services for our residents. Thank you. Supervisor Landon? <clears throat> um, this is a question I don't know that you would have the answer to right now, but I would just be curious the answer when property taxes came up. Um, my, my questions are, uh, how is that, uh, the, how are those property tax assessments determined? And um, if the cost does I am guessing that those assessments did not cover the cost of operating before, that there probably was a deficit. I don't know that, but, um, but if it is less, um, and is, will there be, would there be an adjustment to a property tax assessment, or would that, those extra funds go? That's a question for the assessor, but it's a question I have. So does that make sense, my question? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, the, our library system is very lucky that we're partially funded by a dedicated um, property tax. And that was put into play by the, by the citizens of Placer County pre-Proposition um, 13. And so my understanding is that the library fund receives 0.67 of 1% of the property tax revenues for our fund. Now, we don't, um, we don't budget per how much money is drawn from a jurisdiction. We budget as a library system because we share materials between all of our libraries. Mm -hmm. Someone in Tahoe can place a book on hold and we deliver it to them in their, in their location. So all of us are in this together and um, we actually have a lot of cost benefit because we are hovered together as mm -hmm. a county. And equity and parity can only really exist in a county library system when that is thought of. Um, regarding the property taxes, that would have to be something that, you know, I'm sure that, that the treasure tax collector and the county would have to hammer out. Mm -hmm. um, but remember, we don't, we don't recognize jurisdictional boundaries. So the city of Roseville doesn't ask us to pay when, you know, when the, our residents use their libraries and vice mm -hmm. versa and there's no offset for those costs. So um, it's kind of a, it's a value that we all just kind of share and, and yeah. contribute to. Okay, that answers my question. So it's not like the parks where you have a district and it's, it's no. everyone in one big pot. Okay, right. thank you. Supervisor Jones. <clears throat> yes, um, I, in thinking about your shortage of manpower at times when someone has to call in sick, this is kind of an uncommon or unusual idea, concept, but schools, schools have X amount of teachers that are certificated and qualified to teach. But to backfill those, they also have a pool of substitute teachers that are pre-qualified and they know and they can call on those pools of substitute. Any thought on ever having a pool of substitute librarians that uh, might be willing to come on a day's notice, you know, a couple of hours of notice, but it's like I said, it's a little bit of an unusual idea, but other mm -hmm. people do. Yeah, we, um, let's see, I've been the library director for 12 years, and when I became the library director, we 
probably had 40 staff members and maybe, wow. I don't know, Kel, 80 extra help. Yeah, wow. so we had, we had way more part-time um, extra help um, employees than we had permanent staff. A couple of things happened. There was some legislation that went through that required us to you know, pay our extra help staff um, PERS benefits if they worked over a certain amount of hours. So at that time, the county asked us to cut down our um, extra help budget. We had gotten into that pickle because we didn't have any money and we were on a hiring freeze, so we couldn't really fill our vacancies. So we just kept backfilling with all this extra help. We had had some extra help that had been there for a decade or more, you know, without any permanent benefits. So, um, so my um, my charge was really to professionalize the team, because when you're managing a pool of extra help, you they can't be performance managed, and you can't count on them. Mm -hmm. They can say no at any time mm -hmm. to show up for a shift. Um, so I think right now we we want to right size and professionalize our our system. But extra help is a definitely a viable need, and, and we could bring them in and manage them much better once we figure out what is the right size of our staff and our teams. Sure. The library services study says, says we need 14 more um, permanent um, full-time employees in order to manage our library successfully. Wow. We want to continuously look at that um, and, and see what we can do regarding um, part-timers and extra help. But it's one of our values um, at the library is to try to provide our staff with a, a living wage, you know, and, and benefits that, that make sense um, so that we aren't dependent on, on folks who don't need those things, so that we can support um, people that want to work in libraries but also can afford to live in Placer County and raise a family and, and um, move up in the ranks and maybe even go to library school and become a librarian if they'd like. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Gustafson. <clears throat> I just I wanted to echo uh, Supervisor Jones's comments that while I appreciate we definitely want um, professional staff leading all the libraries, I do think there's great opportunity. Um, we have a lot of folks in uh, Placer County, if you look at our demographics, that are retired and may want to pick up extra duties and have incredible resumes and backgrounds, but may not be in a position where they want to work full time and could be your backup and be a valuable resource. So I, I want to be flexible, again, adaptive management where we, our leadership has all those abilities, but there may be opportunities for people who aren't looking to maybe make a next career they may want to give back and libraries are their passion and so I think those opportunities may be um, without benefits and with you know the opportunity to give back to their communities that could be uh, as long as they you know go through the fingerprinting and some of the other security measures we have to take these days that we didn't used to have to do as much um, and uh, I think that that offers a lot of opportunity for a lot of members of our community who do want to give back to our great Placer County community. So adaptive management is, you know, I say it all the time. It, it's it's the public service is changing and mm. the, what people need and often our institutions get very rigid in how we provide services and that doesn't meet. We don't change as quickly as the demands are. So let's. Um, Anything we can do to be flexible, I think that's great. And looking to the future to help you and support you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So how soon are you going to have another van available? Do you know? Have you sit on order? Or? Um, I mean, I think we can always talk to Fleet. Right now, um, the library mobile service unit is ready to, to add some Penryn stops to their current, um, to their current schedule. Um, we wouldn't need to ask for another van unless we found that you know there were multiple stops and we needed more folks to provide those services but right now we're ready to go with what we have okay so it'd be <clears throat> be my recommendation to um it's not feasible to reopen the penrin library now uh and let's work on uh the van the van model the delivery model uh how soon you're ready to go with that already ready to go okay that's what, that would be my recommendation. Everybody's nodding. Everybody's nodding. Yeah. <laughs> Do we need a motion on that? Do we need a motion? No, no. 
Uh, so just keep us surprised. Uh, I know you're going to be busy uh, trying to set that or setting it up and just let us know how that's working and please make sure that the Penryn community is aware of that. <clears throat> um, is there any indication on staff direction with regard to what we do with the current Penryn library? <clears throat> well, I, I would say we're not going to reopen it. Maybe we should just hang on to it just in case, uh, you know, for another couple of months uh, before we decide one way or another how to how yeah, to move I'd, forward. I'd like to see you try the mobile services maybe through the summer yeah. and really work with the community and the hours and the opportunities. Survey them. I mean, we have their cart. We know who's registered there. Find out what works for them, what they want, right. and how we can... Uh, deliver those services and then maybe bring it back. Does that make sense? If we just kept yeah. it, you know, through the summer months, yeah. especially when the kids are out of school and there might be opportunities to, yeah. to serve them. Okay, so we'll keep it, uh, keep it in the system for what, three months or through the summer months and then bring it back and then we'll decide how everything's working. Okay, okay. you have enough direction? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Good presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for and thanks for your hard work. I know you've been working on this for uh, I don't know how long. <clears throat> this is our job. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I think that's that's it. Huh? Huh? Is that it? No, we have to go back to All right, we will be. Uh, we're going to go back into closed session. And I'll turn it over to uh, County Council. The board will now go back into closed session to consider one item of existing litigation, one item of potential exposure, uh, public employee performance, and one item of labor negotiations. Okay.
The board has just returned from closed session and county council will report out. The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under existing litigation, City of Lincoln versus County of Placer, the board heard a report and continued the matter to the April 4th meeting for further discussion. Under anticipated litigation 2B, potential exposure litigation, the board heard a report, no action requested or taken. Under the quarterly performance evaluation, the board received a quarterly report, no action requested or taken. Under labor negotiations, PCDDAA, the board heard a report and provided direction by a 5-0 vote. That concludes the report out of closed session. And that brings the uh, Tuesday, March 28th, 2023, Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting to close. Closure. We are adjourned. <laughs>